Orders. Stellar date 11.05.8949. Adjusted years. Location. Chamber of Lights. Valhalla. Region. Capital. Prusia system. Nietzschean Empire. Two months prior to the Marauder's assault on Iberia. Emperor Constantine regarded the man standing before him with barely contained disgust. There was something different about General Garza this time, something that was out of alignment compared to his prior visit. Constantine couldn't quite put a finger on it, but the Orion Guard general seemed twitchy. It was clever to use the old Epsilon facility to build your fleet, Garza said, after the two minutes stared at each other in total silence for several minutes. Constantine glanced at Admiral Hammond, who was the only other person in attendance, and nodded for the man to speak. Hammond stepped forward and cleared his throat. We weren't getting resources fast enough from other sites, but Epsilon and the facilities on its six moons had sufficient. They're gone now, Garza interrupted. The facilities, Constantine's brow furrowed, hating the game the odious general was playing with him. The moons. The moons, Constantine repeated. It wasn't quite a question. The emperor wasn't going to supplicate himself before Garza, seeking answers, but not knowing was already causing a tight knot to form in his chest. The man from Orion nodded as he turned to pace across the emperor's private audience room, a space only 50 meters across at the top of Valhalla's spire. Above, the brilliant light to the Percipi cluster shone through the clear dome over their heads. He strode to the edge of the chamber, stopping on the sheet of transparent gold that ringed the space, and looked down on the world of capital. Garza ambled toward Constantine, an expression on his face that was half anger, half smug satisfaction. The moons of Epsilon are gone. Well, almost. Epsilon won't last long either. Enough, Garza. How? Constantine demanded, turning to glare at the general. He knew there was only one way the moons and brown dwarf star could be destroyed so quickly. The black holes in the moons. What he wanted were the specifics. When you killed General Mill of the Marauders, you paved the way for a union that has not been beneficial to Nietzsche. From what my sources can discern, Admiral Tannis Richards met one of those mechs the Genevians made, a woman named Rika, with support from New Canaan. She's cutting a swath through old Genevia. Fuck, Constantine spat the word as he turned back to the perimeter of the room. Those damn Genevians. I should have just raised their worlds when we defeated them. Probably. Garza replied, and now the force you were building to hit Septia is gone, and you only have nine months to meet my deadline to crush that nation. How do you plan to proceed? The feeling of being called to the floor in front of his father came over Constantine, a feeling he very firmly recalled hating. Rather than respond himself, he glanced at Admiral Hammond. The Admiral took the hint. My Emperor, General Garza. Once we received word that the fleet sent to the Albany system was lost, we stepped up our manufacturing in the old Genevian home system. We have nearly 50,000 ships there, though only half are combat ready at present. But in six months, they all will be, and we'll be prepared to take them through the jump gates and into Septia. Per your instructions, General Garza, the Septians will fall before the year is out. Constantine's skin crawled to hear the head of his military speak so deferentially to Garza. He wondered if it was an affectation, or if his own people were beginning to treat the Orion general as their master. I hope you'll forgive me if I don't simply trust in the efficacy of your work there, Garza said, as he turned his gaze up to watch a destroyer slowly circle above Valhalla. We believe that with strike forces of, Admiral Hammond began, 50,000 ships is a force that Septia can't hope to stand against. Constantine interrupted. You thought that when you sent 70,000 ships to Albany. Garza didn't turn away from the window as he replied. We intend to follow your plan, hit them in dozens of systems at once. Constantine countered. 
You argued that if we don't mass, there is no way that the ISF and its allies can protect Septia. Garza shook his head, finally turning to look at Constantine. Except that Tannis Richards has sent this Rika into old Genevia with the same purpose in mind, to distract and disrupt. She's clearly angling toward the Genevian home system itself. Let her come, Constantine growled in response. Unless she's bringing the I-2 along with her, there's no way she'll prevail. Would you have said that same thing about your shipyards at Epsilon? The emperor pursed his lips and didn't respond, though he sent a pregnant look toward the admiral, hoping the man could say something that would appease Garza. The man didn't disappoint. With my emperor's permission, I will travel to Genevia myself to ensure that we're ready for the mission. From Genevia, I'll be better prepared to respond to the situation as it unfolds. A man of action, Garza said, inclining his head in gratitude. I think you should go as well, Emperor Constantine. It would do your people good to see their leader out on the front lines. I, Constantine began, but Garza cut him off. Don't forget about our meeting in your garden, the Orion general whispered when I displayed how far beneath Orion you are. Something you know intimately. I'm not requesting that you go to Genevia. Constantine understood the general's meaning. He was being given an order he dared not refuse. But perhaps it was a situation he could turn to his advantage. Admiral Hammond, prepare my ship. Hal's Hell Stellar date 02.05.8950, adjusted years. Location, Decker Station, Merchant Docking Ring. Region, Parson System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Five weeks after the Marauder's assault on Iberia. You ready? Chase glanced at Staff Sergeant Tex, receiving the RR-4's calm nod in response. Okay, then. Here goes nothing. Tex gave a short laugh, or a whole lot of something. Chase would have laughed as well, except that they were deep in Nietzschean-held territory, docking at a station where he was well known. Your heart rate is spiking, Potter said in a soothing tone. Don't worry, no one here is going to realize who you are until you want them to. Counting on that, Chase replied, unable to resist a glance down at his torso still adjusting to the fact that there was an AI nestled somewhere next to his digestive system. What was left of it? Though he still marveled at the change, Chase had no regrets over becoming a mech. He quite enjoyed being an FR-4. But sometimes the knowledge that he'd volunteered to be turned into a half-machine weapon of destruction made him wonder if he was just a bit crazy. Having Potter in his gut only served to drive home how strange his life had become all because of the incredible SMI-2 I met on this very dock. Chase drew a deep breath. I'm good, just reconciling things in my head. The AI didn't reply, and Chase stepped out of the airlock into the all-too-familiar organized chaos of Hal's Hell. Hal's docking bay on Decker's merchant berthing ring was every captain's dream and every dockhand's worst nightmare. Hal ran his domain with an efficiency that bordered on maniacal, his crews could load a ship in half the time it took any other on Decker. Nothing lost and nothing late. That was Hal's motto, and he made sure everyone knew it. His efficiency was rewarded with gifts from captains and shipping companies. Gifts that rarely made their way down to the stevedores doing the actual work. Though he admired the man, Chase couldn't stand Hal. A part of him suspected that most of his dislike was based on how the dockmaster had always treated Rika. The resounding cry of Tin Head still echoed in Chase's mind, and the thought of it brought about the same anger it once had. Drawing a deep breath, Chase palmed the airlock control and tugged at the long coat he wore to hide his mechanized body. Hal's Hell had security systems that could see through such a simple disguise, but with the help of the ISF stealth tech, Chase would appear to be a normal human. When the pinnace's outer door opened, Chase was treated to a view of Hal himself ambling toward the ramp leading up to the ship. 
The man was unchanged, a stocky 170 centimeters with a glower that was permanently etched onto his pale face. Okay, Captain Pallas, you pulled strings with Port Authority to get in my bay, so what is it you want? The man asked while planting his fists on his hips. See, he doesn't recognize you, Potter said. Fooling internal security here is easy. I want the sort of thing that we should chat about in your office, Chase replied as he walked down the ramp, Tex following after. You can tell me here, Hal said over the link. Chase shook his head as he stopped a meter from the dock master. No, I can't. Let's go. Trust me, it's going to be worth your while. Hal grunted in annoyance, his gaze sliding over Chase to Tex's looming figure. The RR-4, unlike Chase, wasn't wearing a cloak to disguise his nature, though he wore his normal limbs and only light armor. Even so, there was no hiding that Tex was 270 centimeters of dire threat. You're gonna have to do better than that. Your mod job back there doesn't scare me. Now tell me what you have to offer. Chase took a step toward Hal, leaning down to whisper in the man's ear. I'm going to offer you a chance to see your next meal. How's that for starters? You can't threaten, Hal began to bluster, but then his face paled. My leak, it's offline. Chase pulled his lips back in a feral grin. Other things are going to go offline very soon, permanently. Your office, now. Hal ducked his head, something Chase had seen him do only rarely, when especially well-connected captains had addressed him, and led the way to his office. The designation of office was a bit of an overstatement. It was really a five-by-ten storage closet that Hal had claimed for his own. It was, however, clean, and had room for a small holo desk and two chairs. Chase settled into one while Tex closed the door and stood in front of it. Aren't you going to sit? Chase asked Hal, who was standing next to his desk. It's your office, after all. Hal glanced at Tex's near three-meter-tall figure and then dropped into his seat, a modicum of control coming back over his features. How did you do that, Pallas? He asked in a near-demanding tone. My link, you didn't even touch me. Well, for starters, I'm not Pallas. Chase disabled the simple, for ISF tech at least, holo mask that had subtly altered his features. Recognize me? Hal's brows dropped and his lips twisted into a sneer. Well, well, if it isn't Chase, you've come up in the world. Okay, so how'd you kill my link? This some prank you got the operations to play on me? No prank. Chase gave a languid wink. I didn't do a thing to your link, and Tex here didn't either, did you, Tex? I try not to touch garbage if I can help it. The RR-4 ground out the words like a hydraulic ram crushing refuse. Chase lifted a hand and wiggled his fingers at Hal. I guess we're just magic. Well, I hope you didn't come all this way just to play tricks on me. Hal's voice conveyed more bravado than his expression belied. I just run a docking bay. I don't have money, I don't have power. You know things, Hal. You know a lot of things. Stuff that doesn't make it onto the station networks. Stuff that no one logs anywhere. Eventually, if a thing is worth knowing, it makes its way to you. Hal folded his arms across his chest and stared silently at Chase for a few seconds, and then his scowl turned into a smile. Okay. So what do you want to know, and how much can you pay for it? Well, first off, I want everything you have on Pierce. Then I want our ship fueled, but not a soul is to step aboard it. If they do, you'll sever their link? Hal asked with a snort. Tex leant forward and grabbed a torsion bar that was leaning against the bulkhead. Chase knew from experience that Hal often threatened to beat people with it, and, as evidenced by the blood on the end, he'd carried out that threat once or twice. With a casual ease, Tex bent the torsion bar into a U and then tossed it onto the desk, where it slid to a stop directly in front of the dock master. Consider that our down payment, Tex rumbled. Chase tried not to laugh as the color drained from Hal's face. 
He knew it was base to make light of someone else's fear, but a snicker or two escaped before he managed to fully compose himself. Okay, Hal, let's have it. Everything on Pierce. Chase. All strength was gone from Hal's voice. The man was pleading now. If I spill, she'll kill me, or worse. Do you remember Rika? Chase asked. The woman that Pierce sold at auction? The woman you played a part in putting on that block? Hal's eyes stayed fixed on Chase's as he nodded slowly. Well, she's coming back. Very soon. She hasn't forgotten how you treated her. Rika? She's a pacifist. She hates. She's Genevia's future. Tex interrupted. Genevia? Hal asked, his face a mask of confusion. Genevia's gone. Chase shook his head. That's where you're wrong. In a month, probably less. The Parson system will be back in Genevia's fold. Now, enough stalling. I want Pierce. Payback's a bastard. Stellar date 02.05.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Decker Station. Merchant Docking Ring. Region, Parson System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. Kelly followed Chase and Tex in full stealth as they walked through the warehouse district on Decker Station's merchant ring. Though she tried to keep her mind calm and focused, there was no denying that the confrontation would be entertaining to watch. From what she could see of the captain, Chase appeared calm, but Kelly knew there had to be rage seething beneath the surface of his normally placid self. As the journey from Iberia to Parsons wore on, he'd become tenser and more irritable. The shift in his behavior hadn't been overt, but had been most apparent in the things he didn't say. Whenever the team discussed specifics for gathering intel in the Parson system, Chase would only tell them he'd start the ball rolling on Decker. When pressed, the captain had finally explained that they'd start with a dock master named Hal and move up from there. It was now obvious that he'd known who was next up the ladder all along. It wasn't until Kelly stood in the corner of Hal's office invisible and silent, that she'd put it all together. So far as Chase was concerned, Intel was a secondary objective. He was on Decker for revenge. Everyone in Rika's marauders had heard the story of how Rika had been sold at auction, but the details were always sketchy and changed a lot from telling to telling. Rika herself never spoke of it, though a few comments she'd made from time to time had led Kelly to wonder if said auction had occurred in the Parson system. Well, Kelly, now you have your answer. Parsons was just one shit show after another for Hammerfall. I just hope Chase gets something useful from this woman before he kills her. Normally, Chase would be the last person she'd worry about going off mission. He always put the job first. But in Hal's office, a different man had emerged. One who was willing to sacrifice a part of himself to cut out a piece of another. Something I know all too well. Ahead, Chase and Tex rounded a corner and approached a door with a sign over top that read Judy's Imports. The captain stopped and stared at the door for almost a full minute, finally squaring his shoulders and stepping forward. At that moment, it occurred to Kelly that Rika would not want Chase to kill in cold blood. No one in the battalion would. Though Rika was the heart of the marauders, it was clear to everyone that she leant on Chase in many ways. His calm surety gave Rika her strength, a strength she amplified and spread out to the rest of her people. Well, Kelly, you'll just have to make sure that Chase stays on the straight and narrow. If there's brutal murder to be done, it'll be by your hand. Kelly sidled up behind Chase as the captain banged a fist on the door. The marker on her HUD showed that Kelly was moving past the captain to take up a position next to the door. Kelly reached out, and brushed a hand against her sister in arm's shoulder in solidarity. Not that she expected any great challenge to lay within. It was just nice to know her family was always with her. Despite having spent considerable time in Parsons during the war, she'd never been on Decker. But it hadn't taken long for her to realize that this was a station living off the corpse of a dying system. She couldn't imagine that the locals could pose a significant threat to Chase and Tex, Throw in two stealthed SMIs as backup, and they could burn the whole place down. 
the half minute after Chase's fist had pounded on its plaz surface. The door leading into Judy's imports opened a crack, and a man's hooded face appeared in the darkness beyond. What the hell do you want? Chase squared his shoulders, his voice brooking no argument. My name is Captain Pallas, and you're going to take me to see Pierce. No one named. The man's words were cut off as Texas boots swung forward and kicked the door open, flinging the hooded man across the small office space within. He smashed into the wall and fell in a heap next to a small potted tree. We don't have time for your bullshit, Chase growled as he followed Tex in. Take us to Pierce. The man's hood had fallen back, an unbridled expression of fear visible for all to see. Despite his near panic, he shook his head in denial. Okay, look, I do know where she is, but Pierce doesn't operate from here. This is just a warehouse. You've got the wrong place. Should I just kill him and we'll look around ourselves? Tex asked Chase. Kelly eased into the small room and took up a position next to the man. From her vantage point, she could see the war taking place in Chase's eyes. For a moment, she thought he'd give the order, but then the captain shook his head. No, Tex, as much as I'd like to wipe out everyone in this shithole, we're not the murder squad. So far as I know, this asswipe had nothing to do with what happened to Rika. I really only care about Pierce. As Chase spoke, the man nodded rapidly, his words tumbling out almost unintelligibly. I've only been with Pierce for a year. I don't know anything about this Rika you're talking about. You want anything more from him? Kelly asked. No, just knock him out, Chase replied. Kelly knelt down and touched the back of the cowering man's neck, sending in a passel of nano that overrode his mods and put him to sleep. At times, she felt guilty over how easy it was for the ISF's tech to overcome that of regular people. A person's mind was supposed to be sacrosanct, but new Canaan technology could bypass almost any safeguard with near magical ease. She knew, however, that the alternative was to either ply a person with copious amounts of drugs or to hit them in the head until they passed out. Or shoot them, I suppose. I guess in the grand scheme of things, using this nano is the less smelly pile of shit. He got out and alert, Potter advised. I picked up a response from Pierce on their network. She's here. I'm tapping their systems to triangulate her location. Tex moved to a door on the right of the small reception area, while Kelly dropped a stealthed equipment sack before moving to another door in the back. That one leads to a back hall that circles around toward a bunch of offices, Potter advised, noting the door Kelly stood near on their huds. Texas leads into the warehouse area. Tex and I will hit them from the front. Chase stacked up behind Tex, pulling two rifles out from the sack. He passed one to his teammate while checking the other, and then grabbed helmets and passed the RR-4 his. Kelly and Kelly, you two go around back and pick off any who try to run. Plus, keep an eye out for Pierce. She won't run right away, too cocky. But when she sees how outmatched she is, I bet she'll bolt like a scared child. You got it, Captain. Kelly replied as Kelly joined her. We're gonna have fun. Not too much fun, Chase cautioned. We're here for a purpose. Hit it, Tex, Chase said. And the RR-4 nodded once in response before kicking the door open and flinging a handful of drones out into the room beyond. They lifted into the air and began to map out the interior of the warehouse. The space was larger than the public station layouts indicated, and Chase realized that the interior bulkheads had been removed, creating what might be the largest open area on the station. That's going to be fun to clear, Potter said. Take off your coat, Chase. He complied, and six of his drones lifted off, flying out into the open space. Looks clear, Tex said before darting through the door and into the warehouse, where he took up a position behind a stack of agrav pads. Chase moved forward, ready to cover the RR-4 should he come under fire. But the surrounding area remained silent, belying no sign of any occupants. Chase nodded and dropped a marker on the combat net, letting Tex know where he was going, and ran out into the warehouse, jumping onto a low crate, then leaping through the air to land atop a five-meter-high stack of nondescript gray cargo pods. Stars, you could fill a cruiser with all the stuff in here, he commented as he looked around. 
Potter sent more drones off the captain's back and out into the surrounding area. Moving, Tech said, and the two mechs began to carefully leapfrog their way through the warehouse toward the offices in the back. Anything? Chase called out to Kelly. Not yet. I'm set up in the back hall that leads from the warehouse to a station concourse. Kelly thinks this place might stretch all the way to the station bulkhead at one spot, so she's going to take a look. He wanted to admonish them to be careful, mildly annoyed that the two women had split up. Their SMIs, Chase reminded himself after a moment's reflection. Going solo is in their blood. Contacts, Potter called out, highlighting a point on the map she was building of the warehouse. I spot three, light armor, big rifles. Chase tapped the drone's feeds, getting a visual on the enemies. His jaw tightened as he recognized one of them from the day Rika was sold at auction. Jarl. He'd been half the pyro had put her into her cryopod. And then proceeded to kick the shit out of me. He ground his teeth at the memory. Tex, come around the left. I bet that they're going to set up behind those stacks of hull plating. You flank, I'll hold their attention. You got it, Captain. The hull plates were stacked on the far side of an open space in the warehouse. A few drones moved along the interior road, the first signs of activity Chase had seen in the facility. He dropped down behind one of the crate towers and activated his armor stealth systems. Ostensibly, the plan was for he and Tex to not use stealth in order to flush the enemies toward Kelly and Kelly. But he wasn't going to risk the man he remembered all too well getting away. Chase had never told Rika what Pierce's guards had done to him after the auction, how it had consumed no small amount of his savings to pay for the reconstructive surgery. He'd hunted one of the guards down afterward. That was how he'd learned it was an agent of the marauders who had bought Rika. That guard hadn't survived the encounter. Jarl, however, had gone to ground, and Chase had run out of time before the ship he'd booked passage on departed. At the time, he had been certain that he'd be able to put those events behind him, but every time he thought about the beating he'd received at the hands of those two guards, the feeling surged to the surface of his mind, the memories of his complete failure humiliating him all over again. He'd survived a war and the Nietzschean camps, and then two low-rent guards on Decker had pulverized him. He told himself that it had been the shock of seeing Rika in that state, about to be shipped away, that had left him vulnerable. He believed it, too but it didn't change the fact that if he'd kept his wits, he could have saved her. No matter, he thought, Jarl's going to get what he has coming. Tex signaled that he was in position, and Chase shook his head, clearing away the distracting memories. He eased between two crates, moving toward the right-hand side of the hull plates and setting up behind a waist-high pod labeled as containing titanium ingots. I'm ready, light him up. The RR-4 moved into the open and fired his AC-9 D rifle, a larger variant of the smaller AC-9 CRs that Chase preferred. The weapon sounded like a fusion engine coughing as it kicked 10-gram rail slugs out at the hull plates. For a moment, Chase was worried that the enemies wouldn't expose themselves to return fire, but then one of the three did, leaning around the far side of his cover to get Tex in his sights. However, the RR-4 had seen the man ease out, and was already back in cover before the enemy even fired his weapon. Chase was also ready. He let fire with a trio of armor-piercing rounds and smiled with satisfaction as his target fell. Nice shooting, Tex said. I, incoming, to your left, Tex, Potter advised. Chase looked at the markers the AI had dropped on the combat net and saw that a group of four enemies was moving toward Tex, two on the deck and two up on the crates. The RR-4 had gone from being a flanker to a flanky. I have these two, Chase said. You handle our four new guests. Just four? Easy. Gauging where Jarl would be, Chase tossed a burn stick high in the air, aiming it to come down atop the other enemy. Seconds later, a man came out from behind the hull plates, screaming as he ran. Chase casually fired his rifle and dropped the thug. Now it's just you and me, Jarl. He took a step back, took a deep breath, and rushed forward, planting a foot on the crate of ingots and leaping into the air, his mechanical legs sending him up over the hull plates. Oh, shit, Potter muttered, and Chase realized his mistake. In his haste to get to his enemy, he had carelessly leaped from his last firing location. 
Jarl had spotted him and fired an electron beam the moment Chase was in the clear. The stream of relativistic electrons hit him, and Chase spun to the side, clipping a section of hull plate before crashing to the deck. The shot had burned away part of the armor on his left side, but that didn't slow Chase down. Something seemed to snap within himself as he rolled to his feet and spun to face Jarl, firing on the guard while barreling forward. Jarl screamed unintelligibly, but Chase barely heard it, his vision beginning to tunnel, the locus of his greatest personal failures before him. A small voice in Chase's head told him to stop, told him not to let his past dictate his future but he ignored it, determined to punish the scum before him. A second later, he was on Jarl. He wrenched the man's weapon away before bringing his fists down again and again on the lightly armored foe, his vision turning red. Chase! Tex screamed from somewhere nearby, and suddenly Chase felt himself being yanked back, away from his target. He spun and saw Tex's shoulder as the RR-4 hauled him to his feet, pulling him back from Jarl. Sergeant, get the fuck off me, Chase snarled. You gotta stop, Captain. This isn't who you are. At his feet, Jarl moaned in agony. Chase clenched his jaw, wanting nothing more than to end the man's life, to finish doling out payback for what he'd done to both Rika and himself. He doesn't deserve mercy. Maybe not, Tex said quietly as he let go of Chase's arm. Probably not, but you gotta remember... Someday this war is going to be over, and we're going to have to figure out how to be people again, not killing machines. You need to remember that. If you shred yourself out here on the field, there won't be anything left for Rika when we finally get through this shit. Do you really believe that? Chase asked. That we'll see an end? All I see is war. I do. Tex replied with a resolute nod. I really do. As much as I'm loving your touching moment... I have movement on the far side of the road to your right, five people moving fast. Chase drew a calming breath as he saw that the five indicators Potter had placed on his HUD were moving toward Kelly's position at the rear exit. Looks like that's our target, Tex said. Chase glanced at Jarl, his armor skin showing that the man would live, something that gave him mixed feelings. Tex, you come in behind them. I'll get around front and intercept. On it. The RR-4 leaped onto a stack of shuttle hulls and disappeared down from view. Chase turned to his left and ran past the four enemies Tex had taken out. Noticing that though they were heavily armored, they hadn't stood a chance against the massive mech's weaponry. A gap appeared to his right, and Chase ducked down into it, not bothering to activate his battle-damaged stealth as he peered out into the row the five enemies were moving down. There were four heavily armored guards, three men and one woman with Pierce herself in the center of the group. Her brows were lowered in fury as they marched toward the rear exit that Kelly was covering. Chase drew his sidearm, set it to a projectile mode, and then shouldered his AC-9CR. He flipped the rifle to beam mode before striding out into the open and yelling at the top of his lungs, Freeze! The group skidded to a halt. Then one of the guards reached out and grabbed Pierce, pulling her toward the edge of the row, where a large fuel tank leaned against a stack of landing struts. They'd only made it a meter when Tex dropped from above and landed behind the guard, the chain gun on his left arm spinning menacingly as he lifted it toward the man's head. Don't you know what freeze means? The RR-4 rumbled. Drop your weapons, Chase ordered as he approached the group. Nothing funny happens and no one dies. None of the guards moved but they didn't drop their weapons. Pierce turned a glance at Tex before turning back toward Chase. You're dead, buddy. You just don't know it yet, she said. A split second later, an electron beam lanced down the row and hit one of the guards, tearing his wrist in half and sending his rifle falling to the deck. Nice shot, Kelly, Chase commented. Fuck, the man screamed. I didn't do anything, Chase shrugged. Well, I only said that no one dies. Unless you keep your brain in that hand, you're gonna live. The rest of you, weapons down and take a seat over there. He gestured to the side of the row on their left. The man whose hand had been shot off was first to move, earning him a hissed warning from Pierce. You do as he says, you're gonna die, she told him. They're mechs, the man shot back. 
Can't you see it? Who knows how many? We can't fight mechs. Pierce barked to laugh. You idiot. There aren't any mechs like that. It looks too normal. It's just armor. Chase lifted his left arm, which split apart to reveal a hidden electron beam. No, Pierce. We're mechs. Just not ones you've ever seen before. Fourth generation. Kelly suddenly appeared next to one of the guards, her GNR wrapping against his helmet. And you don't want to find out what else we can do. A minute later, the guards were lined up next to a row of solar panels, disarmed, their armor locked down, expressions of fear and disbelief mixed together on their faces. Chase stood in front of Pierce, towering over the woman as she glared defiantly up at him. Impressive how you cut off my link, Pierce said, not revealing an iota of fear. But I got a call out for help. Everyone on this station either owes me or I have something on them, which means they also owe me. You're going to be facing down a Nietzschean platoon in just a few minutes. So just like any other Tuesday, Tex said with a laugh. You have any company back there? Chase sent to Kelly. Now that you mention it, yeah, I do. Looks like at least a full tune of Neats is coming down the concourse. They here to dance with us? Chase sighed. <sighs> Seems that way. He switched to the encrypted channel Potter had established on Decker's network. Lieutenant Chris, you in position yet? Eh? That you, Captain? Sorry, we're just all having a nap. Weren't sure if you needed us for anything. Granted, I haven't caught much in the way of shut-eye. Yig snores like a maglev dragging itself down a busted track. I'll take that as a yes. Chase felt a smile pull at his lips, but it disappeared as Pierce let out an annoyed sigh. Well, time to wake up and do your thing. You got it, Chris said with a laugh. I just love to do my thing. Uh, I didn't mean it like that. Okay, where were we? Chase asked as he pulled off his helmet. I guess for starters, I'm curious if you recognize me. Should I? Pierce asked, her eyes narrowing to slits. I must not have made an impression. Do you remember a mech named Rika? She was a good friend of mine. Pierce's narrowed eyes snapped wide open, and she took a step back. You are mechs. Yeah, Chase nodded. We're Rika's advance team. That's what this is about? Revenge? Look. She stopped and gave him a questioning look. Captain Chase. Okay, Captain Chase. You know that Rika's days were numbered. Someone was gonna get their hands on her. In a way, I did her a favor. I got her off to people who would appreciate what she can do. From the sounds of it, it's all worked out pretty well, too. Like I said, everyone on Decker is in my pocket one way or another. Did you really come to Parsons to beat me to death for selling Rika, or do you need intel instead? Chase felt his anger at Pierce begin to fade. As much as he hated the woman, there was a modicum of truth to her words. However, the sound of weapons fire coming from Kelly's position brought his ire back to the forefront. Chris's distraction drew most of the platoon away, but they left a squad to play with me, Kelly reported. I can probably take them on my own, but some help would be nice. I'm on it, Kelly announced as she loped down the road toward the rear exit. How are the other entrances? Chase asked Potter. Drones haven't spotted anyone yet. Stations lighting up like a Nova, though. Everyone is rushing to the admin deck in response to Chris's little incursion. Tell Vargo to kick things off outside. Pierce wore a smug smile as she took a step closer to Chase. You look worried. Things not going your way? So far, so good, he replied as he pulled a pair of binders from a pouch on his back and nodded for Pierce to hold out her arms. In about 15 minutes, the station will be ours. As though to emphasize his point, the deck shuddered beneath their feet. Pierce's eyes grew wide. You're attacking the station? Chase held up two fingers, pinching them together. Just a little bit, yeah. You were just a side op, but I wanted to nab you before you could escape the sinking ship. He grabbed her shoulder and pushed her in the direction of the rear exit. How are you taking the whole station? The woman whispered. There are two Nietzschean destroyers out there. Chase checked the command network and saw that Vargo had the Asora in position to fire on the approaching Neats, while also ensuring no station patrol craft could launch an exterior assault on the admin deck. In a few minutes, there won't be, he replied. Vargo Klin eased the Asora into the close support position Chase had instructed him to take up. 
The ship was only four kilometers from Decker Station, too close for comfort, so far as he was concerned. Even with stasis shields, the proximity was making him itch. How are we looking, Chief? Vargo asked Ashley, his scan and weapons officer. Looks like the captain was right. None of the station's defenses can hit us here. One of the LHO's forearms gestured idly to the holo tank, where an image of the station rotated slowly. There used to be a turret cluster right off our port side, but it looks like someone stole half of it, or maybe it got shot up and someone stole a quarter of it. Either way, all the pew-pew parts are gone. Pew-pew parts, eh? Vargo asked with a laugh. So what do you think those two neat destroyers are gonna do? Well, Governor, I think they're... Chief Ashley, enough with the Governor stuff. The woman gave a sheepish shrug. Sorry, I can't help it. Think you'll get to be Governor of Parsons, too? The Neats, Ash. Your assessment of the Neats. The LHO sighed and turned back to our console. They're moving into position to fire on us without hitting the station. Surprised they care. Could be that their favorite bar is on Decker, Warrant Officer Glenn said as he ambled onto the bridge. How are things below? Vargo asked. Ship shape, Lieutenant, Glenn replied. Jakari and Lexi are on station in case the rail loader has issues again, and I personally checked all the tubes. We're locked and loaded. As the warrant officer spoke, a pair of corvettes came around the station's central hub, angling toward the admin deck, which lay near the center of the station's long spire. Vargo pulled up the corvettes' idents and hailed them. Decker patrol boats Foxhole and Fellhound. No, you can't come around the outside of the station and help your friends. That's cheating. Instead, you're going to move on to the provided vector and cease burn, or you will be fired upon. The response from the Corvettes was immediate. This is Lieutenant Mixon of the Fellhound. I see your idle threat and raise you the PMM Melrose and Skewdom. There's no way you can win. PMM? What the hell does that stand for? Ashley asked. Vargo only shrugged at the chief before replying to the enemy. That has to make you wonder, doesn't it? Wonder what? Lieutenant Mixon was clearly annoyed at this. Well, we're not blind. We knew you'd come to this party. We don't have death wishers, so we must have something up our sleeves. Bet you wonder what it is. No response came from the enemy corvettes, and Ashley laughed. Stumped him, Lieutenant. Tag the fell hound. Let Mixon over there know we mean business. Aye, Chief Ashley said, splashing a beam across their bow. A proton beam lanced from the Asura to the Corvette, punching through the smaller craft's shields to boil away a section of the craft's ablative plating before Ashley ceased fire. The Corvette rotated on its axis, turning the damaged plating away from the Asura, while the Fellhound and Foxhole both fired beams in return. The Asura's stasis shields flared to life, easily stopping the attack. Then the Melrose and Skewdom joined in, the two destroyers firing beams and kinetics. Barely a blip on the reactors, Glenn reported. I like fighting small ships like this. The Asura is the same tonnage as those Nietzschean destroyers, Ashley said to the engineer. We're a small ship, too. Yeah, but we have more teeth than they do. All Nietzschean craft, Vargo broadcast to the enemy. This is your final warning. Stand down or be destroyed. I'm Lieutenant Vargo of Rika's Marauders. The Parson system is now under our protection. Protection? Glenn asked, chuckling softly. Technically, we have to take it first before we can protect it. Semantics, Vargo shrugged. I'm trying not to sound all pretentious. I hate that shit. Ashley joined in with Glenn's laughter. Sure thing, Governor. In response to Vargo's warning, both the Corvette slowed, but still didn't move on to the vector he had sent. The two enemy destroyers held steady as well, though they ceased firing. I'll give them a minute. Vargo said aloud. In a minute, the Corvettes will be over station admin, Ashley cautioned. They can fry Chris's team, or threaten to. Vargo pursed his lips. Okay, ready a salvo for the vets, I hope. Vargo, Clen? A call came in from one of the Nietzschean destroyers. Is that you? The message had come from the PMM Melrose, and Vargo directed his reply to that ship. That's right. Who do I have the dubious pleasure of speaking to? Vargo, it's me, Sandra. The blood drained from Vargo's face, and he rose to his feet, slack-jawed. What? How? 
What are you doing on a Nietzschean destroyer? I could ask you the same, Sandra replied. That's a Nietzschean hull you're flying. Vargo's jaw tightened and he tried not to look at Glenn and Ashley, keenly aware that they were staring up at him. Sandra? Ashley mouthed the name, but Vargo only waved a hand, indicating for her to be silent. It might have been made in a neat shipyard, he replied to Sandra, but this is no Nietzschean ship. You're flying a Nietzschean ident. I didn't know they let GAF vets into their military. The words contained more vitriol than he'd intended, and he immediately regretted his tone. Before he had a chance to add anything to soften it, though, Sandra's response came back. Yeah, I see your marauder ident. Her words came fast, laced with anger and resentment. Not all of us were lucky enough to serve under General Mill in the war and get out free and clear, but I'm not in the neat space force. We're local militia. We just fly Nietzschean ships. Margot chewed on that for a moment, wondering if she was leading him on. He'd served with Sandra when she'd been a corporal in the GAF. They'd fought side by side on more than one occasion, and he owed her his life as she did him. But it's been a long time. People change, especially when people like the Neats come along and subjugate you. So if you're local militia, why do your ships not have that in their ident? He asked her. And where are the Neats? A laugh that was partially rueful and a bit sorrowful came back. As much as I hate to say it, Around here, you need to fly Nietzsche in colors to get respect. As for the Neats themselves, there's still a fleet in the system, but they're further down the gravity well. No one gives a shit about Decker, so the station administration pulled strings to get us to patrol out here. She's right about that, Ashley said quietly. Those ships have more patches on their hulls than hull. I bet they were derelicts from the battle here nine years ago. Vargo nodded absently in Ashley's direction while thinking about his reply. Okay, Sandra, I believe you and I'm sorry you got shafted and stuck here, but you still need to stand down. The marauders are taking the Parson system. A sigh came over the link from Sandra. Vargo, you're just gonna fuck things up. Marauders are mercs. You can't take and hold a system against Nietzsche with just mercs. He wanted to tell her that the marauders weren't just mercs. He didn't feel like a merc. In all honesty, Rika's battalion was more akin to freedom fighters. Before he could reply, a message came from Lieutenant Chris. You gonna do anything about those Corvettes drifting toward the admin section here? I can see them out of the op center's window, and it's making me a tad nervous. Sorry, yeah, just negotiating with the knee. Whoever these people are. Chop, chop, Vargo, times are wasting. Vargo drew in a slow breath and flipped on a full video feed, speaking aloud for the transmission to Sandra's ship. Sandra, this isn't a debate. I'm operating under orders for my commander, and I'm not going to disobey just because you don't think it's a good idea. You have 10 seconds to stand down. You're a mech? Sandra's surprised response came back a second later. Five seconds, Vargo responded, not allowing any emotion to creep onto his face. He hoped. Okay, okay, fuck. I'm ordering the Corvettes to move to the vector you supplied. Where would you like us to go? Vargo sent coordinates for the two Nietzschean destroyers. I want to see your shields and weapons powered down. Then I want your crews off your ships. You have enough shuttles for that? Yeah, but we can't just abandon these destroyers. Five-person skeleton crews, then, Vargo said. Once you're clear, we'll send a shuttle to collect you and the other captains from their ships. Okay, transmitting that to the others. You're a real piece of work, you know that, Vargo? Vargo didn't know how to respond and instead closed the channel, sagging back into his chair. I think she likes you, Glenn said, a grin stretching from ear to ear. Yeah, Vargo pressed the heels of his hands into his eyes. That sure felt like a lover spat. Drop probes so we can monitor their ships. Wait, has Chris taken control of the station's defensive systems? He has, Ashley reported. The marauders now control Decker. Vargo glanced at the image of the station on the main holo, its seven rings slowly spinning around the central spire, which was anchored to a small asteroid. Great, our first bona fide shithole. Reorient. Stellar date 02.05.8950, adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Lance, 15 light years from Parson System. Region, interstellar dark layer, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. 
Wait. Rika held up her hand and locked eyes with Silva. You never told me that you saw Amy again before jumping out with Carson's fleet. Silva flushed and glanced around the Fury Lance's forward officer's mess. And I'm not exactly supposed to either. Tangel told me to keep it hush-hush. From me? Rika pressed. Well, it has to do with where Amy went. Silva's voice had dropped to a whisper. You can speak normally, Nikki said. I've dropped a nanocloud. No one can hear us. So where did your daughter go? Rika asked, unable to quell her own maternal instinct to protect the young girl. I thought Tana, Tangel's daughters took her to New Canaan to stay with them. Yeah, they did, Silva replied through thinned lips. And then they took her on a jaunt to the LMC. The LMC? Where's that? Silva's eyes twinkled mischievously as she responded. Oh, you know, the large Magellanic cloud. For a moment, the words Silva had uttered made no sense. Then a knowing smile crept across the major's lips. Get the fuck out, Rika whispered. Your daughter, little Amy that I rescued from a farm on Fasima, has been to another fucking galaxy? Um, I can't mask you if you scream, Rika. The whole room kind of heard that. Rika glanced around at the dozen lieutenants and captains in the room. Every face in the room turned toward her in open curiosity. You heard nothing. Not a word, not a peep. They all nodded and grudgingly turned back to their meals and conversations. Okay, Silva, from the start, spill. The major laughed and took a sip of her coffee before striking up her tail. I got this from a number of sources. Amy was only on the periphery of some of this, so her account doesn't quite match perfectly. But here's the basic rundown. Firstly, I guess the ISF has been building up in the LMC for a few years now. Tangel's daughters got permission to take an Orion prisoner, some guy named Colonel Kent, out there to show him the futility of Orion's war and convince him that he should just change sides. Did it work? Rika asked, wondering if that was a viable strategy for other POWs. Surprisingly, yes. On top of that, while they were out there, Tangel's daughter sniffed out some old enemy and killed him too. Seems as though Carrie Richards is following in her mother's footsteps at an early age. Being one heck of a kick-ass woman? Rika asked with a laugh. No. Well, yes, I guess. Silva gave a somber shake of her head. Ascending. She's doing the whole multi-planar existence thing, just like mom. Rika gave a low whistle. Well, shit. That's just the start, Silva continued. Tangela and Sarah came back from the LMC with Sarah's two clone sisters and her father. Wait, wait. I thought Sarah's father was dead. He was. This one's a clone. Or that one was a clone. I'm really not sure. It seems like a touchy subject, so I didn't press. Either way. Sarah has two clone sisters now. The three of them are quite the side, let me tell you, enough to make a girl consider changing teams. Rika chuckled at the thought of there being three versions of the transcend sexually charged president. I'm not into ladies, but I can still see the appeal. Sarah's got quite the allure. Okay, so who's in charge of the transcend then? I guess they turned it all over to Jeffrey Tomlinson, but Tangela is taking a more active role in galactic governance now, rather than just focusing on the war effort. Things are changing so fast. I really don't know what's what. When I was last on the I-2, it had just gotten back from attacking Eartha out in the transcend. That's when I saw Amy. She had come back to the ship with Tangel's daughters while they were all out at Aldebaran. Rika pressed her hands to her temples. You're making my head spin, Silva. They were at Aldebaran too? What for? I guess some new group called the League of Sentience has set up shop there. They're in opposition to the hegemony of worlds, and Tangel was sealing the deal with them. She fought some sort of ascended AI while there, too. Damn. Rika took a sip of her coffee, then shook her head as she set it back down on the table. Can I just say that I'm so glad I don't have Tangel's schedule? I mean, that woman is flying all around two galaxies, trying to keep everything from coming apart at the seams. I don't think I could handle that sort of responsibility. Silva cocked an eyebrow, and Nikki gave a soft laugh. You're kind of doing it on a smaller scale, Rika. Not exactly. If I fail, then Tangel just has to come in and stomp on Constantine. 
But if she fails, we all get stomped on, repeatedly. What a lovely way to look at it, Nikki said. I lived through the dark ages, though. After that, I think I can survive any amount of stomping. Pardon? Silva's eyes grew round as saucers. Oh ho, Rika crowed. I have my own little surprise to drop on you. It's really my surprise, Nikki corrected in a droll tone. Do you want to tell it? Rika asked. No, I want to see how well you retained what I've explained to you. See what I have to put up with, Rika asked Silva with a well-meaning smile. I'd take an AI in a heartbeat. Silva's gaze lost focus for a moment. I hear they're great at keeping you company when you can't sleep at night. Rika barked a laugh. <laughs> they're not pets. Well, we do like to chat, though. Those of us who are crazy enough to live in a human skull anyway. You know, Silva, I'm trying to convince Piper to have children. He'll give in eventually. When he does, we'll keep you on the short list of takers if any of his scions want to take up residence in a human. Thanks. Silva ducked her head in a quick nod, genuine gratitude in her voice. That would be really great. Now enough stalling. What's this surprise? Oh, nothing. Rika drawled. Just that Nikki is the oldest AI in existence. I doubt that, but close maybe. Seriously? Silva asked eyes wide. Yep, she was born in the 31st century. Crap. Really, Nikki? Were you in stasis or shut down or something a lot? Not a lot, no. For a couple of centuries, all told, Nikki replied. I've been conscious for over 4,700 years. I guess it's what gives me a bit of my blasé, this too shall pass attitude. Granted, I'll also be the first to admit that things are different this time. How so? Silva asked. Well, for starters, when the Dark Ages really set in, the FGT wasn't in a position to help. I mean, they tried, but it didn't work. Rather than risk their own civilization, which they rightly considered to be the future salvation of humanity, they bailed. Seems cowardly, Rika said in a quiet voice. Maybe, Nikki allowed. But you know how it is if you try to save a drowning person. They'll pull you under. And since the ascended AIs were actively trying to drown humanity, they might have decided that the FGT needed to go down too. Either that or they directly influenced Tomlinson and Kirkland to back off from the inner stars. We may never know. And you were around for all that? Silva asked, her voice trailing off in wonder. Where were you? All over, to be honest. I was at Procyon when they first got dark layer transitions working and discovered that you don't want to dump into the DL right next to a star. I joined a mapping expedition that went out and discovered that, when you were outside a star's heliopause, the dark layer was an utter void, and how the frictionless aspects and the size difference in the reference frame allowed for FTL. Whoa, wait. Rika held up a hand. Are you telling us that you were involved in the discovery of FTL, and you didn't feel like mentioning this to me before? Rika, 4,500 years. If I were to tell you everything I've done, it would take decades. I feel like FTL is a big one, Silva said, and Rika nodded emphatically. Well, keep it on the down low. Despite the fact that everyone loves being able to zip around space, I spent a long time running from blame over starting the FTL wars. Did you? Rika asked, keenly aware that her eyes had been overwide for several minutes now. Well, not exactly, no. Look, can we talk about that another time? I'm personally more interested in whether or not Tangel defeated Ertha. You never actually said what the outcome was, Silva. And I'm interested in why none of this was in the intel updates that Carson delivered, Rika mused. He just jumped into the Albany system when you called for help. I don't think he knew half this stuff, and I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be sharing. I know that a lot of it is being kept hush-hush while they try to ferret out Erthan supporters. So she wasn't defeated? Nikki asked. That's unfortunate. Did they capture the ring at least? Silva shook her head. From what I heard, they actually did defeat Ertha. Turns out she was fully ascended and didn't have a physical form anymore. Well, some people said she may still have been tied to the ring. But I didn't want to bother Bob or Tangel with any questions to find out for sure. Anyway, a shard of Ertha, someone known as Helen, got away. She's ascended too. They're worried that she'll grow in power and just replace Ertha. 
Shit, Rika muttered, out of the fire and into the pan. Other way, Nikki chuckled softly, out of the pan and into the fire. That makes no sense. Silva shook her head and scowled at Rika's forehead. Who would jump into a fire? That's the whole, oh, never mind. So they defeated Eartha and the civil war in the transcend is over? Well, I think it's going to take a bit to let everyone know that it's really over. But they're not going to have to throw as many resources at internal struggles. I don't know if they'll move the capital back to Eartha or keep it in Cardin. I guess that'll be President Tomlinson's call. Rika took a sip of her coffee and grimaced when the cold liquid touched her lips. Damn cups, she said, looking at the side of the mug to see it flashing a thermal arrow light. Here we are with the most advanced bodies in the galaxy, but the freaking cups on the ship can't keep our coffee warm. Silva winked at Rika. Well, you are on a Nietzschean hull, after all. What did you expect? Rika reached out and placed a hand on the bulkhead to her left, glad to see that she'd splayed all five fingers properly. Are you besmirching my beloved Fury Lands? Not exactly, Silva replied. I mean, it's an impressive ship, a huge ship. And the way you captured it will be the stuff of legends. But couldn't you at least rename the thing? Silva, Rika met her former mentor's level gaze with one of her own. Do you know how hard it is to rename a ship this big? We'd have to scrub away every vestige of the former name. That would take forever, and we've all come to like the land, made it our own. I guess it's okay, Silva shrugged. It just seems so Nietzschean. Sure, Rika said with a nod, but it's so mech to take the neat spear and throw it right back in their faces. She makes a good point, Nikki added. Okay, okay, Silva held up her hands. I concede. Genevia. Stellar date 11.09.8949. Adjusted years. Location, throne room, NES Belgara. Region, Prusia system, Nietzschean Empire. Three months ago. Though he knew jump gates were safe, after all, Garza used them all the time, Constantine still felt a sliver of fear as the Belgara approached the two-kilometer-wide ring. He straightened his spine and stared at the display dominating the forward bulkhead of his audience chamber, daring the jump gate and its roiling sphere of energy to displease him. A part of the man wished that he could have made the jump in private, or even on the Belgara's bridge where Admiral Hammond and Captain John D. would be. But that was not an option for him. Instead, he was surrounded by his retinue, ministers, advisors, and assorted sycophants. He glanced to his right and nodded to the naked man who knelt next to his chair. The slave held up a bowl of magma cherries. Constantine selected one and popped it into his mouth. His head fell back, resting against the soft silken cushion of his chair as he repositioned his feet on the back of the woman before him. Woman? He glanced down to be sure, seeing her breasts dangling, but then also spotted male genitalia. He remembered that several of his latest attendants were chimera hermaphrodites, what some believed to be the pinnacle of human physical evolution. Constantine thought the notion to be absurd, but he enjoyed collecting unique specimens all the same. So far as he was concerned, they were just a rare breed that gained value from their uniqueness. Not that creating a chimera was complex, so far as he understood, but the one beneath his feet was a natural birth, something far more uncommon. My emperor, a man's voice came from his left shoulder, and Constantine turned to see Minister Kell next to him, a look of deep concern on his face. What is it? He asked, glad that his voice sounded calm and self-assured. What if something goes wrong? Kell asked. Constantine shrugged off the question. Then we die. Are you afraid to die for Nietzsche, Akel? Of course not, he exclaimed. I would lay down my life for her. A thousand times I would die for Nietzsche. Good, Constantine said. Then you have nothing to fear. Kel nodded silently, and Constantine caught sight of General Garza standing across the room, speaking to several other members of the emperor's court. The Orion general caught the emperor's eye, and his lips turned up in a knowing smile. 
It wasn't a smile of camaraderie, though. It was a smile designed to serve as a reminder of who was really in control. Admiral Hammond, the emperor called out, and a hollow image of the man appeared before his throne. Take us through. Yes, my emperor, Hammond replied and inclined his head before he disappeared. A second later, the ship began to move forward, and Constantine forced himself to relax and not grip the arms of his chair. Across the room, Garza laughed loudly, throwing his head back in mirth. Keep making your digs at me. I'll find out what you did to my body eventually. The thoughts dripped like acid through his mind, burning away his fear. I'll find out, and then I'll do it to you. Your empire may be vast, but you're not Nietzscheans. You're weak cowards who hide in the dark. As he thought through a litany of things he'd do to Garza, the ship made the jump. For a split second, the display showed nothing at all, and then a starscape snapped into view. At a glance, it would almost appear to be the same as the view they'd just left behind. The background was still dominated by the Percipi Cluster's brilliant glow, but it was noticeably brighter and consumed more area. Another difference was that before they jumped, the light of Prusia was behind them. But now the twin stars of the Genevia system, Terrell and Luxem, hung before them. The Belgara was close to Luxem, just a few light seconds from the planet Belgium, a small blue orb barely visible to the left of the star. That would be where he would take up residence for the following months. You see, Constantine said, glancing at Kel. Nothing to it. And before long, we'll have hundreds of gates at our disposal, tools to spread Nietzsche's dominion across the stars. Kel looked visibly relieved and nodded silently for a moment before finally saying, Yes, my emperor. Across the room, Garza was staring at Constantine, and the emperor wondered what the general was truly thinking. Something in the other man's gaze made him think that Garza desperately wished to be the one sitting on a throne. A day later, Constantine stood within the west viewing room in Casamond at the top of Belgium's Mount Genevia, gazing out the windows at Luxem as it drifted down toward the horizon. Casamons had been the private residence of the last Genevian president, and somehow had escaped destruction when Genevia fell to the Nietzschean forces. Though he'd taken a full sensory walkthrough of the estate after the world of Belgium had been captured, Constantine had never visited. Truth be told, he'd never visited any conquered territory in Genevia. Until now, he'd had no need. My emperor, a voice came from the entrance behind him. Your guest has arrived. Send her in, he said without taking his eyes from the view that stretched out before him. A few seconds later, the sound of strange snapping footfalls reached his ears. With slow precision, the footsteps crossed the room and stopped a few meters behind him. Emperor Constantine. The woman's voice contained no deference, no hint that she was at all subservient. He was surprised that she'd be so bold, especially given that the woman was Genevian. Danella, he said after a few moments, deigning to turn rather than demand she come around before him, though it rankled him to do so. Despite the impropriety, he was more curious to see her with his own eyes than he was annoyed at her lack of proper deference. Genevians rarely understood their place. That was a large part of why the conflict with their people had begun in the first place. The first thing that struck him about Danella was that she was tall, almost impossibly tall, over two and a half meters without the heels she wore, which pushed her over three. Or maybe those are her feet. It's hard to tell where woman ends and machine begins. If any of it is actually machine, it could all be biomods. Part of the difficulty in knowing her true nature was that, accepting her face, Danella's skin was covered in small iridescent scales that shifted ever so slightly, creating the illusion that they were crawling all over her body. On second thought, I think her scales are crawling all over her body. She shifted before him, a gesture that seemed to imply that he should take his time looking her over. He obliged and took a step back, starting with her feet, which ended in fine needle-sharp points. From there, 
Her legs rose half a meter before coming to the first knee, then a second, and finally a third, before her legs met her torso. As his gaze trailed up her lower limbs, he realized that she was actually crouching to fit in the room. Her arms, if they could be called that, were nearly just as long, at least two meters from shoulder to their own needle-like points. They weren't resting on the ground, but he suspected that she had agraph systems in them to help balance her decidedly insectile body. Adding to that impression, a scorpion-like tail rose up behind her, and though her torso wasn't much larger than a normal human's, it sported six breasts running down the front. Impractical, he thought as he took in that modification. Granted, much about this person is. Do you like it, Emperor Constantine? Danella finally asked. Just a little creation I made the other day. I suppose it's interesting, Constantine replied. Do you modify yourself often? The woman laughed and there was a strange, almost insectile clacking to the sound. My dear emperor, the human body is the greatest canvas ever made. Why would I eschew painting on my own? What if you make a mistake? Constantine asked. A look of mock horror came across Danella's face, and the emperor found himself mesmerized by her eyes, which he now realized were almost twice as large as they should be. Mistakes? She shook her head vigorously. I do not make mistakes. I'll admit to a few happy accidents here and there, but certainly not mistakes. I must admit, Constantine said, turning back to the windows and the view of Luxem sliding below the horizon. I'm surprised you've done so well in the wake of Genevia's fall. I thought I would have to hunt you down in some dark corner of the system. Imagine my surprise to find that you weren't in hiding at all. I'm a very useful person. Danella replied. Well, you Nietzscheans aren't so interested in the types of mods I specialize in. Many of your people have taken a liking to, well, let's just call them pets. Constantine was aware of the practice. While he considered it to be foppery, Nietzschean morality had no prescription against turning people into things. If a person was able to be subjugated, then by the master morality, they should be. Slaves will be slaves. Despite her skill, that's all Danella was. Not only a slave to Nietzsche, but a slave to her own predilections. Both carnal and psychological, it would seem. Is it true what they say? Danella asked as she moved closer, her needlepoint feet making their strange snapping sound. Are you a virgin, Emperor Constantine? A smile crept across the emperor's lips, as he saw the twelve guards in the room lift their weapons and take aim at the strange woman who was creeping toward their ruler. In addition to the human guards, there were several dozen automated defense systems in the room, each one more than enough to kill Danella before she laid a single... whatever on him. He sent out a signal to the guard's armor, triggering a system that would mute his and Danella's words, as well as mask their lip movements, ensuring their privacy. It is Danella. I have no need of carnal pleasures. They are beneath me. The woman's chittering laugh sounded once more. Rumor has it that you surround yourself with a lot of naked people. That seems like carnal pleasure to me. Do you believe all the rumors you hear? Most, Danella replied. People like to hide more than they show, which means there are secrets everywhere. And usually, even if the rumors aren't true, it's fun to think they are. Interesting. I wonder about what the rumors say of you. Rumors about me? Danella said with mock gasp. Oh, do tell. Those are the best kind. Constantine pursed his lips, suddenly annoyed with the banter. I need you to build me a new body, woman. Oh? Danella's eyebrows rose. Are you looking to try something more? Interesting? No. Constantine shook his head. I want it to be exactly like this one. A clone? No, a new body for me. Then this one will perish. One of Danella's long arms rose to her lips, and she tapped it slowly. Interesting. How very interesting. I can't wait to begin.
eking intel. Stellar date 02.05.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Marauder Shuttle, Decker Station. Region, Parson System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Chase couldn't help but smile at the surly expressions on the faces of the other passengers in the shuttle. It was quite the eclectic group. Seven prisoners hunkered in their seats under the watchful gaze of the Kellys, Shoshan, and Tex. The row ahead of Chase was occupied by Pierce, Station Master Becca, and the Nietzschean garrison CO, a man named Idar. Twice now, Becca had tried to speak to the others, but whenever she opened her mouth, Kelly tapped the woman on the head with the barrel of her GNR, clearly enjoying a little passive intimidation. In the row behind him sat the captains of the four ships that had surrendered. Sergeant Crunch was in the process of leading sweeps through each craft, while Lieutenant Chris was consolidating control over Decker. Such as it is, Chase thought with a soft laugh. The key to holding Decker, at least in the short term, was to let as many sleeping dogs lie as possible. He'd instructed Chris to ensure nothing egregious occurred, but not to worry about the never-ending petty theft that was the status quo across the station. With any luck, Station Master Becca could be brought around to the right side and could continue to administer Decker with a few changes. Chase chewed on his cheek, thinking about what he'd like to do on the station as compared to what he'd actually be able to manage in any reasonable time frame. That was the general problem with the revolution they were bringing, it required the Genevian populace to rise up and do what was right. Something easier said than done, especially when a single marauder destroyer wouldn't displace the decades-old fear of the Nietzschean military. What he really needed to do was ferret out who the resistance leaders were, if there were any. During his time on Decker, Chase had never seen any signs of an organized underground that was actively opposing the Neats. But that was where the seven people in the shuttle with him would come into play, one of them would know something about Genevian resistance, if for no other reason than that they'd have been tasked with taking it out, or have taken it out already. That caused him to ponder Sandra. The woman was the senior captain in what was referred to as the Parsons People's Militia. A quick inquiry in Decker's databases told a different story. The Neats called them Parsons Auxiliary Strike Force 7, and they answered to a Colonel Raz, who operated out of a base further in system. It wasn't quite like Sandra was in the Nietzschean military, but it was close. Far too close. What do you think of Sandra and the others? Chase asked Potter as the shuttle eased toward the Asura. You mean as to whether or not they're traitors? You never pull punches, Potter. I don't have fists. I've never punched in my life. Chase laughed aloud, not caring that everyone on the shuttle turned to look at him. Okay, fair enough. So yeah, about Sandra. Well, it's hard for her to commit treason against something that doesn't exist anymore. Depending on how she conducts herself, she might even be a true patriot, working to keep her people safe under Nietzschean rule as best she can. That same thought had occurred to him as well. There had also been something in Vargo's voice when the lieutenant had brief chase on Sandra. The lieutenant respected the woman and wanted to trust her. But people change a lot. One never knew what leverage existed behind the scenes, driving a person to do the things they did. It could be anything from family members under threat to simple guilt. It could even be straight-up mental coercion. That sort of thing wasn't the Nietzschean's modus operandi. But the marauders had seen the enemy do a number of very unneat like things of late. We should get them in auto docks as soon as possible, Chase said. Make sure no one has them under an aegis or something. Of course, Captain, that's SOP. Potter's tone was neutral. That won't tell us about their intentions, though. The ISF didn't give us any tech like that. I know, Chase replied. I get the impression that the ISF doesn't dig into people's minds. I'll reserve judgment. In my experience, everyone crosses the line at some point. He chewed on that for a moment wondering what the AI was implying, but decided not to pursue it. I've got more than enough on my mind, he shook his head. So back to Sandra. You're just going to have to talk to her, get intel, test it, see what shakes out. Rika's likely only a few weeks behind us, 
he replied. Another option is to just wait it out here. Parsons has a larger neat presence than Iberia, but not so much that our fleet will have any trouble. We have nearly 70 ships now, nearly all equipped with stasis shields. The neat have a hundred here, but if the state of Sandra's ships is any indication, then we don't have much to worry about. And you're going to trust what things look like on the surface? Just wait it out? Chase shook his head again, then turned to look out the porthole as the shuttle finally eased into the Asura's Bay. No, I guess not, he whispered. He lapsed into silence as the shuttle docked, remaining in his seat as the prisoners were let out, following behind Callie. There, warrant officers Glenn and Lexi waited in the bay, along with Vargo. All three stood stone-faced as they surveyed the ship's new guests, though Chase noted that Vargo's eyes lingered on Sandra Overlong. Okay, Chase said once his feet were on the deck. Run them all through the auto docks and then send me Pierce first. The gangster tossed her head, long black hair swinging around as she turned to regard him with her steely gaze. I knew you liked me best. Or I want to get the worst over with as quickly as possible, he replied before turning to Vargo. Walk with me, Lieutenant. Yes, sir, Vargo said. Chase led him into the corridor. Once there, he turned right toward the forward lift bank. Glancing at the RR-4, he asked, anything I need to know about you and Captain Sandra? Vargo blew out a long breath. Well, there never was a me and Sandra, though I wouldn't have said no if she'd ever reciprocated. I'd like to think she was into me, but she was always duty first, all about self-sacrifice. That's good to hear, Chase said. Vargo laughed. What, that she rejected me? Well, that's a silver lining. Chase flashed a grin at Vargo, but know that she values honor and duty. Means that she might be working with the Neats as a way to protect the Genevians. That thought had crossed my mind as well. And, do I think it's likely? Maybe. She sort of insinuated that a bunch of mercs smashing their way through Parsons wouldn't be good for the people. Chase snorted. <laughs> like everything sunshine and roses with the Neats in command. I bet she's not been to Decker's Warrens. There are people down there who haven't had a proper meal in years. It's just a big social experiment to the needs. You never know. She may have visited those places. She was always a bit of a bleeding heart. Reminds me of someone else I know, Chase replied, his lips twisting into a wry smile. <laughs> One of the colonel's best qualities. Vargo laughed and looked up at the overhead, taking a deep breath before lapsing into silence. The two men reached the lift and Chase turned to Vargo. I'm curious. Why do you follow Rika? You've been around, a lot. I'm certain that you're older than your records say. Easily 150, right? Vargo gave a conspiratorial wink. 192 in a few days. Shit, Chase exclaimed. You might just be the oldest person in the company. Dunno, the lieutenant replied. I don't keep track of that stuff. And my question, Chase said as they stepped into the lift. Well, I got assigned to the Golden Lark, and then to Rika's company. Then after we took these ships, she made me captain of the Asura. The rest is history. Funny man. Chase shook his head. You know what I mean. Why Rika? She's just a kid to you. Vargo shrugged as the lift began to rise. I like Rika's style. She kicks ass, takes names, but doesn't abuse her power. She's not a bully which is what too many people turn into once they get a taste of power. Most people are destroyed by what she's gone through. With Rika, it only made her stronger. I admire her. Something in the way he spoke made Chase wonder if the lieutenant was being somewhat self-referential. Of course, Vargo said, favoring Chase with a wink. Sometimes I wonder if I'm nuts for following a 30-year-old into war. She's done better than a lot of others before her. The lift doors opened and the two men walked out. For sure, better than I did, at least, Vargo admitted. Let's grab a bite in the officer's mess, Chase suggested as he led the way down the corridor. You can tell me all about Sandra and how you're still pining for her, Vargo snorted. I think that ship has crossed the heliopause, but maybe I'll have some useful insight. You can eat something if you want, Chase said to Pierce gesturing to the servitor standing near the bulkhead. I'll pass, the woman said as she settled into the chair across from him. 
We just put you through our auto dock. We're not trying to poison you or anything. Pierce snorted and shook her head. <sighs> yeah, I get that. But just because I don't think you're going to poison me doesn't mean I want to break bread with you. Huh. Chase shook his head. And here I thought we had a growing rapport back on Decker. You were going to tell me all the things I wanted to know to gain control of Decker and Parsons. Oh, eyes on the bigger prize? Pierce asked. All of Parsons, is it? Chase leaned forward, placing his elbows on the table. All of Genevia. That's the bigger prize. And after that, we crush Nietzsche. Pierce pursed her lips. She held the expression for a moment, and then a laugh burst free. The woman didn't hold back, all but caterwauling in her faux mirth. You about done yet? Chase asked after a minute. I don't know who you think you're performing for. It's just me in here. Sorry, Pierce managed to say between gasps. It's just... Stars, I think she actually hyperventilated, Potter said. Quite the show. Chase initiated a holo display. The image of a vast armada hovering over the table between himself and Pierce. Have you seen this? Maybe, Pierce said, almost instantly calm. Looks like one hell of a Nietzschean fleet. Despite her words, Chase could see a look of recognition in the woman's eyes. He played the I-2's approach at high speed, slowing when the Nietzschean fleet opened fire on the massive ship. Once it was lit up on the display, he paused the visual. What about that? I heard about some new fleet taken on the Neats and Thebes, Pierce said, her tone sober and guarded. But I don't believe that the Neats were crushed. No way, not that many ships. It would take Scipio or the hegemony to defeat them so soundly. And neither of those empires give a shit about what happens in Precipi. You'd be surprised, Chase said in a quiet voice. Why's that? He resumed the playback, watching Pierce's face as she saw that the I-2 would survive the barrage, and then saw her jaw drop as ships began to appear all around the Nietzschean armada, cutting the enemy apart. Fabrication, Pierce said as the playback ended. You can't jump that deep in system, and there's no way that many stealth ships could have gotten that close to the enemy without being detected. You're right, Chase replied, but there's a lot of supporting evidence. Let's talk about what I imagine you've heard through your informants. First off, you know that the Marauders operate in Septian Thebes. You might have even heard that the Marauders took out the Politica, proof that they've been active in that region of late. You also know that the Neats drew ships away from Parsons and other systems in this area. A lot of ships. I bet that a woman with an ear to the ground like you also heard that they were headed towards Septia. He paused and saw from the look in Pierce's eyes that his statements were indeed confirmations of what she knew. If all that is true, then tell me this. If the fleet that was sent out to crush Septia and Thebes did just that, how is it that the marauders are leading an incursion into old Genevia now? Old Genevia, Pierce snorted out the words with a generous helping of derision. Enough equivocation, answer the question. Maybe you just saw an opportunity to pillage old Genevia while the Neats are away. It was Chase's turn to snort a laugh. <laughs> Stars, Pierce, if I were looking for a sweet target to help me get rich fast, it would not be Decker. It wouldn't be anywhere in a hundred light years of here. Fair enough, so. Pierce gestured at the empty space between them where the holo of the battle had played out. If I'm to believe that this is all real, then you're the vanguard for this force? It's sweeping through Nietzsche now? Now you're getting it, Chase replied. The bulk of our fleet will be here in a few weeks, under the command of Colonel Rika. Colonel? Pierce spat out the word in disbelief. Yeah, Colonel. Pretty much everyone who serves under her is a mech, too. When they get here, we'll have to make sure that you selling her at auction stays on the down low. If word of that got out, there wouldn't be enough left of you to pull DNA from. Pierce had paled visibly, but didn't respond, her lips instead forming a thin line. Good, Chase nodded. Now that we've finally gotten that out of the way, there was all this actionable intel you were eager to trade in exchange for continuing to draw breath. Well, what do you want to know? Pierce asked in a guarded tone. I could talk all day about tons of shit, but that won't help much. Let's talk Parsons first, Chase said. Is there an active resistance in the system? Active? 
Pierce rolled her eyes. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say that. Chase lowered his face into his hands and shook his head. Fuck, Pierce. Do you have to have an editorial comment about everything? I get it. You're real clever. Now just answer the damn question with details about what you know. Fine. Pierce chewed out the word. There are a few groups on Nera that have tucked themselves into mountainous regions, living in caves and shit. A few pirates here and there, too. Nothing significant or organized. I should know. I've sold them half their weapons. Pirates? Chase pressed. As in lone wolves raiding merchants or crews hitting civil and military targets? Pierce's gaze met Chase's eyes. Nothing like what you're hoping for. I suppose some have hit smaller stations and raided a few supply depots, but it's not a force that will help you take Parsons. I'm not looking for help taking Parsons, Chase replied. I'm looking for help holding it. A system is a lot more than a few warships defending it. It needs leaders. Gee, you really do care. Chase ignored her comment. Tell me about the rebels you know of. Pierce went on to describe what she knew of the pirates who operated in and around Parsons, which stations were known to harbor them, and what resources she suspected the rebels in the mountains on Nera possessed. Several former political leaders were rumored to be amongst them. Several other Genevian leaders were currently in power, most reviled by the populace, who saw them as traitors. Chase wondered how much of the leadership was truly opportunistic slime, and how many were like Sandra, or at least what they hoped Sandra to be. Tell me about the Parsons people's militia, Chase said. Stars, what a shit show, they... What did I say about the editorial comments? She groaned. You take all the fun out of everything. That's me. Chase slathered his words in sarcasm to get his point across. The fun police, you were saying? I think I'll have something to eat now. She turned to the servitor. A beer, whatever you have that's malty, and a salad with grilled chicken, Kaiser dressing if you have it. Of course, the servitor said and trundled away. The PPM, Chase reiterated. Well, where do I start? Their ships are mostly hulls that have sat in scrap nets since the Neats took Parsons. A couple of them are Genevian ships, but most are Nietzschean hulls. By and large, they're crewed by your types. My types? Chase asked, his brow lowering. Mechs? No, soldiers who don't know how to do anything but make war. Chase didn't credit Pierce's statement with a response and twirled his finger, indicating that she should carry on. Right, so you get people like Sandra. She means well, but she's a puppy playing with sharks. Wolves, Chase interjected. Pierce's brow lowered. What? Puppies don't typically end up in situations where they play with sharks. The saying is that they play with wolves. I've seen vids of puppies in the ocean. Pretty sure that's where the sharks are. I don't know why you're still talking to her, Potter said. All we need now are names and contact methods. I can get that from her later. Right, just one last thing, Chase replied. How she answers half these questions is as important as the answers themselves. Pierce was staring at him, clearly expecting him to either challenge her or accept her ridiculous statement. Okay, have it your way, Chase said to her. I'm curious, have the Neats sent the PPM ships against any of the pirates? Yeah, a few times. Always with a Nietzschean escort, though. Just in case, half the PPM crews are probably from the pirates. In the militia, they get to do the same shit, it's just legal now. They're like state-owned privateers. What about Sandra? The woman shrugged. She's been effective, though I think she's nabbed a lot more out-system pirates than in. You know, now that I think of it, she also seems to catch more neats who are breaking the law than Genevians. Varga will be pleased to hear that, Potter commented. Though it won't really matter anymore, Pierce finished. Because we're here? Chase asked. No, well, yeah, but even before you came, things were changing. More ships are coming in from the Genevia system, replacing those that buggered off a few months back. The Neats must be stamping hulls like they have nothing else to do. Chase spoke with the other five prisoners before getting to Sandra. Becca, the station master, confirmed much of what Pierce had said, though the woman was odious in the extreme. She wasn't Nietzschean, but she clearly wished she were. Potter had garnered the same impression. 
This woman kisses so much Nietzschean ass, it's a wonder her lips aren't brown. She sure doesn't like us either, Chase replied. I think she's an opportunist. If you told her you were going to keep her on, she'd pucker up for you too. Lovely Potter. She'd be perfect for butt snark. Potter, seriously. You need to loosen up, Chase. What I need is a good night's sleep. I was agonizing over coming back to Decker for so long. Whole thing's been rather anticlimactic. He wrapped up his interview with Becca after just half an hour, marveling that this woman who had been the ultimate authority when he lived on Decker was now entirely at his mercy. The Nietzschean garrison commander was a different story entirely. Major Idar was a true believer in the Nietzschean philosophy, but had the tact of a pregnant hippo. That he'd been relegated to keeping what peace he could on Decker wasn't surprising at all. Chase concluded his chat with Idar in short order. He then spoke briefly with each of the other three captains, noting that all were Genevians who had served in the GAF. Two fit the mold that Pierce had described, pirates who were happy to make the upgrade to militia privateer. When Sandra finally settled into the seat across from Chase, he opened with a question certain to get a reaction. What would you think if I put Pierce in charge of Decker Station? The woman's eyes grew wide, and she opened her mouth to respond only to close it and remain mute for half a minute before finally stringing together a sentence. I'm going to skip past how that's within your authority and go right to, what are you on? If she's so bad, tell me. Chase leaned forward, steepling his fingers. What did Captain Mixon do before he joined the PPM? Sandra's eyes narrowed. I see where you're going with this. Sure, he wasn't exactly an honorable guy, raided some merchants out beyond the heliopause on occasion. But he legitimately cares about people, and that makes him useful. Pierce doesn't care about anything other than her coffers. The woman is built out of raw greed. That's my assessment as well, Chase said. She's smooth, a real chameleon. Still, that may be why she'd make a good administrator for Decker. One thing's for sure, I can't put Becca back in charge. That woman would be making a call to her friends further in system before the first shift change. Okay, I know I said we could skip past how this is your job, but how is this your job? How did Becca get made station master of Decker? Chase asked. Sandra shrugged. Same way I became captain of the Melrose, the Neats put her there. And how did they get the authority to do that? The woman across from him sat back in her seat and folded her arms across her chest. They won. But you haven't won. You've just managed a stay of execution. You saw what the Azora shields could withstand. Sure, it was impressive. But you can't take a system with one ship. That's been proven a million times. Chase nodded, noting the passion with which Sandra spoke. You're certainly right about that. Why do you think I'm speaking to the seven of you? We need intel, the sort of information that doesn't get logged in the station data stores. There are people in Parsons who hate the needs, who have been preparing for this. If we can partner with them, then we have a chance to secure this system for Genevia. If not, then we'll have to pass it by for now. For Genevia? What the core does that mean? A grin spread across Chase's face and he leaned forward. Sandra, for someone who hates the needs as much as you do, I'm surprised that you're not leaping at this opportunity. Nietzsche is falling. It's already started. We hold Blue Ridge and Iberia. We've also destroyed the Nietzschean shipyards at Epsilon. Epsilon? Sandra asked. I remember that place. I heard that they were refitting Harriet's there. That they were, Chase nodded. Those ships are all on their way to Thebes now. To attack it? Sandra asked, a note of concern in her voice. No, to complete refit. Then we'll likely get some in the Marauder fleet. Others might go fight in the Pleiades. Sandra's mouth worked silently again. This time it didn't last as long before she blurted, Enough riddles, Captain Chase. What the hell is really going on here? Play her the Albany recording. She'll come around, Potter said. Yeah, I should have led with it. I just wanted to catch her off guard and see how she reacted. She's too guarded, though. Even though she knows we're on the right side, she just won't trust me. Not a terrible trait, given her circumstances. Chase played the whole of the battle in the Albany system once more. This time, he got the sort of reaction he'd hoped for. Sandra's expression of raw skepticism faded. 
replaced by one of wonder and hope. Is this real? She asked in a muted voice when the playback was complete. It is, he replied. Now do you understand? Nietzsche isn't the only major faction in the region anymore. What's more, it turns out that they're a proxy nation for another group called Orion. You've been trying to establish a livable status quo in the wake of the war. I'm here to tell you the war we just went through was a prelude. Fuck, Sandra muttered. Well, I guess this is the silver lining. What is? Chase asked. We got word just yesterday that none of the new ships we were promised are coming. Huh. Huh, what? Well? Chase tapped a finger on his chin. Pierce seemed quite convinced that ships from Geneva were still inbound. The woman across the table from Chase barked a gleeful laugh. Well, I'll be. I think I know who Pierce's mole in the PPM is. Who? Chase asked. And how? Who's not important? I've been carefully routing information through different people for almost a year now, trying to rule out people as informants for Pierce. If she doesn't know, then I've finally found my leak. Tell me more about these ships that aren't showing up. Sandra leaned forward, a mischievous smile on her lips. I was pissed about not getting new ships. You can imagine why. Anyway, I got the news from one of our regular couriers. He's just a hair under three months out of Geneva at this point. But before he left, he saw a ship enter the system, and when it did, things ramped up a lot. What ship was that? Chase asked, wishing the woman would just get it out already. The Belgara. Sandra dropped the name in a hushed voice, her eyes alight as she shared what must have been significant news. And that is? Really? Sandra asked. Stars, you're really out of touch. Chase shrugged. There's a lot of galaxy beyond Nietzsche's borders. What's so special about the Belgara? A nonchalant shrug fell from Sandra's shoulders. Oh, nothing. It's just Emperor Constantine's flagship. The Pinnacle. Stellar date 11.27.8949. Adjusted years. Location. Capeton Orbital Habitat. Capeton. Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Seven weeks ago. The sound of running water slipped into Jeremy's mind, converting his stress-induced dreams of schedules and deadlines to a memory of the last time he was on Shia, hiking a trail next to a burbling stream on the planet's surface. Eventually, the water sound grew louder and in his dream, the forest grew dense, the trail's incline becoming steeper, Moss-covered rocks now peering out from under a thick cover of leaves. Before long, he came to a gap in the trees, a small clearing that allowed him to see beyond the thick canopy to the cliffs that lay ahead. Tumbling over them was a waterfall. The stream that cascaded over the 70-meter cliff wasn't large, but it lay in the lee of prevailing winds, and when the temperature was right, fell with little mist, which was the case this day. Jeremy continued his hike, pushing forward, starting to feel an urgency to reach the falls. Something was wrong. The trail became more precipitous. Moss on the rocks, crowding the narrow path, became slick and wet, offering no purchase. He slipped once and slammed his knee into a sharp root, ripping his pants. Though he was bleeding, Jeremy didn't slow, pushing on faster and faster as the waterfall's muted roar grew louder. The undergrowth grew thicker, obscuring his visibility as he clambered over roots and rocks. He looked around, suddenly realizing that he'd lost the trail altogether. It didn't matter. He could hear the sound of the falls. He just had to keep moving toward it, pressing ever forward, though he knew not why. Jeremy pushed his way through a grouping of ferns and nearly fell when the plants gave way to reveal a boulder-strewn stream bed. He made his way down the rocks, one eye on the waterfall to his right, one on the terrain he was clambering over. Then he rounded a large boulder and saw a sliver of red flowing past in the stream, a crimson highlight against the water's reflection of the clear blue sky. His mind cried out in alarm, and he scrambled around the rock to see the broken body. A scream burst from Jeremy's throat as he fell backward into the stream, struggling to regain his footing while the water tried to pull him under. No, he wailed, clawing at the water, feeling it wrap around his arms and pull him down. Stop! In an instant, the sounds of rushing water disappeared, and a bright light shone all around him. 
alarm off, a robotic voice said, thrusting reality back into the fore. Shit, Jeremy muttered, looking down to see that his arms were tangled in his sheets. He extracted himself to find that his body was slick with sweat. Closing his eyes, he drew slow, shuddering breaths until the pounding in his chest slowed, then swung his legs over the edge of the bed. He lowered his face into his hands, wiping the tears from his cheeks with his palms, lips pursed tightly in an effort to keep further waterworks at bay. I'm so sorry, Anatha, he whispered. I miss you so much. It took ten minutes more for Jeremy to leave the comfort of his bed. His final action before rising was the deletion of the river sounds option from his alarm. He set it instead to a simple klaxon. At least that will wake me up immediately. He walked to the sand and stepped into the shower, letting it wash away the tears and guilt, using the full ten-minute allotment before walking out and looking at himself in the wall's holo projection. His dark ruddy skin held a hint of extra red from the hot water, and he shook his head, asking himself for the thousandth time what a dirt cider like himself was doing on a place like Capeton Orbital. Out in his cabin's main space, he saw that the small servitor had set out a meal of eggs and some sort of substance that was supposed to be bacon. Bacon-esque, he muttered to himself as he sat at the table and stared out through the porthole, sipping the coffee the servitor handed him. The view was the same as it always was these days, chaotic. The Capeton yards were overflowing with ships. New hulls were being assembled at a near frantic pace before being moved to long strings trailing from the surface of the dwarf planet below. Thousands of vessels, all in some stage of completion, all ultimately destined to do to some other people what the Nietzscheans had done to his. Funny how that works, Jeremy thought. They destroyed us and now we make the tools they're going to use to destroy someone else. His drinking buddy said, when they were drunk enough to say things that were better kept on the inside of one's skull, that this was just the way things were now. For all intents and purposes, they were all neats. Just trying to make quota and have some spare credit for a night when they'd try to forget what their lives had been reduced to. At times like that, Jeremy could only think of Shia. If he set his window to dim Torrell's light, he could see his home world to the stars left, a garden world, a place of endless beauty, a place Jeremy would never return to. Ten minutes until your shuttle leaves, the cabin system said aloud, startling Jeremy out of his reverie. Shit, yeah, he muttered before wolfing down the bacon substance, trying not to think of what it really was, before following it with the eggs. Those, at least, he was certain were real. The dwarf planet of Capeton was all but covered in chicken shit. Before the expansion of the shipyards, it had been known as the egg basket of Genevia. Now it was just where dreams went to die. He pulled on his bright yellow form-fitting overalls that also doubled as his EV suit and grabbed his helmet, tucking it under an arm. He swept his gaze over the four by six meter cube that was his home and disabled all the systems, not wanting to face another energy overage charge. Once satisfied that everything was offline, he slid open his door and stepped out into the passageway, nearly colliding with Annie. Shit, sorry, he muttered sheepishly. No worries, Annie said, yawning and rolling her head as she waited for him to close his door. I wasn't watching where I was going, literally. I was seeing if I could sleep and walk to the shuttle on autopilot. Jeremy felt a smile creep onto his lips but then willed it away, not feeling as though he had any right to smile at a beautiful woman's humor. Annie was, quite simply, the bane of his existence. It wasn't her fault, and he never told her how much it pained him to see her, choosing instead to weather his discomfort in silence. The thing that annoyed Jeremy about his reaction to Annie was that she was nothing like Anatha, except for how she was exactly like Anatha. Anatha's hair had been bright red, and Annie's was a green and blue ombre. Anatha had been on the shorter side, while Annie was tall and willowy. Moreover, Anatha had always behaved with a calm decorum, while Annie was all but ribald. Nothing alike. But there was an undercurrent in Annie that reminded Jeremy so much of his wife. They both shared an unbridled excitement for life. They showed it in different ways, but at the core, the two women were so alike. 
Hey, you, Annie said, waving a hand in front of Jeremy's face. You in there? Oh, sorry, yeah, just didn't sleep well. You and me both, she said as they began walking down the corridor. I think it was because I ate the bacon yesterday. Had me in the sand all night. Jeremy's head whipped around to look at Annie. Shit, really? I just had so, his statement was cut off by Annie's laughter. <laughs> I'm kidding, Jer. I know you always have bacon and eggs. I'm just messing with you. I was entertaining last night, that's all. Jeremy pursed his lips and nodded slowly. Oh, okay. Annie always had a bit of extra credit, and it had taken him a while to find out where it came from. It turned out that she operated what was known on Capeton Orbital as a refreshment service. He'd never availed himself of one, but it didn't take a lot of imagination to know what sort of refreshment Annie offered. Strangely, she'd never once suggested that he visit her cabin at night. Stars, am I glad for that. He harbored a suspicion that much of Annie's self-worth was tied up in her ability to satisfy other people. If he declined her, she might take it as a personal affront, and then he'd lose one of the few friends he had. Just bad dreams for me, he said after a moment. He'd told her once about what had happened on Shia, why he'd left the world. He hadn't meant to, but Annie was a good listener, and asked the right sort of questions to draw things out of a person. Half the time, he wondered if she'd been a psychiatrist before the war, though she never volunteered that information, and he never asked. Annie bumped her shoulder against his, giving him a silent nod of solidarity as they turned left at the first intersection, moving toward the maglev at the end of the residential block. Stars, she always seems to know just what a person needs, just like, hey, wait up, you two. So much for a nice, quiet wake-up walk, Annie said with a wink, then looked over her shoulder. Par, seriously, wait up? We're already almost late. Why don't you hustle up for once? Yeah, yeah. Parr replied as he caught up with the pair. I was out drinking with the guys from G6 last night. They were telling me how we're all getting shuffled over to the pinnacle today. Really? Annie's eyes widened. Wow, that'll be, she snorted for emphasis, a real pinnacle. Stars, neats in their starship names. They should just own it and name them Awesome and Awesomer. Might be hard to communicate in combat, Jeremy said. I can see it now. Parr chuckled as he swiped a hand through the air. Awesome, 791 to Awesomer, 1142. Come in, Awesomer, 1142. Not even the neats are that stupid, Jeremy said. You sure? Annie asked. Just yesterday, I heard that they're gonna start mining Londinium's moons, starting with Ilium. Okay, I take that back, Jeremy replied. They're deeply stupid. That moon's one mining detonation from grinding itself to gravel. Maybe that's their plan, Parr suggested. Smash the moon and just scoop shit up. Who do they think they are, the FGT? Annie snickered. Gonna take a lot of agrav to stabilize a mess like that. Just glad we didn't get that duty. Stars, that would be extra stupid, Parr replied, sending drive ticks out to work a mine. Wouldn't be the first time. Jeremy said, his tone ominous. The other two nodded silently, thinking of friends who had been assigned dangerous jobs after they'd said the wrong thing with the wrong ears nearby. With thousands of ships under construction at any time, there was no shortage of dangerous jobs that had low survival rates. Before the surge, much of the construction at the Capeton shipyards had been automated, but when the Emperor demanded that the shipyards triple their output, the demand for ship components put expanded automation lower on the list of priorities, especially with a populace that the Nietzscheans had no problem burning through. The trio arrived at the maglev station just as a car pulled up, and Parr laughed. See? No need to rush. Orbital runs on my schedule. Just keep telling yourself that, Annie said. Orbital barely runs these days. You're just lucky. As though to emphasize her point, the local agraf fluctuated making Jeremy feel like his stomach had just visited his lungs. Stars, when are they going to fix that? If Orbital falls onto Capeton, it's going to make a hell of a mess. You're DCS-L9, Parr said. You tell me how an agrav hiccup could make the station fall. Jeremy resisted the urge to give Parr a scathing look as he responded. 
because every time a grav cuts out like that, things wobble. You wobble enough of the station often enough, and it starts to shift out of its orbit. Remember, a grav actually increases mass as it pushes in the other direction, converting energy to gravitons. Yeah, but not that much mass. Park countered. Sure, and if it wasn't for the fact that half the attitude thrusters on orbital are garbage, it wouldn't be anything to worry about. But this station still has systems that haven't been repaired since the war. Stars, they were going to scrap it until the surge. I guess you make a good point, the other man said as the maglev took off. Conversation died off at that point, then came and went a few times as the maglev whisked the group around to the docks where their cruise shuttle awaited. They were the last to arrive at the departure bay, and the crew chief was waiting outside the shuttle as the trio approached. Well, well, you did decide to show up. How nice. Annie gave the Nietzschean a winning smile. Sorry, Flo. The maglev we were on had to take the long way. Agrav issues. Sure, sure, Flo replied. Just get on the shuttle, fucking Neves. Jeremy led the way onto the craft and found a seat toward the back, catching a few annoyed looks from the rest of the team. Annie sat beside him while Parr found a seat one row back. Okay, people, Flo bellowed as she followed the trail under the shuttle. You might have heard that we're switching over to the pinnacle today. Fuckers behind, and the emperor wants to move in, so we're going to lend a hand with the engines. They're having trouble balancing thrust in the simulated runs, and it's going to be on us to figure out why and get that sucker ready for a full test burn, which is scheduled for tomorrow. There were several grumbles, but Flo's angry gaze swept across the group. I've put up all the specs and issues the current team's having. Study up. That hulls your home till we figure this out. Jeremy accessed the team's shared data store and pulled up the specs on the Pinnacle's engines. The ship was a new design, one that seemed utterly nonsensical to him. He'd heard some of the other drive control engineers refer to the ship as a space catamaran, though that was a vast oversimplification. In some respects, the Pinnacle was seven ships in one. The main hull was a six-kilometer-long cylinder. It was just over a kilometer in diameter, and on its own would have made for a serious amount of mass to move through space. Like most larger ships, it had engines fore and aft, though the rear ones were much larger. Balancing thrust along six clicks of hull was no simple task, but that was just the beginning of the troubles with the pinnacle. In addition to the main hull, the ship had six other cylindrical hulls encircling the central shaft, each of which had its own engines. From what Jeremy had heard, the smaller hulls could fold in close to the central one, though he had no idea why such a thing would be necessary. Sure makes for some complex mechanical systems, he thought, considering the strain the struts and gimbals that held the whole system together must need to withstand. The design requirements for the ship were mind-numbing, stipulating that the ship needed to be able to obtain full thrust in either configuration, though thankfully not while transitioning between the two. He saw the root problem that the drive technicians were having almost right away. When the secondary hulls folded in close, the struts pivoted laterally around the ship, drastically changing the mass allocation across the massive vessel. In theory, this wasn't a huge problem, because each of the secondary hulls were identical, but in reality, that was never the case. Some clever person had decided to make it so that all the hulls could rotate, a measure to ensure that beams would have a hard time tagging a fixed point on the ship for long. In short, there was no consistent balance to the ship. Add in the fact that the thing all but bristled with beams and rails, and it was a miracle that the ship was expected to fly at all. Holy shit, Annie said privately a few seconds later. Can fusion drives even shift vector focused fast enough to deal with how much the ship changes? It would be easier to mount an engine to a nebula than to this thing. Yeah, one sec. Jeremy was already lost in possible solutions to the problems the design proposed. In theory, the engineers who came up with it had solutions to the practical problems the construction teams were facing, and he was looking through those, looking for the twist. He liked to think of these sorts of challenges like he was reading a mystery novel. Engineers who designed starships weren't idiots. They didn't create space vehicles that were inherently flawed. However, they also couldn't consider every variable. A billion components went into building a warship, 
and between the initial design of a ship and its construction, many of those components could change, either because they were replaced with newer variants, a downstream supplier changed, or they were simply rendered obsolete by a newer technology. In the end, the starship that was built had thousands of small alterations that the designers never planned for. Bit by bit, those differences added up until they started to affect major systems in the ship. Teams compensated in a host of ways to ensure their areas of concern performed to spec, but often, those changes affected other systems, cascading shifts in spec and performance throughout the vessel. To Jeremy's mind, constructing a starship was a lot like balancing out an ecosystem. A lot of give and take, push and pull, had to occur before an equilibrium was found. He knew they could find it for the pinnacle, but he had no idea if it could be done in the time frame that Flo had stipulated. Sure would be nice if the rotating components weren't also rotating, he replied after a minute. Every trick for stabilizing a ship like this goes out the window, because the engines that are moving around the central hull are also spinning. That's what I was thinking, Annie replied. Then she gave a sour laugh, glancing over at him. And we just have to figure it out within a day. Jeremy nodded, turning to glance out the window as the shuttle lifted off and flew out of the bay on Capeton Orbital. Yeah, sure. Piece of cake. Change of course. Stellar date 02.06.8950. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Fiori Lance, 15 light years from Parson System. Region, Interstellar Dark Lair, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Any word from Chase yet? Heather asked as Rika walked onto the Fury Lance's bridge. Not yet, Rika replied. But he's only been in system for three days. It'd take that long to get to any noteworthy station and begin his recon. Heather nodded as she rose and walked to the central holo tank, flipping it to a view of the Parson system. Stars, I hate this place. Rika joined her at the holo tank. Yeah, I'm with you there. Well, I don't hate the system per se, just half the stuff that happened to me in it. The captain glanced up at Rika, a look of curiosity writ large on her features. You know, there's a big pull on whether or not you had your unfortunate entry into the Marauders and Parsons. Unfortunate entry? Rika asked with a laugh. That sounds like something that happened. She stopped herself, face turning red as she glanced around the bridge at the lower ratings sitting at their consoles. Well, something bad. Heather rolled her eyes. Stars, Rika. We're mechs, not babies. Either way, was it? Was it what? Was Parsons' system where I learned how to play butt snark? Har har, you know what I mean. Rika sighed, doing her best not to remember the specifics of the event. Yeah, it was in Parsons. I swear nothing good, well, other than meeting Chase, ever happened to me in Parsons. I'm with you, Heather replied. I was on Nera, and we almost got left behind when the fleet bailed on the system. Seriously? Rika asked, then was surprised that she was surprised. Toward the end of the war, the Genevian fleets would run if an ant sneezed. Do ants sneeze? She wondered. Probably not. Yeah, we'd just taken a Nietzschean comm relay, too. Was a sweet prize, filled with equipment we could have used to crack some of their transmission systems. Damn, that would have come in handy. You're telling me. Of course we had to leave it all behind. Neither woman spoke for a moment, and then Heather placed a hand on Rika's shoulder. Don't worry. I'm sure he's fine. Heather, Rika let out a laugh. I'm not worried. You're the one who brought it up, twice. Besides, when we get there, the fleet'll have our back. What with you being in command of it? Sort of in command of it, Heather corrected. Last I checked, you were still in charge around here. Rika shrugged. Yeah, but I relay all my orders through you, like a good CO. Heather snorted. <laughs> sure you do. The two women chatted about the status of the ship and fleet for several more minutes, and then Rika wandered off the bridge, wishing there was some sort of emergency to occupy her mind. The ups and downs of being in a system, fighting for their lives, followed by long, dull FTL transitions was starting to get to her. It felt like the war to take back Genevia would just be a lot of long flights, punctuated by pitched battles and general terror. She decided to go to Engineering Bay 1192, 
which was where Colonel Borden and his ISF Marines had secured their star crusher. The mechs had fallen in love with the thing, and Lieutenant Carson had teamed up with Sparks and Kelsey from Adira's Demons to see if they could reverse engineer the beast and produce more. They'd traced the thing's origins back to the days of the Kunta Triumvirate. It seemed that the Star Crusher was one of that empire's favorite terror-inducing devices, used against the empire's populace as often as against their enemies. Because of their mixed past, they'd been put out of service several hundred years before, shortly after Kunta had completed its democratic transformation into Geneva. Rika was of a mixed mind about the mechanical beast. Seeing a star crusher crawl across the landscape would certainly be terror-inducing, but at the same time, the monstrosity was just a big target that needed to be defended. Even so, she wasn't against trying them out in some war games to see how they'd fare in different scenarios. A voice called out to her as she passed the officer's mess. Colonel Rika, do you have a moment? Oh, your favorite person, Nikki commented in a knowing tone. Rika turned to see Tremon striding toward her and nodded, waiting for him to reach her. I don't actively dislike him. The former Genevian president offered his hand as he approached, and Rika shook it while asking, Do we still really need to have such formal greetings? Tremon looked down at their clasped hands and shook his head. Uh, I suppose not. Force of habit, I guess. I'm just taking a tour of the ship. Rika said, altering her plans to accommodate Tremon. Care to join me? That's very magnanimous of you, Colonel, especially when you've been avoiding me. Ho ho, Nikki crowed, speaking to both humans. Calling it like it is, I like it. Thanks, Nikki, Rika said, trying not to sound overly sour. I've not been avoiding you, per se. No, I suppose not, Tremon said, his voice carrying a mischievous note. Just the things I want to talk about. Your topics are all above my pay grade, Rika replied. I'm just following orders. Oh, Tremon's eyebrows rose. I heard that you were originally going to go to Coulter after Iberia. Rika shrugged. Plans change. The goal is the same. We're headed for the Genevia system, just taking a little bit of a shortcut. And what happens when you get there? Well, we take out the neats and find someone to lead Genevia. She glanced down at the man beside her. Good thing we found someone who has experience at that, Nikki added. Tremon shook his head. We've been over this a dozen times. I'm not presidential material. I never was. I can see that now. And I think that's what makes you good presidential material. Exactly, Rika agreed. You know? Tremon drew the words out as he gave her a sidelong glance. The same could be said for you. Rika pulled up short, turning to stare at him in disbelief. Are you on something? Do you need to see a medic? I'm not presidential material. I barely know how to run this battalion. If it weren't for people like Barn holding it all together, I'd be screwed. I can't even fathom what it's like to run even a single star system, let alone an alliance like Genevia. I'm not presidential material at all. As Rika unloaded on Tremon, Private Genesis strode across a nearby intersection. Upon hearing the word presidential, she whipped her head around and slowed. Keep walking, Private, Rika called out. You didn't hear shit, am I clear? Hear what? Genesis asked. Shut up, Private, get moving. Genesis nodded and started walking again but then stopped partway around the corner, leaning around to regard Rika with a look of utter sincerity. You're right, Rika, you're not presidential material. Uh, thanks. But a queen, private, but I heard nothing, Jenna called out as she disappeared from view. Gah, Rika grunted. That's the last thing I need, rumors circulating of me being the future queen of Genevia. She glanced at Tremon to see that he was regarding her with a curious expression. She directed a scowl his way. You too. Forget you heard that. I think Genesa was right, Nikki, Tremon said. Definitely more of a queen than a president. Now that Genesa's mentioned it, Nikki? Well, I was just going to say that a lot of leaders through the ages were declared as such by their militaries to start. I could see that happening here. 
Rika pursed her lips and sagged against the bulkhead. Fuck, why do I suddenly feel like the lance is too small? I need to dive out an airlock. Uh, can I get out of your head first? Har har, Nikki. Tremon wore a sympathetic expression and reached out to put a hand on Rika's forearm, not even flinching one iota as his fingers clasped her metal skin. When I was first sworn in, I felt like the entire world was trying to crush me, like the weight of the frickin' galaxy had fallen onto my shoulders. Did it go away? Rika asked. Um, a bit, but not much. Thing is, the feeling you get from holding one life in the balance isn't too different from the feeling of holding a dozen, or a million, or a trillion. I guess what I'm saying is that it's not much harder than running your battalion, emotionally speaking, at least. Except Barn does half the work. Tremon nodded vigorously. The same is true for a nation. You just need a lot of Barns. Like, a hundred thousand or so. And then one Barn to rule them all. Nikki intoned. What? Nothing. Rika. The word came directly into Rika's mind, and she instantly knew it was from Tangel. She held up a hand, glancing down at Tremon. It's Tangel. He nodded, suddenly sober as she replied. Hello, Tangel. Chase has new intel. Constantine is at Genevia. Huge shipyards. You need to strike. It took Rika a moment to absorb the words. Chills running down her spine as she let them sink in. What is it? Tremon asked. Your eyes are white as saucers. Constantine is at Genevia. She repeated Tangel's words, watching as Tremon's expression suddenly mirrored her own. Some heavy shit, Nikki added. Rika checked the ship's location and did a quick calculation. We are 80 days from Genevia. Make best speed, assess plan, I'll send Chase, Carson on standby. You sure? There was a pause before Tangel replied. I'm sure. Need me? Call me direct. Card and QC pair burned out. Okay, on it. Rika drew a deep breath briefly wondering what had happened at Cardin to cause her QC pair there to burn out, before realizing the former president was looking at her expectantly. Looks like we're skipping past Parsons. Tannis is going to tell Chase to join us. Where exactly? Tremon asked, eliciting a shrug from Rika. Not sure. We'll have to plan that out, and then I'll let him know. She turned to walk back toward the bridge, but Tremon reached out for her arm as he caught up. Rika. What? Don't forget what we talked about. If we get to Genevia and Constantine is there, and we kill him, Rika interjected. Right, I'm all in on killing that smarmy bastard. But when you do, she nodded, it's going to make for a hell of a power vacuum. A black hole-sized one. Queen Rika, Nikki said privately, laughing softly as the words echoed in Rika's mind, has a bit of a ring to it. Stars, Nikki, if this gets out, I'm going to blame you. What, because Genesis so tight-lipped? Mondo's probably already designing your crown. He'd better not be. Diverting. Stellar date 02.06.8950. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Lands. 15 light years from Parson System. Region, Interstellar Dark Lair. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. The fleet had dropped out of the dark layer 20 minutes before, moving into a close formation to reduce light lag between the ships. Rika stood on the Fury Lance's CIC with Heather on one side and Tremon on another. Gloria and Jakob, Tremon's two erstwhile protectors, stood next to him. The other ship captains and company commanders were arrayed around the remainder of the table. Stars, there are so many of us. Rika thought, not for the first time. Even with Chase and the Asura absent, over 30 people, both holo presences and physical attendees, were crowded around the holo table. Okay, folks, she said, bringing the group to order. Since scuttlebutt is the only thing that can move faster than C, you probably all already know what Captain Chase learned in Parsons. Yeah, Captain Scarcliffe replied with a lowered brow. But can it be trusted? Well, Chase figured it was solid enough to send on to Cardin. They relayed it to Tangel, and she reached out to me directly. 
She's committed Admiral Carson's fleet, so our job is mainly to get in and assess the situation. If what Chase learned about the shipbuilding facilities there is true, then it's a high-value target whether Constantine is present or not. At the mention of the Nietzschean emperor's name, murmurs rippled around the group. He's not any sort of boogeyman, Tremon added. In fact, he's a bit of an annoying little prick. Shouldn't be a problem for Mix. It's usually not the little pricks that are the problem, Silva replied. It's the legions of soldiers that typically surround them that make for trouble. The major's statement elicited a few laughs, and Rika couldn't help but chuckle. She stopped when she saw Tremon redden slightly. Well, good thing taking down legions of Nietzsche is what we were born to do. She spoke the words with a note of finality, and the group quieted down, the laughter replaced with resolute nods. Not a mech in here is afraid of facing down whatever Nietzsche can throw at us. However, we're not going to throw away our lives. Chase confirmed that there is an active resistance in Parsons, and there's probably one in Geneva too. Our first task is going to be finding them, and then finding the Nietzsche weak spots. Ideally, we can hit them like we did in Seppi, from within and without. And what of Parsons? Jakob asked. Are we just going to pass it by? Rika was surprised to hear the president's former bodyguard speak out regarding the system. That's the plan, yes. As soon as we have a destination in Geneva, we'll move on to our new vector. What about the resistance in Parsons? Jakob asked. If Chase has intel like this, chances are that his actions have exposed them. They're going to be expecting the marauders. Instead, you'll just pull out? The thought had occurred to Rika as well. The data burst that had made it to her via the card and relays indicated that Chase had done just what Jakob was suggesting. They're going to have to hold out a bit longer. Rika's tone was resolute. Once Geneva falls, systems like Parsons, ones with a limited Nietzschean presence, will start to fall. They'll just have to wait a few more months. Unless their resistance is exposed and destroyed before that, Scarcliff said, then we'll have to come back. This is going to be about hearts and minds as much as anything else, Tremon added. Rika pursed her lips. She wasn't willing to leave Chase and Parsons while she pressed on to Geneva, and putting off the attack on Geneva for another month wasn't an option either. Her gaze settled on Adira, and she reached out to the colonel privately. Adira, I'm going to send the demons to Parsons. Seriously? Rika, no. You can't dangle the carrot of Geneva in front of us and then yank it back. This is the big score. Jakob and Scarcliff are right. Rika didn't blink and neither did Adira. We have to secure that system, and yours is the largest independent command. Your Tempest has stasis shields now. You can take the system, secure it, and possibly make it to Geneva before the fun starts. Rika, when we get to Prusia, I promise that you and your demons can kick the door in. The SMI-3's gaze didn't waver, then she nodded. I'm holding you to that. Though the exchange had passed rapidly between the two women, the rest of the room had picked up on it. Once Adira nodded, all eyes shifted to Rika. You're real subtle, Silva said with a laugh. Yeah, okay. Rika couldn't help a sheepish smile. Adira's going to Parsons. With any luck, she can take it and meet us at Geneva before the show gets underway. Stars know that if they're building a new armada there, it's going to take more than just one battle to clear the place out. Albany system whack-a-mole all over again, Barn said, pantomiming slamming a fist down on an imaginary mole's head. Rika nodded and then turned to Tremon. What we need is a rally point, somewhere we can scout out and use as a base of operations. I want to know everything that moves in the Genevian system before we go in, especially if we have a chance to take out Constantine. What do you think he's doing there anyway? Asked Leslie. I always got the feeling that his imperial prickishness didn't venture too far from capital if he could help it. I suspect that he's overseeing something in person, Tremon replied, which means he won't be there forever. I just wonder what the fleet is for, Captain Ron mused. They must know that a massed fleet is just a convenient target for the ISF. Rika nodded. Well, there's no way news reached them yet about the defeat at Albany. We're still close to the leading edge. It'll take another 200 days before word gets to Prusia. Whatever Constantine has planned, 
he set it in motion before we fought the Armada in the Albany system. A round of nods came from those assembled, everyone looking pensive as they collectively wondered what the Nietzscheans were planning. The hollow table displayed a view of the Genevia system out to a thousand AU, where over a hundred dwarf planets drifted at the edge of the inner Oort cloud. Hundreds more lay further out, but those were too distant to function as viable rally points. From the information we have on hand, a number of these could work for our initial base of operations, Rika began. But honestly, a lot of it is out of date. I was hoping that you, she glanced at the former president and his team, might have additional insight. Jakob and Gloria shared a long look before the SMI reached out and tapped an empty space, dozens of AU from any other dwarf planet, glancing at Tremon. Fanua, it might still be there. It was when we left, Jakob said, shrugging. No reason to believe the Needs found it. Can we cut the pronoun game? Barn asked. What is it? There was a fallback base on Fanuel, Tremon said. A secondary location that the government could operate from. Mind you, we never got a chance to use it. A fallback in the same system? Adira shook her head. Whose idea was that? Not mine. Tremon held up his hands. A predecessor. I kept it stocked, though. There are a few scenarios where it could have been quite useful. Like this one, Jakob added. What's there? Rika asked. Fenuel was an old mine, Gloria explained. Things saw its heyday about a thousand years ago. It has a highly eccentric orbit, so it got to be too remote for efficient mass extraction and fell out of use. When it came back toward the system, it was a pirate's haven, and the GAF cleared it out. It went through a few clandestine uses before its current designation. Barn opened his mouth to speak, and Gloria held up her hand to forestall him. I'm getting there. The moon has a very, very low albedo, practically invisible unless you know it's there. It's also been scrubbed from all the public charts, so very few people know about it. The thing is honeycombed with caverns. The GAF outfitted it with enough fuel and supplies to last a force your size a century. It has some heavy defenses, too, though should a Nietzschean armada come knocking, it wouldn't last long. Internal bays? Heather asked. Yup, Gloria nodded. Not sure if it can birth the Fury Lands, but everything else could fit inside. Looks like we have a target, Rika said. But let's drop the fleet out of FTL and AU out and scout it out. Never know if someone else has taken up residence. Excellent. Barn rubbed his palms together, glancing around at the disapproving looks. What? We have a plan? We have a base? We're gonna kick some major Nietzschean ass. Rika laughed. Well, that is our mission statement after all. A suggestion. Stellar date, 11.29.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Capeton Orbital Habitat. Capeton. Region, Genevia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Two months ago. They're going to be singing your praises around here for some time, Jer, Annie said as she lifted a glass to toast him. I know I am, Parr added, tapping the bottom of his glass against Annie's. I like sleeping in my own bed. Jeremy joined in the toast. I'm all about sleeping in my own bed, too. Looking forward to it tonight. The Pinnacle may be the best ship the Neats have ever built, but you wouldn't know it by the bunks they have in engineering. Hear, hear, Annie said a little too loud. Oops, I guess I'm just excited that it was only one night. One night that you missed out on serving your clientele, Parr said with a wink. Annie's brows rose. Remember, I bought this round. You're drinking sex money, my friends. Sex money never tasted so good. Parr tilted his glass back and guzzled his entire beer. More sex beer. Nuh-uh. Annie shook her head. This one's on you, remember? You and I are alternating tonight. Jeremy took a pull from his glass, shaking his head at Parr. Take it easy, bud. We're back on the pinnacle tomorrow. I may have figured out how to achieve a balanced max thrust while the ship's stupid secondary hulls are all spread out, but I didn't solve how to do it while they're tucked in as well. 
Chances are that the solution for that problem will F up the one I just came up with. Annie let out a long sigh. Isn't that the way of it? Parr nodded vigorously, and she fixed him with a piercing stare. Oh, he said after a moment. You were serious that I was getting the next round. Yeah, huh? Okay, okay, I'm on it. Parr rose on unsteady feet, took a moment to regain his balance, and then tottered to the bar. Once he was out of earshot, Annie asked Jeremy what he thought of the beer. While he was answering, she asked another question. How robust is the solution you came up with today? Pardon? I mean, I just said, it works while the secondary holds are fully extended. It may work while they're tucked in and nothing's rotating. I didn't have a chance to run all the sims on that scenario. Annie nodded. And what if the overall solution messes up the full extension solution? You know how it is, Jeremy replied. One fix breaks a dozen other things, but I'll figure something out. At this point, I think it's just a matter of tweaking engine efficiency under a variety of situations. Do you think that maybe it could look good but fail? What do you mean? Jeremy asked. You know, pass all tests. But in real world applications, it screws up. He laughed, shaking his head. Stars, Annie, you work on drive controlled systems too. You know as well as I that a thousand things could go wrong in real world applications that don't show up in Sims, especially on a new ship design. There are so many unknowns. Yeah, boy, do I ever. Annie looked up and smiled at Parr, who was returning from the bar with three beers clutched precariously in his hands. Parr, you're a hell of a guy. Two of those for me? Later that night, after Jeremy had woken up for the third time, he found himself mulling over Annie's questions. They were all things she should have already known, did know, in fact. He'd worked with her for nearly a year, and had ample proof that she understood all those principles well enough. Sure, she didn't have an L9 rating, and couldn't work directly in the control systems of the big hulls, but she knew the variable sets they worked with. She'd seen enough real-world failures to know that Sims weren't perfect. It's almost like, like she was suggesting that maybe it could be done on purpose. Jeremy wanted to dismiss the notion out of hand, but he couldn't. More than a few Genevians whispered about sabotaging Nietzschean ships and infrastructure. Few did it, though. The Neats were brutal when it came to punishments for those crimes. But then again, he'd just help the Neats, the people who had all but destroyed Genevia, improve a warship that had only one purpose, to kill more people and bring them under Nietzsche's rule. I wonder, maybe there is a way to fake out the simulation. Defending Decker. Stellar date 02.21.8950. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Asura, Decker Station. Region, Parson System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. They never get tired of this, do they? Ashley said as the Asura scan picked up another salvo of kinetic rounds hurtling through space toward Decker. Don't seem to. Vargo said with a shake of his head. This is what, the 90th? 91st, if you count the initial ranging shots, Ashley replied. I assume I should intercept and block? Vargo nodded. Yep, shields are us at your service. Chase smiled at the pair, wondering how they continued to get along so well when half the time they were alone together on the ship's bridge. They had chemistry. Maybe not one that was linked to any physical attraction, and if it was, he didn't want to know, that somehow enabled them to mesh well. Stars, I miss my mesh, he thought. It had only been 40 days since he'd left Iberia, leading the advance team to Parsons, a job he'd volunteered for, but it was already 40 days too long. The fact that he had another 70 days travel to Genevia after Adira arrived was nearly enough to make him groan in despair. What's wrong, Captain? Vargo asked. Chase shrugged. Nothing. You groaned. Did not. I thought a groan. I didn't actually groan aloud. Captain, no offense, Ashley said. But who, 
thinks a groan? I do. You don't. Vargo shook his head, grinning broadly. Or if you do, this wasn't one of those times. Guys, I... You groaned aloud. Potter confirmed. All long and angst-filled. Of course I did, Chase said with a wink. So what was it for? Ashley asked. Just whiling away the time, Chase equivocated. The main holo lit up, indicating that the ship's point defense systems had taken out most of the inbound salvo. Some of the rail shots made it through and impacted the stasis shields, but no damage was done. Another round bites the dust, Vargo muttered as he glanced at the reactor readings before looking back at Chase. So that's how things are going now. You going to groan for no reason the whole way to Geneva? Chase shook his head. I'm going to trade off with Crunch. We have a whole schedule worked out. Stars, Vargo groaned for emphasis. That's just cruel and unusual. What did I ever do to deserve that? You got turned into a mech, Chase replied. Huh, I'd not considered this before. Ashley turned in her seat to look at the two men on the bridge. But three of us volunteered to be mechs. I wonder what that says about us. That you're all nuts, Crunch said from the entrance. Chase glanced at the involuntary mech and nodded. Yeah, probably. We caught it from you. Caught what? Crunch asked in a leading tone. You're nuts? Is that what you were going for, Crunch? Vargo asked. Because if so, that's just weak. I know. I need new material. I'm going stale. Whole station down there, Chase said probably full of excellent fodder for your brand of humor. Nah, Crunch shook his head. They're all downtrodden. I can't mock downtrodden people. Pity, Ashley said. You know, I'm suddenly feeling all downtrodden. Speaking of which, Chase said as he rose, I should probably go and pay Pierce a visit. I still can't believe you made her station master, Ashley said. The woman is slime. Yeah, but just the right sort of slime, Chase replied. She knows ten times more about Decker and the rest of Parsons than Becca ever did. No one's going to cross her. I don't like it, but she has a stabilizing effect, and that's just the sort of thing people need. Speaking of stability, Ashley said with a smile building on her lips, there's a half dozen ships out there that I recognize all too well. Looks like Adira is finally here. I have to admit, Chase said as he stood on the deck in Hal's Hell a day later, I feel a bit bad that I get to go to Geneva and kick Nietzsche an ass while you're stuck here in Parsons. Adira folded her arms, nodding slowly. You really should. A lot. A whole lot. The demons are taking a mighty big one for the team. Okay, now I feel worse. Are you sure that you can take the system on your own? Really, Captain? Colonel Adira asked. First, you ride off to fame and glory while I stay in Parsons? And then you suggest that my demons can't take one lousy system filled with the neat's leftovers? Chase shook his head, laughing at the SMI-3. Sorry, Adira. How's this? Parsons is lucky to have you, and the low-rent neats they have around here are gonna piss themselves into husks when they see your demons. A wide grin split her lips. That's more like it. Seriously, though, you got a good start here. Decker's well-positioned, and the PPM looks to be an effective force now that they give a shit about what they're doing. A month tops, and we'll have this place cleaned up and taken care of itself. If we're lucky, we might even make it to Geneva in time to watch Rika shoot Constantine in the balls. I really hope that's the case, Chase said, extending his hand. That you get there. Not that Rika goes for a crotch shot. That's just rude. I'll be ashamed of her if she doesn't, Adira said as she clasped his hand. And Chase, remind Rika that the demons are first into Prusia. No excuses. No excuses, Chase nodded. Kick ass, Colonel. You too, Captain, and keep our girl safe. She's the future, you know. He gave a soft laugh and nodded. Someday she'll see that too. Blackjack. Stellar date 02.23.8950. Adjusted years. Location. 
MSS Furyland, en route to the Genevia system. Region, interstellar dark layer, old Genevia, Nietzschean empire. And an ace makes 21, Rika said, dropping the card on the table and reaching out for the credit shits. Stars, this game is easy. How do people bet on it and not just clean out the house? They're not supposed to count cards, Barn said, a sour look on his face. Count cards? Rika asked. How does knowing the number of cards give any advantage? It means count the value of all the cards being played and work out probabilities of what's going to come next, Leslie explained. It's considered bad form. Wait, Rika looked from Barn to Silva to Leslie. Are you saying that you don't do that? Uh, well, no, not really, Silva said. So you do, Rika cried out triumphantly. Yeah, but not all the time, and certainly not in a casual game between friends. Okay, Rika pursed her lips and gave a resolute nod. Once you know how to do it, how do you not do it? Barn shrugged. Beach the fuck out of me. Leslie leaned back in her seat and stretched out her arms, then folded them behind her head. You know, I'm all about relaxation, but I'm a solid five days past stir-crazy. We've been stuck on the ship for 45 days now. She looked at the others. 45 days, and we have another 55 to go. Isn't this driving the rest of you nuts? A bit, Silva admitted. Back in the war, they just racked us and induced a coma for long trips like this. Not that I'm advocating that by any means. Rika shuddered at the thought. I'd rather watch Iron Rust than do that. No thanks. But I'll admit, we're spending way more time in the DL than in real space. The Lance is starting to feel like a prison. Barn glanced at Leslie, then at the door, jerking his head over his shoulder. What? Leslie asked her tail twitching in annoyance. You know, he gave a nonchalant shrug. We could, woo-hoo. Leslie snorted. We already woo-hooed three times today. My woo-hoo's all wooed out. Silva grabbed the cards and shuffled them back together. Sounds like you need an upgrade, kitty girl. I, Leslie began, but Rika held up her hand. Chase isn't here so I don't want to hear about how much action your woos and whos are getting. What we need are some good war games. Barn cocked an eyebrow. We're doing daily drills, assaulting and defending locations in the Genevia system. That's work. We don't need more work. We need fun. We can set up some sort of challenge, Silva said. Not sure what, though. Not a lot of feats that are physically challenging to mechs can be done on a ship, even when the size of the land. I might have something, Nikki offered. Technically, it's a war game, but we could make teams and have some fun with it. Could even get all the ships close and tight beam a high bandwidth network for it. What is it? Leslie asked, her tail rising and curling around her left arm. It's an oldie called Terra Assault. Came out of the colonies after the Soul Space Federation fell apart. You get three teams, Terrans, Jovians, and Discers. The goal is to get the war to turn out differently. See if you can save Terra. There have to be a thousand games like that, Silva said. Sounds like just another war game. Except this one is historically accurate, built from eyewitness accounts and feeds from the actual battles. Also, you won't be mechs. The sim will have you equipped like the people of the time. Okay, that sounds a bit interesting, Rika admitted. A bit of a history lesson, too. Stars, Rika, Silva muttered. Trust you to turn fun into work. Learned from the best, Rika said as she rose. I'm going to go talk with Heather and Carson about getting the ships close enough for a network to support it. I'll work with Piper to get it loaded up, Nikki added. If Rika's participating, wouldn't really be fair if I ran it. Like Piper's ever fair in war games, Barn muttered. Rika winked. That's what makes him such a good game master. A view of the future. Stellar date 04.20.8950. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Land. Approaching Fanuel. Region, Genevia System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire.
Rika shifted in her seat, trying to get comfortable as the pinnace coasted toward Faniel. She knew it wasn't actual soreness. Her body didn't get sore. Her restlessness was just nerves, caused by the knowledge that they were so close to a major strike against Nietzsche. Not an action on the Empire's periphery, such as the victories in Thebes, nor the capture of a small system or destruction of a distant secret shipyard. The Genevia system was the heart. If the system fell, it would spark revolution across old Genevia. No pressure, Rika. The Marauder fleet was half a light year behind the pinnace, breaking in the interstellar darkness before a final FTL transition to Faniel. The maneuver established the maximum time they had before major operations began in the Genevia system. In roughly six months, the Marauder fleet would reach the heliopause sensor arrays, and the Neats would know they were on approach. It was also possible that the Neats had more distant sensor arrays and FTL-capable drones. Just a gamble we have to make. Five minutes till we touch this rock's atmo, such as it is. Mad Dog called back into the main cabin. Place still looks dark as a tomb. Without Tremon's intel, I don't know that we would have ever found this place, Potter added. I've seen brighter sleeping black holes. Really? Allison asked from her seat across the cabin. No, Allison, not really. Oh, I can make the canyon, Rika said as she examined the feeds. Stars that thing's narrow, just a slice in the bottom of that crater. Easy peasy, Mad Dog replied. I land in pitch black canyons at the bottoms of craters on planetoids that are darker than night all the time. I can't tell if that's sarcasm or if you're being cocky, Rika said as she rose from her seat and walked to the cockpit's exit. A bit of both, Mad Dog said from behind her, and a healthy dose of false bravado. Before her sat her max, occupying 20 seats in the pinnace's main cabin. For this mission, she'd selected M Company's first platoon. Sergeant Allison and her 19 mechs were accompanied by the platoon's Lieutenant Fuller, who had declared good-naturedly that he wasn't going to let Allison continue to get all the glory. Okay, people, we know that the maps Jakob and Gloria provided are high-level layouts only. There's a lot more to this place than they show. You could hide a million people in there, and it would take a year to find them. Once we secure the landing area, our first order of business is to locate any data stores or active networks. We'll assess the situation from there. With luck, we either get a warm welcome from hidden resistance fighters, or the place is empty. Either one of those two outcomes will mean that we signal Mad Dog, and he lifts out of the canyon to signal the fleet, which should be in Faniel's near space by then. And if we find any unfriendly occupants? Allison asked. If there are needs, it's easy. Fuller replied with a laugh. Rika shook her head. Unless there's imminent danger, no one engages anyone until we know what we're up against. If the needs are present, then we need to know what they're doing and decide if this is still a viable site for us. Lieutenant Fuller gave a sheepish shrug. Sorry, guess I got a bit carried away. Don't worry. Jenissa reached forward and patted the lieutenant's shoulder. You've spent so much time on a ship, you've probably forgotten which end of your gun goes pew-pew. Funny, private. Fifteen minutes later, the shuttle reached the equatorial canyon and lowered into the inky darkness. To hide their approach, Mad Dog kept the ship on passive scan systems as he navigated the gloomy depths. On most worlds, that wouldn't be a huge risk. But with a surface with an albedo as low as Faniel's, the cliff face has barely reflected any EM, and Rika knew that Mad Dog was flying almost exclusively by light occlusion from above, something that was less and less useful the deeper they went. Okay, he called forward. We're two clicks down. According to Gloria's data, that means we're almost at the pad. I'm going to drop a decimeter a second for the last hundred, so we don't slam into anything, too hard at least. A few muted responses came from the cabin as the mechs prepared for an impact with the narrowing canyon walls. It wasn't as though any of them would be hurt by something like a hundred meter drop, but it wasn't a fall to the pad that worried them. It was the 200 kilometers of crevasse that loomed below the landing surface. Rika pulled up the altimeter on her HUD and watched as the pinnace approached the landing pad's level, then kept going. Don't fret, Mad Dog called back. 
Our zero level may have calibrated differently than Gloria's data. Let's just keep... A dull thud shuddered through the pinnace as the landing gear hit something solid. What did I tell you? Mad Dog called out, relief clearly audible in his voice. Rika glanced into the cockpit. At least flying out will be a lot easier. Thank stars, the pilot muttered. Fuller was already out of his seat, striding to the side hatch, where he pulled up external readings. Okay, folks, we've got a tenth of an atmo out there, and it's nasty stuff, so keep your shields tight. Platform's as dark as the rock around us, so watch your step. Squad one, you're to stay with the shuttle, map out the pad, and ensure there aren't any surprises on it. Squad two, you're with me. We're heading to the southern canyon wall. That's on your right, Dan. Don't worry, LT, Genesa called out. I drew an R on his hand. He's all set this time. Shut up, Genesa, Dan muttered. It was just that one time. What, you can't count now, too? Sergeant Trey said, reaching out to cuff Dan in the head. I remember at least three. That's because we didn't tell you about three other times, Sarge, Amisi called out. Okay, people, that's enough, Buller said, trying to hide the laughter in his voice. Squad three, you're going to the northern wall. Four, you're in reserve until we find an entrance. The Maxall signaled their acknowledgement, and Drika double-checked that the pinnace's weapon systems were active and ready to fire. Cockpit sealed. You're good to open the hatch, Mad Dog announced. Fuller didn't waste any more time, palming the control to bleed off the pinnace's interior atmosphere before opening the hatch. Allison's squad was first to hit the pad, they fanned out, seeking the edges of the platform that stretched from one canyon wall to the other. Once they'd cleared ten meters around the pinnace, squads two and three disembarked. Rico was out a moment later, accompanying third as they angled to the left, seeking out the cliff wall and the entrance they hoped was set into it. What do you have? Lieutenant Gary asked as he leaned over Amon's console. Contacts on pad 719, Amon replied, gesturing at his screen which showed the dim outline of a low-profile pinnace. The craft was barely visible against the ultra-black pad, but the scan teams had a lot of tricks up their sleeves for seeing in the dark, and there was no doubt a ship was on the pad. Why didn't we spot them on approach? Gary asked. Not sure. That thing is just about as dark as the rock, though. They must have drifted down the canyon on passive sensors. We didn't pick them up till their ship triggered the vibration pickup on the pad. Gary whistled. Shit, ballsy to fly in on passive. Half our pilots won't even do that. Yeah, and the other half sweat balls when they do, which is why they don't do it either. Gary signaled for his quick response team to begin suiting up. He didn't know who Faniel's visitors were, but the best way to deal with unwanted guests was to kill them before they spread the news that Genevia's lost planetoid was a reality. It's weird, Amin said after a moment. I don't see anyone leaving the ship but there's a hatch open. The IR is easy to see. It's not hard to stealth out there, Gary replied. No EM to reflect off anything. Sure. Amen nodded while gesturing at the screen. But whoever exited, if anyone did, came out of that nice warm ship. Their armor should be bleeding IR like it has nothing else to do. Okay, fair enough, Gary said. I'm going to join the FRT. You let me know if you see anything, you bet. Amon replied. Gary turned and left the small room that the forward scan operators used and turned down the passage that led to the shaft. The pad was over four kilometers up, and the FRT was assembling two clicks from the top. As he reached the shaft, several lifts were lowering several people each, as the upper reaches of the refuge cleared out. Protocol stated that their best defense was to appear as though no one was home and let intruders penetrate deep into Faniel before springing the trap. After a minute, a lift platform arrived, and Gary stepped into it, pulling the simple gate closed behind himself and moving to the open conveyances center. He tried not to think of the 300-kilometer drop below as the platform began to rise. Even though gravity on the planetoid was only a tenth of the standard, a drop to the bottom of the shaft would still mark the end of a person in a rather spectacular fashion. He turned his thoughts from the drop below to the intruders above. The resistance group he was a part of had been operating out of the Lost World lit for over seven years, and in that time, they'd never been discovered. 
That didn't mean that Gary's team hadn't been put to the test, though. There had been two incidents when smugglers who the resistance worked with had tried to rob Faneuil, but Gary's platoon had made short work of those raiders. Given the fact that the surface arrays hadn't picked up any ships running active scan in Faneuil's near space, something necessary to even find the planetoid in the first place, he had to assume that whoever had landed on Pad 719 already had prior knowledge of the dwarf planet's location. Which doesn't make sense. Oda has seen to it that only a handful of people know where we are, and none of them would betray us, not willingly. The lift shuddered to a stop and he stepped off, walking down the dimly lit corridor to the FRT's ready room. Though his destination was only a dozen meters down the passage, the hull stretched four kilometers more. Even after living in the refuge for years, he'd only laid eyes on a small fraction of the tunnels and caverns that lay below the surface. He reached the ready room and stepped inside to see the 20 members of the fast response team already geared up, checking over one another's armor seals. Everyone frosty? Lieutenant Gary asked as he stripped down to his base layer before stepping into his armor. Cold as space, Sergeant LaSala said. Space isn't cold, Private Ned countered. It is this far out, LaSala retorted. And Ned, tied down that bandolier strap already. Last thing we need is you fucking dropping your nades again. Ned turned to do as the corporal had ordered, muttering about it being just a training sparker. So what's the word? LaSala asked as Gary pulled his breastplate on. There's nothing on the enemy or their loadouts on the combat net yet. What are we facing? Don't know. Gary slid his hands into the armor's gloves and twisted each one to make sure they were locked on and had full motion. Either they are still in their ship or their stealth is ridiculously good. Fuck, one of the soldiers muttered. Ridiculous stealth up there? We'll be blind. Ours is nothing to sneeze at either. Gary replied, get your shit on straight, Jamie. We've trained for this. Run it by the numbers and listen to your team lead. Yeah, right, LT. A minute later, the FRT platoon was geared up and trooping back down the hall to the lift shaft. We're good to go, Amon. Have they breached yet? No, so far as I can tell, they're still securing the pad. None of the entrances have opened yet. Okay, Gary said as his team reached the shaft and began to board the waiting lift cars. Seal it up. A muted klaxon sounded from below, and then doors on every level began to seal. Gary knew that roughly eight kilometers below, the shaft was sealing as well. Once everything was locked down, the air would pump out of the area, leaving only a trace atmosphere, which one would expect in an abandoned facility. He boarded the third lift car, closing the gate and activating his armor's maglock boot, the action giving him a feeling of added safety. Gary. A single word came from Oda, the man in charge of Faneuil who bore only the title leader. We're on our way up now, ETA five minutes. Do we know who it is? No, no visuals on anything other than their ship as yet. Oda didn't reply for a moment, then said, Our secrecy is paramount. The refuge must be protected at all costs. I understand. Though he'd sent an affirmative response, Gary wondered about a shoot-first, ask-questions-later approach. Whoever was on the pad knew enough about Faneuil to land safely. They could be allies. If the Neats knew about the refuge, they'd just smash the dwarf planet with nukes and kinetics, not even bothering to send in ground troops. The fact that the intruders had landed a single ship was a strong indicator that they had no ties to the Neats. Though that doesn't mean they wouldn't sell us out or kill us to take Faneuil for themselves. Gary, Amon called up. I still haven't seen anything, but I'm certain they've disembarked. Someone's at the northern door. Breaching? Working on it. You let me know the second they make it through. Anything at the southern entrance? Gary asked. Not yet, no. He pursed his lips, forcing down the feeling that he was walking into some sort of trap. He trusted his team. They'd trained extensively for a breach event, but never in all that training had they planned for an enemy that was completely invisible. The only thing they did know was that the craft on Pad 719 couldn't fit more than 30 armored soldiers. Granted, that count still heavily outnumbered Gary's team. Stars, I wish Oda would let me train more fighters. He pushed the thought from his mind, 
and reached out to Sergeant Lasala. Everyone has their gel bombs, right? Yeah, team leads checked. Did you grab yours, LT? Lasala's tone was light, almost jovial, and Gary wished he could take a page from the sergeant's book. Yeah, I have three. Well, let's hope your aim is better than last time. Gary didn't respond to the remark as the lifts reached the top level of the shaft and the FRT members disembarked. By the numbers, people, Lasala ordered, just like the drills. We let them get into the gauntlet, and then we tag them and take them out. And we're in, Nikki said as the door finally opened. That was almost hard. Show off, Rika said as Sergeant Bean signaled for Fire Team 3-1 to send out their probes and move in. Nikki only laughed and linked the probe's feeds to the combat net, putting their visuals up on Rika's HUD. Okay, now you're just being annoying, and you're going to make me lazy. Going to? Rika ignored the AI's response and watched the feeds, which revealed a large 20-meter-wide chamber with a single door on the far side. It appeared to be an airlock, and the team moved toward it. I read power, Corporal Heidi said. Ma'am? Sergeant Bean asked Rika. Run it. If anyone's monitoring it, they'll also have picked us up opening the outer door. If not, it would be nice to have a functional airlock. Bean relayed the order as Rika moved into the room, her GNR set to its rail mode, ready for the airlock to be filled with hostiles, though she doubted it would be. If she were the defenders and she were in their shoes, she'd let hostiles penetrate deeper into the facility, ensure that they were cut off from any additional support before dropping the hammer. It would be different if it was a large force attacking. In a scenario like that, she'd make them fight for every meter they took. Of course, if the defenders knew that mechs were on their doorstep, that would be exactly what they should have done. Of course, this assumes that there are defenders and that they have a clue about what they're doing. A second later, the airlock opened, revealing an empty chamber large enough for six mechs. Heidi moved in and examined the interior controls, before glancing back at the rest of the squad. Was hoping it would open both sides if the outer chamber door is closed, but it looks like it won't. Makes sense, Bean said as she stepped into the airlock. Okay, 3-1, let's see what's on the other side. The squad sergeant pulled the airlock door shut, and Rika began counting slowly as she waited. A half minute later, Bean reported in. We're through. Looks like a lot of storage and equipment rooms. Hard to tell if anything's been touched. Main corridor runs 100 meters to an open space. Drones are heading down. How are you looking? Rika called out to Lieutenant Fuller at the south side of the platform, while Bean ordered her second fire team into the airlock. Just got our door open. Thing was welded shut. Not a good sign, Rika replied. Unless not every part of this place was refitted from its mining days to function as a bunker. Could be, Fuller replied. I'm going to send half of squad four to secure your antechamber. Sounds good, Rika replied. Let me know what you find on your side. Wasn't planning to keep it a secret, Colonel. Rika's lips curled into a smile, and she decided to join the third group through the airlock. Once through, she moved down the corridor toward the chamber at the end, while the mechs checked the rooms for anything of interest. When she arrived, she spotted Beam's marker standing just inside the entrance to what appeared to be a maglev station. You see something? She asked the sergeant. Not sure, Bean replied. Drones picked up movement for a moment, but I can't tell if it's just air currents moving down the tunnels or not. Air currents would mean that something's powered up somewhere, Nikki commented. The airlock was just running on bats. Still haven't picked up any active main lines or network activity up here. Too bad, Rika said. A train ride would be nice. Lot of slogging otherwise. After being cooped up on a ship for months, you're going to complain about a little walk? Bean asked with a laugh as 3-1 moved past and began to spread out. Maybe, I mean this place is the size of, well, a planet. Functional transportation would be nice. Three minutes later, the entire squad had formed up in the maglev station, and 3-1 took the lead, heading down the maglev track to the left, with Rika joining in. The walls of the tunnel were unadorned, non-reflective rock, giving the eerie feeling of walking down a track that had nothing around it at all. After a kilometer, the fire team reached another maglev station, and Rika signaled for the rest of the squad to join them, while fire team 3-1 checked the area over. 
It's really hard to tell with everything being so dark, Nikki said after a moment. But I think I see signs of recent use on the track here. Are you sure? Rika asked. Check there, Nikki replied, highlighting a section of track that looked no different from any other to Rika's eyes. She knelt down and reached out toward one of the track's coils, feeling a small passel of nano leave her hand. Just a sec, Nikki said. Rika nodded and rose, watching as the fire team reached the terminal's corners and signaled that other than a few crates of sealed food pouches, the area was clear. Okay, yeah, this coil still had a small charge. Based on this track's configuration, that charge was imparted less than a day ago. Any chance it was an automated system using the maglev? Rika asked. Sure, yeah, anything's possible. So helpful. That panel there? Nikki lit up a section of wall that looked as dark and indistinct as the rest of the terminal. I'm getting EM. Rika quietly pulled herself up from the track's trench and walked to the location Nikki had indicated. Behind her, Bean had arrived with the rest of the squad and was directing one of her fire teams to move down the corridor leading off the station. Once at the wall, Rika was able to see the panel. It was a display system for the track's operation and car arrival schedule. Jackpot, Nikki said. Drop a passel on the port there. I'm going to set up a transmitter and jack in. Good luck, Rika replied as she touched her hand to the location the AI had indicated. I sure hope we're alone. This place will be perfect and I'm not keen to share. There's room enough. With the nano deposited, Rika walked back to the track's trench and leaped across. Just before she reached the far side, she gave a short pulse of her agraph system's landing silently in the fractional atmosphere. Yeah, but I'm thinking that anyone who is hiding so well down here isn't the sort to be keen on company. Fair point. But don't forget that this is a Nietzschean-held system, so unexpected company stands a good chance of being the unwelcome sort. I know. Just a feeling I have. Nikki didn't respond, and Drika sent a tendril of thought along with the AI, watching as she worked through the systems in the track information panel searching for data and control sources, while taking care not to trip any alarms or activate any sleeping systems. With part of her mind on that task, Rika watched Squad 3's teams as they moved down the warren of passages that led away from the maglev terminal. So far, all they'd found were storerooms and several workspaces. None appeared to have seen recent use, though Rika did wonder about some of the supplies. It appeared as though several crates had Iberian labels on them, but the transit stamps were using Nietzschean dates. If that was the case, then those crates had come to Faneuil after the war. Another part of her mind stretched along the relays the squad had dropped, reaching back to the pinnace. She checked over the other teams and then pulled feeds from Lieutenant Fuller and Squad 2. They were moving through a warren of larger warehouse spaces that were filled with larger equipment. So far, they'd not found anything to indicate anyone had been in that area for some time. Nikki, what about that route? Rika asked, having noticed that the AI wasn't sending a query on an open port in the maglev display panel's network interface. Yeah, I've been debating that with myself. There's traffic on that interface. Not much, just automated status updates. I think the route will lead to a central control system for the maglevs. Seems like the way to go. Sure, Nikki replied. It's also odd that it's an open port, that one is usually used for privileged access in Genevian systems. It shouldn't be wide open like that. It could have been left open from a failed maintenance run, or maybe someone who didn't know what it was doing messed with it. You only live once, Nikki. That's terrible advice. Do you think I got this old by being reckless? Rika snorted, walking out of the terminal and following the Route 3 one had taken. I seem to recall an AI that sabotaged her own ship in an attempt to get my team to smuggle her off it. Desperate times, Nikki replied. That's not the sort of situation we're in right now. Are you going to try the port or not? The AI sent a protracted sigh and said, Yeah, sending a packet. Good on you. Real initiative. Great moxie. Shut up, Rika. A smile crept onto Rika's lips as she came to an intersection. 3-1 had gone to the right, but she had an itch between her shoulder blades that told her to go left. Turning down the passage, Rika followed it for a minute until it curved to the right. 
she rounded the bend and found herself standing at the top of a deep shaft. It was over 30 meters across, with several lift platforms sitting at the top. None of them were enclosed, only ringed by skimpy railings. Rika sent out a passel of drones, noting that the shaft went down for several kilometers. Sure would hate to fall out of one of those, she commented. I think I've found a way into the maglev central control, Nikki replied. Oh, and yeah, don't fall. Thanks. Solid advice. Rika looked around, noting that a half dozen passages connected to the lift shaft. She crept around the perimeter, peering down each corridor, not spotting anyone. She'd made it halfway around when her armor sensors picked up an EM flare at the entrance to one of the passages. That's something you activated? She asked Nikki. No, that was on a common GAF Special Forces comm frequency. Starting to feel like that recent use of the maglev track wasn't just an automated maintenance system. Rika crept toward the location from where the EM burst had come, directing all of her passive pickups at that vacant patch of air in an attempt to determine if the signal had come from an enemy in stealth or was just a signal echo. She was almost there when markers on her HUD noted that 3-1 had entered the shaft chamber from another passage. They began to sweep around the top of the shaft toward her, while Rika continued to move in the direction of the EM burst. Once she was within a few meters, she released a nano cloud and then held her position. A second later, Nikki gave a short laugh. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. There's someone here. Armored. I think the armor is coated in something made from this world's black rock. Sort of a combo of stealth and a bunch of nothing. Good one still, but if he was moving, it would be easy to spot. Sounds like there's a good chance they haven't seen us yet. Probably not, Nikki said. I mean, hard to say unless I hack this guy's armor. But that's a bit of a risk. No idea how many of them there are, and I don't want to alert them. Agreed, Rika replied, then sent a burst to Bean with the update. I'll come in with two teams. We'll hold four in reserve the sergeant said, and Rika updated Fuller with their status. Maybe I should move fourth squad inside the airlock, the lieutenant suggested. Do it, Rika replied. She relaxed her stance, waiting for the rest of the squad to get into position before initiating the breach on the nearby enemy. Found another, Nikki said, noting a second stealthed individual on the combat net. Fire Team 4 was nearly in position, when one of the mechs stepped on a section of deck plate that slipped out of place, groaning loudly as it bent. A second later, Rika spotted a dozen grenades flying toward the fire team's position. Muzzle flashes lit up the area, rounds streaking out from the mechs, destroying the incoming explosives in seconds. But one grenade made it through and detonated, spraying a glowing gel across the four mechs and the fire team. Next to Rika, the crouched figure rose, only to suddenly go still as overhead lights came on and a voice thundered all around. Freeze, show yourselves. Nice touch, Nikki, Rika said. I try. All I have is lights, though. I just tap the fire team's speakers for the audio. Can you disable our friend's stealth? Rika asked as she extended her GNR. Sure. A second later, the stealthed figure next to Rika materialized and then she disabled her own stealth to reveal her weapon pointed at the man's head. The other defenders were still stealthed, though Rika had a good idea of where they were from the grenades thrown. Let's try to do this without killing anyone, she advised the squad before calling out aloud. Okay, whoever you people are, show yourselves and stand down. We know you can't see us, but we can see you. You're outnumbered and surrounded. Liar, Nikki laughed. Well, we might outnumber them. A muffled sound came from the armor next to Rika, and she accessed the figure's armor, turning on his speakers. Who the hell do you think you are? The man's voice came out in an angry growl. And what are you doing here on Fanel? We're here to kill Nietzscheans. I'm Colonel Rika, and these are the Marauders. It had taken a few tense minutes but Rika had managed to convince Lieutenant Gary to have his team stand down and turn over their weapons to the mechs. With the discovery of the defenders, Fuller had ended his sweep of the warehouses and was on his way with all of the teams, barring Allison's, who split up to secure the pad and the two entrances into the underground facility. 
Nikki had accessed the environmental controls, and once the shaft was aired back up, Rika released the seals on Lieutenant Gary's armor, ordering him to step out. He complied, along with the rest of his platoon, who were removing their armor under the watchful eyes of the mechs towering over them. Marauders, eh? He asked once he stood before and only his base layer, eyes sparking angrily below dark brows. You wouldn't happen to be Mills marauders, would you? We are, Rika replied. Or rather, we were. General Mill was KIA half a year back. Gary shook his head. Damn, a damn shame. Then he folded his arms across his chest. You have me at quite the disadvantage, Colonel Rika. Care to show your face? Are there automated defense systems in here? She asked Nikki. Yes, but they were all completely powered down. I have control of everything at the top of the shaft. You're good. Rika reached up and unlatched her helmet, pulling it free, smiling at the man before. I'm really sorry that we met under these circumstances, but am I safe in assuming that you're with some sort of Genevian resistance? Maybe, Gary replied. We're certainly not mercs, that's for sure. Neither are we. Rika replied with a wink as she glanced at her mechs, more of whom were moving into the shaft chamber and spreading down the adjacent passages. We're well-funded freedom fighters. Gary snorted. That's a new one. Funny. We're regular comedians, Bean said as she approached. Colonel, our friends here are all secure. Should we restrain them? No, Rika replied. Put them on the lift platforms. I don't think anyone will try any funny business while on those things. Gary's lips twisted into a wry smile. Stars, you're right about that. If you knew how many times those things stalled out, Lois Bitter won the contract on that crap, that's for sure. They'll do doubly well then, Rika said, watching as the 20 men and women from Gary's team were marched onto the platforms. Some looked angry, but most seemed in awe, muttering amongst themselves about never having seen so many mechs at once before. Gary echoed their sentiment. You really all mechs? Whole battalion, Rika said. Well, there are a few Mark Zeros in our fleet, but a lot of them have been mechanized as well. Mark Zeros? Gary asked with a laugh. That's a new one. I just made it up, Rika replied. So is it just you here, or are there more of your friends below? Just us, Gary replied. We've been holed up here for a while. So if I send a team down, they won't find anyone else? Well, eventually they'll find Amon in our little CIC a ways down, but otherwise that's it. Dude's lying so badly, Nikki commented. Yeah, kind of my take too. I applaud your attempt to protect your people, but there's a whole fleet of mechs coming. Eventually, we'll scour every nook and cranny of this place. Hiding really isn't an option. Gary shook his head. Okay. Do you really expect me to believe there are enough mechs left over from the war to form a whole battalion? I'm not too concerned about what you do or do not believe. The proof will be before your eyes in a few days. The man fixed her with a cool stare for a moment and folded his arms. Okay, Colonel Rika, let's just say I believe that there's a whole mech fleet out there. What are you really doing here? Rika couldn't help the smile that formed on her lips. We're here to kill Emperor Constantine, of course. The Resistance Stellar Date 04.21.8950 Adjusted Years Location The Refuge Vanyal Region Genevia System Old Genevia Nietzschean Empire A full day had passed since Rika's marauders had taken control of the upper levels around Pad 719, Oda, who Gary referred to as the leader of the Genevian system's resistance, hadn't yet acquiesced to Rika coming down the shaft to see the rest of the refuge, but he had finally agreed to come up. During that day, Lieutenant Gary's platoon had warmed up to the mechs, even joining them in a few simulated games of Terra Assault. A key part of the resistance members' acceptance of the mechs had been the news they brought, that two systems had already been liberated from the Nietzscheans, with the added knowledge that the marauders had allies capable of crushing armadas such as the Nietzschean fleet in the Albany system, the resistance soldiers were in high spirits. Despite his troops' acceptance of the mechs, Lieutenant Gary was still behaving coolly, and Rika wasn't certain if that was just his normal attitude, or if the man was worried about what hosting a battalion of mechs on Faniel would do to upset the status quo. 
despite the uncertainty, Rika had dispatched Mad Dog to drop the beacon for the fleet. She'd also sent an update to Admiral Tangel with their current location's coordinates to be passed on to Chase and Admiral Carson. Be careful, Tangel had sent in reply. Rika laughed when the response came through. Somehow she felt like the motherly version of Tangel had come out for a moment. It was nice. I will. Now Rika stood at the rim of the shaft, watching via remote drones as the mock bottom 10 kilometers below cycled open, revealing the full extent of the drop at her feet. Deep, she commented. Tell me about it, Gary replied. The shaft is the bane of my existence. I kind of hate it. Neither spoke further as a lift platform came into view, rising out of the gloom. Five occupants stood on its surface. One was Oda, another was a woman wearing a GAF uniform with three stars on her lapels. The other three wore armor similar to that of Gary and his platoons, before the marauders relieved them of it. We're here, Heather spoke into Rika's mind a moment later. Where's the party at? It's still warming up down here. I'd like you to keep the lance upstairs, but dark. Nikki will pass you the docking locations for the other ships. She's mapped it all out. Allison and her team have secured the area. But I'd prefer if you dropped another tune first to perform one more sweep. I shall do as you prefer, Rika, Heather replied with a laugh. And Tremon? Send him down with the rest of M's second platoon. You got it, Colonel. Rika felt a sense of relief fill her at the knowledge that her marauders were in orbit above. She had been dreading a protracted conversation with the rebels, where she'd have to work to prove to them that she was who she said she was. It would also be nice to remove the still present hint of doubt from Gary's brow. Five minutes later, the lift reached the top of the shaft, and Rika stepped forward, extending her left hand. Leader Oda, I'm Colonel Rika. It's very nice to meet you. The man stepped forward, his eyes betraying nothing of what was going on behind them. He brushed his long silver hair over his shoulders and walked off the lift, taking her hand in his. I don't know that it is nice to meet you, Colonel Rika. It certainly is interesting. Wow, so not a diplomat, Nikki commented. Second platoon's already on their way down. I'm managing the surface beacons. They can drop a lot faster than we did. Excellent, good to have folks I can trust. Rika didn't quite know why she said that. It might have been because she really didn't get the feeling that she could trust Oda and his retinue. Nikki laughed. Oh, I'm folks now. Too late to take it back? Oda was waiting for a response to his barbed comment, and she took a breath before giving it. Given what they say about living in interesting times, I'm going to do my best to take that as a compliment. Oda's level gaze stayed fixed on her for a moment, and then he stepped aside and gestured to the woman accompanying him. Admiral Larice, the woman said, not taking her eyes off Rika's gun arm as they shook hands. Quite the welcome you have here. Rika glanced down at the barrel of her GNR and shrugged. It's my arm. It tends to go where I go. You don't take it off? Admiral Larice cocked an eyebrow. The woman's line of questioning tweaked Rika the wrong way and a host of rather unpleasant responses cascaded through her mind. In the end, she simply shook her head and said, No. Oda, Admiral, Lieutenant Gary said, hastily stepping forward. We've prepared a room nearby. Oda nodded, and Gary led the silent group around the perimeter of the shaft and down a hall, until they reached a small mess hall. A pair of tables had been pushed together, and there were glasses of water and some crackers sitting in the center, would you like our guards to wait outside? Oda asked as they entered the room. Whichever you prefer, Rika said. If you're more comfortable with them in here, that's fine with me. It turned out that Oda, or perhaps Larice, very much desired to have the three soldiers nearby. They immediately moved to take up positions in the room's corners. One of them began to walk behind Rika, but she turned in her seat and stared at the woman. I don't think so. Stand anywhere you want, but not behind me. Unless you want me to fill this room with mechs and their gun arms. The woman hesitated, then muttered an apology and moved to stand on the far side of the room. I have to admit, Rika said as she turned to look from Oda to Larice, I've gotten warmer welcomes from enemies in the past. 
I don't think we're enemies, are we? Oda glanced at Larisse before responding, Perhaps not enemies, but from our standpoint, you are someone who could put all our work at risk. That would be unfortunate, Rika replied, doing her best to sound compassionate. I assume you're referring to a plan to kill Constantine? No. Larisse shook her head. We're worried you're going to expose us. Our in-system operations are centered around finding ways to sabotage ships, not make a suicide attempt against the Emperor. I know of a way to sabotage ships if she's still looking, Nikki said privately. They're called bombs. Don't make me laugh, Rika admonished her AI. I don't think these people have a sense of humor. It must have atrophied in the dark down here. Okay, Rika said, nodding as she drew out the word. Would you like instead to aid us in killing Constantine? We came here before moving in system, because our intel indicated that Fanel would be an excellent place to mass our forces and gather intel. I must admit, I did actually hope to find resistance members out here. And here you are. Your assistance will be invaluable. Colonel Rika, Admiral Larice said, I think you misunderstand how things work here. You'll undertake no unilateral operations in Geneva. We've worked long toward our goals. I, Rika held up her hand and was surprised when the woman stopped so readily. I applaud how long you've worked toward your goals and the fact that you've managed to maintain a covert presence in the system, Rika told her. But let's be frank, your goals are to scratch the neats to inflict tiny wounds and a vain hope to slow them down. I'm here to cut the head off the empire. What do you think that will achieve? Oda asked in a measured, too calm voice. Someone else will rise to take Constantine's place, and the Neats will exact retribution, likely wiping out everyone in the system. Rika shook her head in disbelief. Do you really have no endgame in mind? Are you so focused on taking a pawn? You've missed that the enemy's queen is free for the taking? Oh, glad to see our chess matches have been useful. Thanks, Nikki. How long till Tremon gets here? Ten minutes tops. They're in the canyon now. And if our king is exposed? Oda asked. What king? Rika asked. If there is a king, it's the Genevian people's spirit, something that will be greatly bolstered by killing Constantine. And then, while the Neats are still reeling from the destruction of their fleets here at Genevia, I'm going to take what we can salvage and fly it to Prusia, where we'll raise Valhalla. In five years, the Nietzschean Empire will be nothing but a bad memory. Oda shook his head in disbelief, while Larisse scoffed. Bold words, the Admiral said. Rika frowned at the two resistance leaders. Did neither of you review the data we sent down? Did you watch the battle in the Albany system? Did you see how we defeated the remains of the Armada at Sepi? Took Blue Ridge? Destroyed the shipyards at Epsilon? Liberated Iberia? I don't know if you remember the war we had with the Neats a few years back, but we didn't have a string of victories like that the entire time I was in the GAF. You've been sitting here in your dark hole, waiting for an opportunity to strike at the enemy, or I assume you have. I, I, Rika sputtered at a loss for words, flabbergasted that she was having to convince the resistance to resist. Seriously, what's your problem here? Larissa looked Rika up and down and shrugged. You're a mech. Everyone knows that mechs are criminal scum, only controlled by their compliance chips which the Neats foolishly removed. Now they're reaping the rewards of that mistake. Rika's mouth hung open, and it took conscious effort to close it once more. Stars, she muttered, rising from the table and walking to the counter set along one of the walls. She placed a hand on the smooth surface, trying to think of what to say to the fools behind her that could convince them to help. See, she heard Larry say, I told you, Leader Oda, mechs are unstable. If they were, it would be because of the torture your people put them through. Nikki's enraged voice thundered across the link, addressing everyone present. Rika was still in her teens when your people hacked her up and sent what was left off to war. Your barbarism was only barely surpassed by the Nietzscheans. 
that the mechs under Rika's command are dedicated to saving Genevia, to forgiving Genevia, is only because she believes the people themselves are good. Trust me, if Genevia only consisted of asshats like you, she'd let the place burn. Stars, she'd light it up herself, and I'd cheer her on. Oda's eyes had widened at the tirade that spilled from Nikki, though Larissa's lips pressed together as her brow furrowed. You have an AI, Oda said, clearly surprised. It's not a proper pairing, Larissa scoffed, just tucked in her gut somewhere. Her model has that capability. No, Rika tapped a finger against her head. She's up here, and she's right. You're contemptible. Let's go, Larry said, rising from her chair. I've heard enough of this lunatic's nonsense. I'm not sure a madwoman is capable of recognizing lunacy, a voice said from the entrance. Rika felt a wave of relief roll over her to see Tremon walk into the room, Jakob and Gloria following after. Stars, Tremon, I thought you were still five minutes out. I ran, the former president said. When I heard that Larisse was here, I knew you'd need backup. You could have told me that you were ahead of schedule. Well, I also wanted to make a surprise entry. Can you blame me? A bit, yeah. Oda and Larisse had both risen from their chairs, while Lieutenant Gary sat slack-jawed in his seat. President Calvin. Oda spoke first. Rika didn't tell us she was working for you. Rika saw Tremond flinch at the use of his old name, the name of the man he was ashamed to have been. You have it backwards, he replied. I work for Rika as an advisor. And please, call me Tremon. It doesn't do much good for the name Calvin to be bandied about. Tremon? Larisse asked. Are you ashamed of who you once were? He reddened, but didn't flinch from the verbal assault. Are you not, Admiral Loris? How many children like Rika did your program send into the factories? How many of them suffered just as much at the hands of our people as the Nietzscheans? I did nothing wrong, Loris replied. I was trying to save Genevia. No, Tremon shook his head. We cut out our nation's heart, and then were surprised when it died. People like you and I are not Genevia's future. That future lies with people like Rika. Really? Rika said, holding up her hands. I'm not here to be a future. I'm just here to kick Nietzsche an ass, something that everyone on Fanel seems reluctant to do. Rika, Tremon said, his tone serious. You should arrest Loris. She's not fit to serve the Genevian people. Me? Loris bellowed. You should be on trial, you coward. Tremon nodded. I expect I will be at some point. But for now, the mechs of Rika's marauders have told me they forgive me for my part in what happened to them. But you have your own atrocities to answer for. You know what I'm referring to. Do you want me to bring it up now? I would like to hear it, Oda said. Many of us did things we are not proud of during the war. I imagine that the Admiral did something that can be forgiven as you were President Calvin. Then we can move past it to more productive conversations. Please, the former president held up a hand. I'm just trimming now. Oda nodded, then turned to face Larice, who had taken a step back, her expression even more guarded. If you don't tell them, I will, Tremon warned. It had to be done, Larice hissed. If it had fallen into the hands of the Neats, we would have dealt with it. But you thought that it was worth the risk. Tremon turned toward Rika. There were so many displaced children during the late years of the war that Larisse, unbeknownst to me at the time, began rounding them up. She was working on a program to recreate the ancient weapon-borne program from Terra. Of course, she didn't meet with any success. It was all at a secret base in the Marcia system. When the Neats breached the heliopause, his voice cracked, and he paused, drawing a shuddering breath. When the Neats came, she fired on her own research facility to keep them from finding her research. Research that didn't even work. At least a million children died. She didn't even try to save a single one.
The room fell silent at Tremon's words. All but for the sound of Larissa's ragged breathing as all eyes turned to her. It's a lie, she hissed. A lie so he can take control. Oda, don't you see that? The resistance's leader turned away from Admiral Larisse, staring unblinkingly at the table. Someone get her away before. Sergeant Bean, Rika said through clenched teeth. Take Admiral Larisse into custody for unspeakable war crimes against her own people. Have her brought to the Fury Lands. We'll deal with her later. Yes, ma'am, the mech said as she materialized in the corner of the room where Rika had previously told the resistance guard not to stand. A knowing grimace crossed Gary's lips, and Oda shook his head in amazement at the effectiveness of the mech's stealth. Even so, he didn't speak until Larisse was gone. Any more of your mechs in here with us? The leader asked. Yes, Rika replied, her tone indicating that they would stay and that they would remain stealthed. Stars. Oda said, and to think of that snake has had my ear this past year. She wasn't always here? Rika asked. No, Gary shook his head. Larisse was a relatively recent addition. Oda gave Tremon a sidelong look as the former president sat in Larisse's vacated seat. I seem to have drastically misjudged you, Rika. I'm going to take a leap of faith and choose to believe everything you say. Rika smiled at the man. Surprised at how different he behaved without Larisse at his side. Was he under her control somehow? She asked Nikki. There was no unusual link activity between them. The AI replied. If he was under her influence, it wasn't technological in nature. Weird. Maybe he... Stars beats me. People are too complex. So, Lieutenant Gary said, locking eyes with Oda. Can we be straight with Rika now? Straight? Rika asked. Have we not been straight? Well, Oda said, a note of apology in his voice. We've been doing more than looking for a way to sabotage the ships the needs are building. We've been actively working on a plan. If you're really going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that fleet they're building on Capeton, then I think what we've done is going to help a lot. An idea. Stellar date 04.27.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Capeton Orbital Habitat, Capeton. Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Jeremy rolled out of bed the instant his alarm blasted him out of his dreams, glad that he didn't remember whatever visions he'd been subjected to the night before, he took a moment to wonder if his apparent lack of dreams, or at least their memory, was due to the alarm or the extra work he'd been undertaking with Annie. During the day, they continued to work their jobs like normal, installing drive control systems and putting engines through their paces. However, at night, they worked to ensure those drive control systems would fail when the right time came. It had taken them some time to get to this point. Annie had brought the idea up in two more Sub Rosa conversations before he'd come to believe that she really did wish to sabotage the Nietzschean ships. During that time, the shipyards had begun construction of another Pinnacle-class ship, and he realized the Neats were just going to keep making these things as long as there were enemies to crush and willing hands to assemble them. Of course, planning to sabotage hundreds of Nietzschean warships, and actually doing it, were two very different things, and they were still working on the best method to achieve their goals. Annie had been interested in introducing failures that would trigger at random at some point in the future, but Jeremy had argued against that notion. If they configured the drive systems to ignore an issue that would eventually lead to catastrophic failure, it would only work once, maybe twice, before the Neats identified the cause and it was fixed across all ships. What they needed was something that was instantly catastrophic and would leave no evidence of what the failure had been. From there, the question then had come down to when. Having the ships fail during test runs at Genevia would only ensure that he and Annie would get caught. The drive systems needed to fail after the ships were gone from Genevia. Ideally, the ships all in proximity to one another would have drive failures at the same time, 
and that time would preferably not be when they were near civilian installations. Those were their must-have requirements. Not in Geneva, catastrophic, simultaneous, and not fixable en masse if discovered. The other issue was that he and his team only ever worked on a small fraction of the ships being built at Geneva. Even if they worked out something that met all their criteria, it would barely make an impact. Jeremy meandered into the sand and activated his shower, continuing to mull over the problem they faced. While working with Annie the night before, they'd ruled out yet another option, because the sabotage would be automatically fixed when routine updates were run after a ship's first shakedown mission. Despite his dream to destroy all the enemy vessels or even a large percentage of them, he was starting to fear that they'd have no choice but to fall back after only sabotaging the ships he and Annie worked on. Once out of the shower, he stared in the mirror for a few long minutes, considering what he really needed to do. Nearly all of the Nietzschean ships used the same NSAI model for their drive control systems. There were a few variants in the specs, and the larger ships, such as the Pinnacles, had several of the DCS AIs, but by and large, they all used the same core logic and systems. The best option was to alter that NSAI's parameters, or its source data, in an undetectable way that would achieve his goals. He sat down at his table and took a bite of bacon, which tasted worse than usual, and chased it with a gulp of coffee. Barely seeing what was in front of him, Jeremy reopened the NSAI source code bases and looked at various subsystems within. There were dozens of ways he could alter the NSAI's code, but he needed something that would pass tests and not be detected. And so far, he'd not found a single method that would work. Damn it, he muttered, beginning to fear there really was no way to pull off the mass sabotage he and Annie dreamt of. Which makes sense. These systems are built specifically to prevent this sort of thing. Ten minutes until your shuttle leaves, his servitor's robotic voice said, bringing Jeremy to his feet. He looked down and realized that not only was he still naked, he'd not used the auto dryer and his hair was still wet. Rushing into the sand, he palmed the dryer control, and his head felt a chill as the warm air removed the moisture from his scalp, while the rest of his already dry body was warmed by the same air. For a second, he marveled at how small differences in the same system could completely change perception of the same event. The air stopped and he stared wide-eyed at his reflection in the mirror. Stars, I think I've got it. All through the workday, he was bursting at the seams to tell Annie his plan, but they'd agreed not to discuss their scheme while on the job, either audibly or via the link, lest something was overheard or intercepted. He knew that she could tell that he had an idea, though because she suggested he visit her later in the evening for an extra relaxation session. Annie's side gig was a useful cover for them spending a lot of time together. But the service she offered also made things difficult, because she very frequently had legitimate clients that she couldn't just brush off without arousing suspicion. Again with Annie? Parr commented, after Annie had told Jeremy when to come over that evening. He chuckled and nudged Jeremy in the shoulder, smiling hungrily as he watched Annie walk away. Jeremy shrugged nonchalantly, doing his best to ignore the guilt he felt about betraying Anatha, which happened whenever he pretended he was availing himself of Annie's services. Well, someone's gotta do it. Parr stared at Annie's ass for a moment, a wistful look on his face. Stars, I wish I had enough extra credit to do it once in a while. It looks like it needs a lot of doing. Jeremy didn't know exactly what to say. He'd never so much as touched Annie, but that didn't mean he didn't want to. Anatha's memory just wouldn't let him. Maybe if you didn't drink and gamble away every credit you made, you'd have some spare change for some relaxation time, Jeremy said, shifting the topic. Give up gambling? Parr placed a hand on his chest, and gave Jeremy a shocked look. Trust me, no woman's ass is worth that. I mean, that's what sims are for anyway. I can have any woman I want in there. Trust me, I have half the women on our crew simmed up. 
right, sure, Jeremy said as they walked down a half-finished corridor in a carrier. Because that's healthy. You know it creates issues upstairs to conflate real and imaginary people. He tapped a finger against the side of his head for emphasis. You're gonna get flagged at your next psyche, Val. Psh, Parr waved a hand dismissively. I've been doing this for years. Hasn't ever caused me a problem. Jeremy only laughed and slapped Parr on the shoulder, glad to have turned the conversation away from the time he spent with Annie. Though he was surprised at how defensive he felt about her and how much Parr's remarks got under his skin, it's because she's a friend and he's a bore, nothing more, he assured himself. Jeremy spent most of the evening pacing across the small room he called home, waiting until the hour Annie had said she'd be free. When it was five minutes until the allotted time, he decided that he could wait no longer and made his way down the corridor to her room. Annie, are you done? This is important. I need to show it to you. You're early, Jer. Annie's tone was laced with annoyance and something else that he couldn't pin down. I'm not done cleaning up yet. Stars, Annie. I've seen your place when it was half covered in food, bottles, and rainbow glitter. Let me in. I'll help you tidy things. Almost done anyway. Just a minute, getting dressed. He could tell that was as far as she was going to budge and leaned against the bulkhead, waving idly at a pair of women who walked by, both giving him knowing looks. If only they knew what we were really up to in there, he thought with a laugh. Jeremy had lost himself in the coat he was working on by the time Annie opened the door. He didn't even notice her until she whispered in his ear. And here you were in such a rush, lover boy. The unexpected statement caused Jeremy to jump, and he whipped his head around to see Annie's eyes mere centimeters from his own. She smiled and glanced to the right where Parr and two other members of the crew were walking by. Booyah, Jer! Parr called out over his shoulder, throwing a fist in the air, and Jeremy felt his face redden. Luckily, Annie wrapped a hand around his arm and pulled him into her room before he could say anything stupid. You are really out of it there, she said as the door closed, her demeanor instantly losing the sensual intimacy it had oozed a moment earlier. Uh, yeah, Jeremy managed to stammer out, just deep in coat. Annie gestured for him to take a seat at her small table while she walked to her counter and began to prepare a pot of coffee. You've seemed like you're going to crawl out of your skin all day. I take it you made a breakthrough? Jeremy shifted in his seat to watch her and suddenly realized that Annie was wearing a tight sleeveless shirt that only came to the top of her thighs and nothing else. She bent over and his focus on the drive control system evaporated. He swallowed, desperately trying to recall the explanation he'd prepared at his silence, Annie turned to face him. She suddenly blushed as she realized where he was looking. Shit, sorry, I forgot how much this top rides up. Uh, it's okay, Jeremy said lamely as he turned away, looking out the window at the ever-active Capeton shipyard. I shouldn't have, I'm sorry. Annie walked over to her closet and pulled out a pair of leggings, quickly slipping into them before walking back to her kitchenette. Okay, it's safe to look she said with a laugh. But for the record, it doesn't bother me when you stare at my ass. I work hard to make sure it's steerable. Jeremy felt his flush coming back. I'm sorry, you were very steerable, Annie. That's part of the problem for me. She glanced over her shoulder and nodded slowly. Right, Anatha, sorry. It's okay, it's me, right? I should be over her by now, I- Annie turned and leaned against the counter. No, Jeremy, I don't think you should ever be over her. You loved her, and she was taken from you before her time. The fact that you still feel so strongly for her speaks volumes about you. The good kind of volumes. She gave a kindly wink. I'm so used to flaunting my booty that sometimes I forget that the flauntee isn't interested in what I'm offering, that I might actually be hurting them. Jeremy chuckled as Annie turned back to her task, and his eyes slid down to her now-clothed ass. Annie, 
I don't think your booty has ever hurt anyone. She gave a soft laugh, her shoulders rising slightly as she finished cleaning the pot. Well, there was this one time I slipped and fell on a guy's. Well, you get the picture. Jeremy bit his lip and turned back to the window. Yeah, I do. He took a deep breath, trying to think of unsexy things like the fungus that grew on the outside of Capedon Orbital, or what Carl always smelled like after he visited the Lower Warrens. Anything but how he was betraying Anatha's memory, because those thoughts conflated feelings for Anna and Anatha, and he was pretty sure that was not helping at all. Okay, he said as Annie finished with the coffee maker and came to sit across from him. You know how we were thinking that the NSAIs were going to be the way to go? Uh-huh, except that every modification to the NSAIs gets reviewed six ways from star day. No way can we introduce a systemic change into one of their core systems. Jeremy nodded. Right you are, except what if the change to the NSAI's core systems was something that would also solve all of the thrust balance issues for the Pinnacle glass ships? I can imagine a few people getting excited about that. But have you actually solved that problem too? Yeah, Jeremy waved a hand in dismissal. I thought of all of this this morning while drying my hair. Your hair? Annie asked, her silvery laugh derailing Jeremy's thoughts again. He nodded vigorously and explained his solution to the thrust balance then went into how that fix would require him to tap into a subsystem in the NSAI's code base that wasn't used anymore. Because it didn't work with the fuel mixtures the Empire had switched to in recent years. Annie's eyes grew wider and wider as he explained his plan to her. At one point, she muttered that she was going to need coffee to process it, and walked to the now full pot and poured two cups. Okay, let me get this straight, she said while settling back into her chair. You have to write a new subsystem that clearly is doing something that everyone wants. That subsystem has a dependency on this other subsystem, but just to load a code library that isn't in use anymore. Except, the library's inclusion requires a data route to be open that will give us remote access into the new library. And in turn, it can access the other subsystem that isn't supposed to be used anymore. It gets better. Jeremy said, grinning broadly. No one rewrote the test platforms they use at the shipyard. So when the old library gets included, so do its tests. Opening this privileged data route is actually a requirement to pass the tests. So long as no one in DSQA notices, we're going to be home free. Annie's grin matched his own as she laughed. Those poor bastards in QA are so overworked, they haven't seen starlight in weeks. No way are they going to go digging into the parameters for tests that are passing. Jeremy nodded vigorously. The only thing we have to do now is tell Chief Flo about our new, very important subsystem, so we can test it out on the pinnacle. Once that ship completes a successful full burn in every configuration, I'll explain that my systems will improve efficiency in every ship and get it put into the master repository. Then, when the next NSAI code updates roll out, our back door will be in every Nietzschean ship at Capeton. Shit, Jeremy. This is amazing. So, just one question. How do we trigger this? I get that we access the privileged data route, but that means another system has to tell the NSAI to run the subsystem for the wrong fuel mixtures. Right, Jeremy nodded. To do that, we're going to need to install a small NSAI into a low-security system that won't be subject to any serious review. Damn, Annie ran a hand down her jaw. That actually might be more difficult than the other part of the plan. Where are we going to tuck in a new NSAI that no one will notice? I'm not sure. I was thinking that maybe Parr would know. Annie snorted. <laughs> I think that bringing Parr into any part of this is the last thing we should do. He hasn't been able to keep a secret since he first learned what his penis was. So how will we do this? To be honest, it would be best if whoever we find wasn't in DCS at all. I think I have a solution. Annie spoke the word slowly, like she was worried Jeremy wouldn't like what she had to say. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. 
a friend? Jeremy asked, his eyebrows climbing up his forehead. Have you been telling someone else about our plans? What if they spill to the neat? What, like Parr? Annie asked with a laugh. Yeah, well, I asked about him, and you were right, he's a risk. Annie reached a hand across the table and clasped Jeremy's wrist. I would never put either of us at risk. Well, any more than we already are. But I need you to trust me. Do you trust me, Jeremy? The feeling of Annie's skin against his sent an electric tingle through his entire body. It was the first time they'd touched. It was the first time he'd had any sort of intimate contact with a woman since Anatha. Stars. I'm considering her hand on my wrist to be intimate, he thought while nodding mutely. Annie gave an encouraging nod. Good, good, okay, this is going to be a shock, but I want you to meet Leslie. She turned a gesture to an empty space in the middle of her quarters. Uh, what? Jeremy asked. Are you messing with me? Leslie, stop playing around. A soft laugh came from empty air, and a moment later, a woman appeared. Her skin was jet black as was her long hair. Small triangular ears poked out of her hair, and large yellow eyes blinked at him. She took a step forward and a sinuous tail whipped around behind her. Jeremy, I'm so glad to finally meet you. What you figured out is really going to help us. It took Jeremy a moment to realize he was on his feet, backing away from the strange cat woman. Us? He glanced at Annie, who had also risen, her hands extended entreatingly. Who the fuck is us? Jeremy? Annie said in a soft voice. The resistance. We've been working against the Neats for years. Now with Leslie's people, we have a chance to strike a major blow. You're a huge part of that. Wait, Leslie's people aren't your people? Jeremy asked. Well, sorta, Leslie said, white teeth standing out against her black lips as she smiled. I'm with Rika's marauders. We're here to kill Constantine. Jeremy's mouth fell open, and he looked to Annie, who was nodding vigorously. Yeah, it's all true, she said. Well. Shit, he swallowed, forcing down a mixture of fear and elation. We're killing Constantine too? Reunion. Stellar date 04.30.8950. Adjusted years. Location, the refuge, Faniel. Region, Genevia system, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika had to stop herself from bouncing on the balls of her feet as the Azura approached the massive cradle centered in one of Faniel's underground docking bays. She clenched her left hand over and over again in an effort to relax, ultimately giving up and rising onto her toes, momentarily forgetting the world looked low gravity as she lifted into the air. Rika, settle down, Barn muttered next to her. It's like you're spring-loaded or something. A snort escaped her lips as she touched back down on the deck, activating her maglocks to be on the safe side. You're just grouchy because Leslie is in system having fun and you're out here. Maybe, Barn grunted. So maybe you could show a bit of compassion. She's big on monogamy and I'm feeling the pinch here. Rika shrugged. You knew what you were getting into. I have pretty much zero compassion for you. Chase and I, however, are gonna fuck like rabbits. Four days. Oh? Silva asked as she approached. Think you have time for that? I'll make time, Rika replied with a nervous laugh. What, after all we've been through, you're nervous to talk about sex around me? That's all we used to talk about back in Hammerfall. Rika chuckled. <laughs> I don't know. Somehow over the years you became a mother figure for me in my mind, and talking sex with you just feels weird. Barn leaned around Rika to wink at Silva. I'll talk sex with you all you want, Major. I'd consider it my duty. I only have sex if I get to use my GNR, Silva said, making a lewd gesture with her weapon. Shit, Major. 
Barn muttered. I said talk sex, not get violated by your e-beam. Silva gave the sergeant major a menacing grin. I've only got one mode, hardcore. Stars, Silva, Rika said as her eyebrows rose. So much for thinking of you as the loving mother. This is me being the loving mother. I'm just practicing at scaring away anyone that Amy brings to see me. I figure if I can get Barn to stand down, I can chase anybody off. I'm standing all the way down, Barn said, crossing his legs. As the trio spoke, the Azores settled onto the docking cradle. Vapor clouds pouring off the ship as the bay's air came into contact with the ship's cold hull. Damn, Barn said. I thought I told them to fix the dehumidifiers in here. I'm sure it's on the list, Rika replied. No one's used these bays in centuries. No excuse, the sergeant major muttered. As the cradle's ramp lifted toward the Azores' starboard midship airlock, Rika marveled at the fact that they were tucking ships up to a kilometer in length below Faneuil's surface. Every one of the Marauder's craft were secreted away in subterranean bays, with the sole exception of the Fury Lance, which had settled into a canyon not far away. The ship could have fit in one of the larger bays, but Piper had balked at the idea of being underground, and Rika hadn't pushed the matter. I suppose if I had spent hundreds of years trapped inside a moon, I might feel the same way. A light flashed on the Azores hull and the airlock cycled open, revealing Crunch and a group of mechs from M Company's first platoon. They marched down the ramp and formed up at its base. More mechs followed until the entire platoon was present. Once they were assembled, Lieutenant Chris and Staff Sergeant Christian walked down the ramp and stood in front of their four squads, looking them over before turning to face Rika. Colonel Rika, first platoon M Company reporting for duty, Lieutenant Chris announced enthusiastically. His statement was followed by the mech's now standard cry of, Rika! She prayed that she wasn't blushing too furiously and glanced up to the top of the ramp where Chase stood, smiling proudly at the mechs below him. Did you put them up to this? She asked. We're not normally so big on ceremony. I didn't do a thing. I'm pretty sure it was Crunch who convinced everyone to do this. Rika squared her shoulders and walked toward Chris, lifting her left hand to salute him, which he and Staff Sergeant Christian returned. Lieutenant, Rika lowered her hand, keeping her eyes locked on his. Did you kick ass? Yes, ma'am, he shouted. Asses were kicked. She nodded and walked to the end of the line of mechs, meeting Crunch's steady gaze as he stood before first squad. He didn't move a millimeter as she swept her gaze across the mechs arrayed behind him, a smile grazing her lips as she caught Kelly's saucy wink. Very good, Sergeant, she said to Crunch before walking to the other squads, fronted by Corin, CJ, and Kara. She gave a word of approval to each before returning to stand before the platoon leader and sergeant. Looks like your mechs are tip-top and combat ready. Good work, Lieutenant. A smile graced Chris's lips and he gave a curt nod. Thank you, Colonel. She returned the gesture, a grin splitting her lips before calling out, Okay, you mangy dogs, enough of this nonsense. Everyone knows Rika's marauders aren't whole without M's first, and we're glad to have you back. Now get out of here before you make me red as Barnes' ass when Leslie's done with him. You have the rest of the day to yourselves. Come back and unload the Asura next shift. A cheer broke out from the mechs, and they turned in a much less orderly fashion and followed the squad sergeants across the bay. You almost got her, Chris, Chase said as he walked down the ramp. Cheeks got a little flushed, but she didn't go full tomato. Was that the goal? Rika asked, turning her gaze to Chris, who was grinning ear to ear. No, ma'am, Lieutenant Chris said. Though there may have been a pool on it, Honestly, we're just frickin' glad to be back with the battalion, especially since we're the ones that got the intel to hit Genevia. The tune was worried you'd start the fun without us. No chance, Rika replied, nodding to Lieutenant Vargo as he descended the ramp with the Asura's crew. Stars, Vargo cried out. Interesting digs you got down here, Colonel. Felt like I was flying the Asura into a black hole. That's sort of the idea, Lieutenant. All the better to hide in. Hope we're not hiding for long, Sergeant Christian said. We've been cooped up. The mechs are itching for action. Rika turned and gestured toward the bay's exit. 
Plenty of that to come. Barn will show you around. We'll worry about debriefing tomorrow. Vargo snorted and glanced at Chase. Right, because first you need to debrief the captain here. He's got your number, Silva said to Rika before nodding to Vargo to follow her out. Best let these two get somewhere private. Chase reached out and grabbed Rika's arm, pulling her close, his armored chest pressing against hers. There's a whole empty starship right behind us, and I didn't grab my rucksack yet. Rika glanced at the other mechs. What are you all standing around for? Go, shoo. Following that pronouncement, she banished them from her thoughts and turned back to face Chase, taking in the sight of him before pressing her lips to his. I'm never sending you off like that again, she whispered. Chase pulled her more tightly against himself, trailing a hand down her gun arm. Good, because I wouldn't want to have to disobey orders. So are we going to your cabin aboard the Asura or what? She asked. Oh, I wasn't. Rika was already striding toward the ship's ramp, pulling Chase after her. They didn't make it to his cabin. Division. Stellar date 04.30.8950. Adjusted years. Location, the refuge, Vaniel. Region, Genevia system, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Quite the find you made with this place, Chase said several hours later when they'd finally made it to Rika's quarters. She nodded absently, nuzzling her cheek against his chest while enjoying the sound of his heartbeat. Less a find and more a benefit of Gloria's data hoarding, she knew pretty much exactly where Faniel would be. Good thing, Chase replied. Even knowing this place was here, it was nerve-wracking to make the approach. Rika turned her head, resting her chin on Chase's sternum, gazing into his eyes. He stretched out a hand and stroked her hair. One of the best things about being a mech is that it doesn't hurt when you do that anymore. Oh, I kind of liked making you suffer, she said with a mischievous grin, pushing down with her chin. Chase laughed. Vixen, sorry to interrupt your tender moment, Nikki said to the couple. But we just got word from Leslie. She's made contact with the engineer, and he's worked out a way to sabotage the entire Nietzschean fleet. Rika's head snapped up, her eyes wide as she stared into Chase's. Entire? As in, all? That's the definition I'm using, yes. I'm sure there are caveats, but entire was the word Leslie used. Rika pulled up the message from Leslie, reading through a report on the plan that the drive technician, a Genevian man named Jeremy, had come up with. It seemed like a solid strategy, barring the part where they needed to load an NSAI into some non-critical system on every ship. Still seems like a pretty big if, she said aloud. Seems clever, though, Chase said. Granted, a lot of what he's talking about is beyond me. I'm impressed that you can follow it, Rika. She pushed herself upright and swung her legs over the edge of the bed. I've been studying a lot. Every time I turn around, someone in the battalion is sending me a report about a subject I barely grasp. Nikki's been helping me grok it all. She's demurring, Nikki said. Rika's a fast study. Chase disentangled himself from the sheets and settled on the edge of the bed next to her, causing it to groan in protest. Shoot. They don't really design these for a pair of mechs, do they? Not much gets designed for a pair of mechs, Rika said, laughing as she rose before the bed gave out. I'm a bit surprised it survived our antics thus far. Leader Oda got the report too, Nikki said. He's put out the call for a meeting tonight. Rika groaned and pushed herself up. Yay, my favorite person. He's a pain in the ass, Chase asked as he rose as well. Sorta, Rika said as she placed her arm into her GNR mount, triggering the rack to slot in the rods and fasten it in place. He's passionate about protecting his people, but over the years, his goals and focus have narrowed to only pursue operations with almost no risk. I don't really blame him. He suffered a lot of losses early on, but now's not the time to play it safe. If he wants to keep people safe, then running ops out of your civilian's hidey hole isn't the best idea. Right, 
Rika nodded as she lifted her arm and inspected it before stepping onto the pad for armoring. That's part of his problem. Any civvies on Faniel should have been shipped off to another system years ago. Heck, they could all have been sent to Septia a dozen times over by now. Anyway, he's what we have to work with. At least that Larice woman's influence was short-lived. Larice? Chase asked as he stepped onto his armoring pad. That name rings a bell. She was a GAF admiral, Rika said. Now she's admiraling in the Lance's brig. Whoa, you don't pull punches. She's a war criminal. She, I'll tell you about it later. Chase nodded and they finished getting dressed in silence. Rika was done first and waited next to the door for Chase, watching as he visually inspected his armor before latching his helmet onto his hip. You know, she said, the words trailing off. He cocked an eyebrow, a half smile on his lips. I know what. She took a step toward him, hooking a finger on one of his armor's hard mounts. I thought you were hot as a squishy, but you're way better as a mech. Their lips met, and she wondered if maybe they could put off Oda's meeting a bit longer. Damn, this is a long shaft, Chase said as he peered over the edge. And these lift platforms, what's their max load rating? You don't want to know, Nikki said ominously. You're a mech, Rika reminded him. You have agrav systems, and this planet barely has any pull to it. Sure, yeah, he nodded while continuing to look at the drop. And that's what I keep telling my brain, but it just says... Big down is down. You've scaled towers a lot taller than this, Rika said as she walked to the edge and looked over with him. Sure, yeah, but when you do that, there's a landscape spread around you. Somehow that's better. This is just a dark hole that seems to go on forever. Well, they try to conserve energy here. Faniel doesn't work too well as a hidden base if they run reactors hot to keep all bright and shiny inside. Chase glanced at his arm and blew off some of the ever-present black dust. I don't think anything is shiny in this place. The lift stopped after another minute, though there was still plenty of shaft below them. Rika turned and squared her shoulders. Okay, let's go have some fun. They walked off the lift platform and down a broad corridor that led to the residential section that the resistance occupied. The doors at the end opened to admit them, and Rika blinked in surprise at the bright light within. Her eyes only took a second to adjust to the luminescence, and she gazed in wonder at a vast atrium with a hollow dome overhead, showing a cloud-dotted sky. You are saying about resource usage? Chase asked. Okay, I've never been down this far before. Oda had been prickly about not alarming his people, and I didn't feel like pushing the matter. Now I can see the reason for his hesitation. This isn't a military resistance at all. Directly in front of them stretched a grassy field dotted with children playing and adults chatting idly in small groups. Further back was a small lake, and beyond that was more green space. Huh, a voice said from behind them. Enrica turned to see Captains Ron and Scarcliff approaching. This is not what I expected, Scarcliff said. I'd envisioned some sort of refugee camp with people huddled in corridors, grim-faced soldiers moving amongst them. Yeah, I guess I kind of forgotten that this place was made for government officials, Rika said. They like to have their creature comforts. I guess this is why Oda is so prickly. He's made a little place where they can pretend things haven't gone to shit. Colonel Rika, a voice called out from their left, and she turned to see Lieutenant Gary striding up a ramp. Glad you're here. Oda's getting impatient. Rika resisted the urge to roll her eyes. Well, he should work on that. Not everyone is at his beck and call. The lieutenant pursed his lips, nodding slightly. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Rika shook her head. That was uncalled for. I assume you're here to lead us? Gary nodded. Yes, it's a bit of a warren down here. I can see that, Scarcliff said, his eyes still on the park and the children playing under the blue sky above. I can't imagine being those kids. What do you mean? 
Rika asked as they followed Gary down the ramp, skirting the edge of the park. I bet most of them have lived their whole lives down here. Rika allowed that to sink in, shaking her head in disbelief. Damn. Well, it's our job to make that not be a necessity anymore. Who knows, they might see real starlight in just a few months. Now that's something worth fighting for, Ron said. Rico wondered if Lieutenant Gary resented their comments. He didn't say anything one way or another as he led them down a side passage, and then through something that did indeed deserve the name Warren. Eventually, they came to a room that Rika suspected was intended to function as a legislative assembly space. It was a classical half-bowl shape with a large table at the bottom. Seated at the head of the table was Oda. Several of his aides and ministers were also seated at the table, along with Tremon, Silva, Bord, and Heather, and the other Marauder Company commanders, Megan, Jitra, Crispin, and Penelope. It didn't escape Rika's attention that on the resistance side, Gary appeared to be the only military officer, though there was a man she'd never seen before sitting on Oda's right. His bearing suggested that he'd seen combat in the past. When they reached the bottom of the steps, Oda rose and gestured to the empty seat to the table. Please sit. Let's not worry about introductions. We can access one another's basic information over the link. I have to say, Rika began as she settled at the far end of the table from Oda, I was not expecting things to be quite so nice down here. I suppose I'd gotten used to the utilitarian decor at the top of the shaft. Thank you, Oda said, not acknowledging what was clearly a deliberate omission on his part. I felt it would be more efficacious to meet down in the refuge with the rest of the Genevian leadership so that we can discuss our next steps in the sabotage operation. Works for me, Rika replied wondering if Genevian leadership referred to the refuge or the entire system. It seems like Jeremy has a solid plan for getting the drive control NSAI updates in place. We just need to help with getting a trigger system installed, which I think we can do without too much trouble. Oh, the man next to Oda replied. Rika looked up his name and learned it to be Veek. The link data on the refuge's network didn't carry any information about his responsibilities, but something in his eyes told Rika that Veek was the sort of man who got his hands dirty, frequently. I believe that I can insert what we need into their comm system, Nikki announced to the group over the room's network. We'll need to infiltrate the central data stores that the Capeton shipyards use and plant an update in the nodes that secrets an NSAI into a subsystem. All the control logic can operate from that NSAI and it can issue the triggers to the DCS system in engineering. How can you be so sure that this will work? Oda asked. Our operatives' report said that it needs to be in a low-level system that won't have a lot of security review for new updates. Rika was surprised to see Oda respond so skeptically. The drive sabotage plan was something his people had initiated before the marauders had even arrived. She would have thought that he'd be elated to pull off such a coup. Your operative was right, Nikki replied. However, she doesn't have access to an L-10 AI that resides within a Nietzschean supercruiser. We worked out a way to get it done. Isn't Piper higher than an L-10? Rika asked privately. Yeah, but saying L-20 tends to scare people. Plus, I don't know for sure what he rates, with his other selves gone. Makes sense, the hush-hush part at least. You are referring to the Fury Lance's ship AI, Veek asked, and Rika inferred from the question itself that he didn't approve. That's correct, she replied. And you trust a Nietzschean AI? Oda asked. Piper's not Nietzschean, Nikki corrected. Veek's brow lowered. I thought you acquired him from Epsilon before you destroyed the Nietzschean shipyards there. Acquired? Chase said on the Marauder's private channel. That's just a little distasteful. Well, this system is where a lot of the scum floated to the top, Tremon replied, a note of apology in his voice. Remember, we didn't treat AIs well during the war. There's a reason for that. Yes, Rika replied. Piper joined us at Epsilon, but he predated the Nietzscheans. 
He was present during the period when Genevia held that system. In fact, he was there when the Asmovians built it. A few surprised looks were shared around the table, but Rika ignored them and pressed on. If Piper believes this can be done, then there's no reason to doubt him. I suppose that will have to do, Oda replied, nodding seriously. Rika stared at the resistance leader in consternation for a moment before shaking her head. Okay, I'm just going to put it out there. I don't get you people. This is amazing. There are tens of thousands of Nietzschean ships out there, and you figured out a way to take them out of play without a fight. Why the hell do you all look like we're at a funeral? Because, Oda said, his expression growing more severe. If you fail, then the Neats are going to come looking for us. We can't defend against a full assault by their forces. Honestly, we weren't expecting the engineers to do anything more than sabotage a few random ships. This, this is a lot of risk. Bigger than we're comfortable with. Stars, Rika muttered, then pursed her lips, trying to quell the anger building in her chest. Oh, fuck it. She rose from her seat, extending her legs to her full height. You know... While you were hiding down here with your nice park and bubbling brooks, people like General Mill were building a military force in an effort to try and save Genevia. Others like Colonel Adira were operating in Genevian space, saving refugees and hitting the Neats every chance they could get. Meanwhile, people like myself and half the population were treated like animals by the Neats. All that is still going on. Just in case you weren't aware, our people are being crushed under the neat heel while you hem and haw about how much good you're willing to do. Well, I don't give a flying goat fuck what you cowards think. You can hide down here till the stars burn out. We're acting on this intel, and we're acting on it now. She began to turn away when Leader Oda rose. Rika, stop. Slowly, she turned her head back toward the man. What? You can't just do this. You're going to throw the system into chaos. Mr. Oda, Rika ground out the man's name. I think we finally understand one another. That is exactly what I'm going to do. By then, the rest of the marauders, including Tremon, had already risen. Rika took a step back, gesturing for her people to precede her. As Tremon walked past, he sent her a message. Recruit Gary here and now. She nodded, the same thought having occurred to her. Lieutenant Gary, how would you like to join the marauders? She asked. The man's lips drew into a thin line, and he looked from Rika to Oda and back. And my team? Open call, she replied. They're all welcome. Gary rose and directed a cold look at Oda. Then I'm in. Lieutenant, Oda called out. You can't go. The man didn't even respond as he walked past Rika, following Tremon up the stairs to the chamber's exit. Colonel Rika. This time it was Veek that called her name. She only held up her hand and shook her head. Stop, please. You're embarrassing yourselves. She didn't look back as she climbed the steps and walked out of the chamber. Five minutes later, Rika and her team were riding three of the lift platforms back up. They'd spoken little, and Rika knew that having the entire command team on the rickety platforms was making everyone nervous. Are they trying to shut down the platforms? She asked after she noticed heavy traffic on the network. Yeah, surprised you picked up on that. Don't worry, I've shut them out of the shaft control. I kinda anticipated something like this. I was surprised at their general lack of enthusiasm, but this, I... She was distracted by a laugh from the next platform over, and she saw Heather with a hand over her mouth as Scarcliffe puffed out his chest and declared in a mocking voice, You'll throw the whole system into chaos. Scarcliffe, Rika said, shaking her head. That's not helping. The captain's face split into a wide grin and he waggled his finger at her, still doing his best Oda impersonation. 
Now see here, young lady, we've been playing in our pretty park for a decade, and we're not about to have you fuck that up for us with all this righteous smiting of the Nietzscheans nonsense. Rika opened her mouth to chastise the man, but a chuckle slipped out first. She tried to stop it, but the ludicrous nature of the whole event hit her, and she burst into laughter. A second later, everyone on the lift was laughing, the sound of their mirth echoing up and down the shaft. The ride to the top took five minutes, and a few waves of soft chuckles were still making the rounds as the platform stopped and the mechs began to walk off. Chase glanced at Rika as they stepped onto the solid platform that ringed the shaft. Can you believe that we had to stop having sex for that shit? An hour later, after everyone had taken a meal and made certain that Oda wasn't planning to attack them, the battalion command reconvened in the same conference room where Rika had first met with Oda. Okay, people, now that we've discerned that we're not getting any help from the pusillanimous people down below, present company excluded, she paused a nod to Gary, who gave a wan smile in response. Let's talk about a real plan. Two-pronged, Barn declared. We timed the assassination and the assault on the Capeton shipyards to coincide. We have the ISF on standby, and when the shit hits the fan, we call on the cavalry. The neats all boosh like mad to meet us, and boom. It'll be just like those five times I won Terra assault. Till my team crushed you, Chase gave the sergeant major a feral grin. Still easy, Barnes said with a languid shrug. That easy? Silva asked, cocking an eyebrow at Barn. Needs go boom? Sure, he shrugged. It's what they do best. Obviously, there are a lot of details to iron out, but in a nutshell, that's what I think we should do. We don't need some fancy complex operation. Except that this is complex, Colonel Borden said. Namely, we have to solve the problem that scared our friends below so much. We have to get the control NSAI into the ships, which means we have to breach the shipyard's main data store. Right, Rika said with a nod. That'll be me, since Nikki is going to be a key part of that. Agreed, Borden replied. And nothing can really happen until that's in place, and the updates filter out to all the Nietzschean ships. And when it does, we have to strike fast, Silva added. The longer we wait, the more chance there is that the sabotage will be detected. What do you think that the success rate of this engine sabotage is? Tremon asked, his tone much more serious than the rest of the marauders. I know from experience that some of the ships won't suffer catastrophic damage. True, Nikki replied. There will probably be ships that fail to run all the updates for one reason or another. There may also be some that have drive systems that will handle the different fuel mixture parameters. Those will likely be older ships, which means they'll be the active warships, not ones recently constructed with skeleton or shakedown crews. Do you have a number? Barn asked. Like 50-50? Based on the data we have on the ships in the system, I'd say that we're looking at 20% of the ships being unaffected. Also, remember that this catastrophic failure will only strike if the ships burn hard, which means we have to make the needs chase us. Okay. Rika surveyed the people around her, noting that their expressions were much more serious. So we're talking about somewhere between five and 10,000 enemy ships surviving. They're also more likely to be crafted with veteran crews. Nothing to sneeze at, Scarcliffe shook his head. And we need to have a contingency plan for what happens if Carson's ships don't show, Borden added. You know something we don't? Barn asked. The ISF colonel shrugged. Gate failures have happened before. I just want to be sure we have a fallback. He's right. Rika activated the table's holo display, bringing up a view of the Genevia system. We need to cover all the bases. Now let's start laying out all the scenarios. We've got a visitor, Nikki announced. Veek. A minute later, Kelly appeared at the door. I found something in the halls. Should I throw it down the shaft? Rika sighed and shook her head. No, send him in. Okay, let me know if you need a cleanup crew. She stepped aside and Veek entered, the expression on his face one of calm forbearance. 
If you've come in an attempt to convince us to stand down, Rika began, but Veek lifted a hand and shook his head. Oda is wrong, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. He's been hiding down here for ages. He has no idea what the real world's like anymore. For all intents and purposes, I've been running all of the operations in the Genevia system for the past few years. Rika glanced at Gary, who shrugged. I'd agree with that. Vika and his people are really the only ones who leave Faniel anymore. Okay, Rika said, gesturing to an empty seat. What do you have to offer? Vika inclined his head, giving a thin-lipped smile. Well, how about idents for your ships and codes to get you onto both the Pinnacle and Capeton Command, where the central data store resides? Stars, finally someone in the system who's doing something, Nikki said to Rika. I know, though it sure comes in a dour package. Rika placed a hand on the table and looked over those assembled. Okay, let's lay this out. Hit and run. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Asura. Approaching Deep Helm. Region, Genevia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. One week later. Just get back with the fleet, and now here we are, out on our own again. Chief Glenn said from where he sat at the engineering console on the Asura's bridge. Ashley stretched her forearms above her head, rotating her neck while replying, Well, half the ships in the fleet are out around the system's fringe like we are. We're unified in our dispersion. Uh, yeah. You know, you kind of look like those dancing spiders when you do that, Ash. The chief petty officer turned to look at Glenn. There are dancing spiders? I'm not sure if I'm intrigued or horrified. What? Glenn's brow rose in surprise. How is it possible that you've lived this long and not seen vids of dancing spiders? I mean, they're almost as popular as cat vids in some places. Okay, let's be serious, Vargo said, looking from Ashley to Glenn. Nothing even comes close to cat vids. Bam, Ashley exclaimed. Take that, stupid dancing spiders. Vargo chuckled, turning his attention from Ashley and Glenn's banter to the station they were approaching. Thanks to a database of Nietzschean items that the Resistance had stolen and that Veek had so generously turned over, the common refueling depot the Asura was approaching would see them as a destroyer named the Unyielding Liger, a ship that patrolled the area. They're hailing us, Ashley said a minute later, interrupting her discussion with Glenn about what sort of ship's cat would fare best on the Azora. Let's start with audio only, Vargo said. You're on. Ashley replied, and a second later, a voice came over the bridge's audio systems. Greetings, Liger. Deep Helm STC, you're a bit early this time around. Well, we changed our name from Liger to Leopard, Vargo replied. Makes us go a lot faster. Uh, sure, that makes perfect sense. I'm serious, Vargo replied. We just vroom through space now. Hit light speed chasing the celestial unicorn a few days ago. Uh... Who am I speaking to? Are you okay over there? Vargo put a hand over his mouth, trying not to laugh at the consternation in the STC controller's voice. Once he had control over himself, he replied, Oh yeah, we're fine. Well, mostly fine. We had a problem with a leak in one of the environmental systems and things. Say, do you like cats? Environmental? What do you mean? I can't gain remote access to your ship. Did you suffer some sort of damage? How about cheeseburgers? Vargo asked. Cat cheeseburgers? I've always wanted to try one of those. A new voice came over the speakers a second later. Unyielding Liger, this is Major Yuri. Who am I speaking to? I need your rank, name, and ident code. Major Yuri, yes, sir, Vargo replied enthusiastically. My name is Captain Kitty Cat, ident number... At that point, he drew a deep breath and did his best impression of a purr. Say, you got any catnip, Deep Helm? Shit, they're really messed up over there. The first voice said a moment later, should we send over a team? A tug first, 
Get them on the right course. You hear that, Liger? We're sending a tug to bring you on close approach. I need you to cease burn and stay on your current vector. That's leopard to you, Major Yo-Yo. But okay, I guess this kitty needs a rest anyway. We'll follow your tug like it's a ball of yarn. Bouncy leopard out. Vargo closed the connection and Ashley burst into laughter, followed a second later by Glenn. Stars, sir, she said once she'd regained the power of speech. I just about lost it when you started purring. Give a girl a warning before you do something like that. Whatever possessed you to do that, sir? Glenn asked as he wiped tears off his cheeks. Vargo shrugged. I guess it was that stupid name, Unyielding Liger, and your conversation about cats just pushed me over the edge. Well, they must really think we've gone over the edge. They're sending both of the depot's tugs, Ashley said. You gonna kill Burn like they asked? Oh, shoot, Vargo said, and he cut the engine's thrust, leaving the ship to drift through space. Looks like we're 30 minutes from the tugs latching on, enough time to get a saucer of milk. Over the next half hour, Deep Helm's STC attempted to contact the ship several times, but each time Vargo just made purring noises. Eventually, he recorded a loop and just set it to broadcast continuously. You're gonna win some sort of battalion award for this, Glenn said. When I played it back for Jakari and Lexi, they just about died. One for the books, that's for sure, Ashley agreed. Okay, the tugs have made their grapple. They're pulling us in. Everything loaded and ready? Vargo asked. You bet. Ashley nodded, grinning ear to ear. Soon as we're within a thousand clicks, I'll take out their defensive systems on this side of the station. Musil, Biddy, and Smitty are already aboard the assault shuttle, ready to kick the door in. Vargo steepled his fingers as the station grew larger in the forward view. Excellent. These neats are never gonna know what hit them. Capeton Command, Stellar Date 05.07.8950, Adjusted Years, Location, Marauder Shuttle, Capeton Command, Capeton, Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. We're going to give Shoshin a complex, always leaving him behind, Kelly said as she checked over Rika's armor. Kelly laughed and winked at Rika and Kelly. Anytime he wants to get an SMI's body, he can come along, or an RR's at least. AMs just have no stealth. That's a bit harsh, Rika said, trying not to chuckle as she imagined Shoshin's head on an SMI's body. Of course, he still hadn't gotten a face, so it wasn't as odd as the next thought that came to her mind, which was Crunch's head on an SMI's body. Yeah, he's actually a pretty sneaky bastard, Kelly admitted. I do actually miss him when he's not around. Fuck, Shoshin muttered as he appeared at the entrance to the shuttle's rear cabin. You two are cruel. I'm back up, not dead. Kelly's head whipped around. Show, there you are. Where have you been? The AM-4 groaned and folded his arms. Oh, you know, checking out where all the best brothels are around here. Oh, Kelly wiggled her hips. Find any good ones? Yeah. I'm going to burn them down before you spot them. Spoil sport. Kelly slapped Rika's shoulder, and she turned to check her friend's armor over while Kelly waved for Shoshin to check hers. I wonder if we really could make an SMI out of you, Show, Kelly said. There's no rule that says SMIs have to be girls. I bet Carson could build you out like one. You'd be badass. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Shoshin said as he pulled Kelly's reserve ammo canister off her back and inspected it before slotting it back into place. I'd rock being an SMI. Granted, I rock pretty much everything I do, so this isn't a big surprise. You should do it, Kelly said, winking at Rika as she spoke. Then you can be a part of the Queen's Guard. It's limited to just SMIs, you know. Rika coughed, whipping her head around to stare at Kelly. Private? What the hell are you talking about? Kelly whistled. Oh, you know she's mad. She only used your rank. I thought I told Jenison not to mention that to anyone. Kelly shrugged innocently. You told her not to say the P word to anyone. Queen was Jenison's idea. You didn't forbid her to share it. Not that Jenison can keep a secret anyway, Shoshin muttered. Kelly either, for that matter. I resent that, 
The SMI dash four turned to the AM dash four and wagged her finger at him. I've not told anyone about the thing you shared with me. Should I spill it? Since apparently I can't keep secrets. Uh, Shoshan's voice wavered. So, Colonel Rika, should I stay on the ship or take up a position somewhere else on the station? Rika was as glad for a change of topic as Shoshan. Stay aboard. I want to make sure our egress is clear. And if we have to get off station elsewhere, you can fly around for pickup. Okay. The AM-4 nodded. Don't forget that this shuttle doesn't have much in the way of shields. Ferris won't go far, Rika said. We only need to get from Captain Command to the Undaunted. Shoshin nodded but didn't respond otherwise. Rika didn't need him to. She knew that with the hundreds of Nietzschean ships around, even a short flight could spell disaster. The three SMI-4s finished their armor check and walked to the back of the shuttle where Chief Lara, the Undaunted's engineering head, waited. Rika could see that the woman looked uncomfortable, though she didn't think it was from the Nietzschean uniform she wore. Don't worry, Chief, Rika said in a soothing voice. We have all our clearances. We're just here to offload some cargo and then fuel up. You'll only have to talk to a dockhand or two, that's it. And if things go sideways? Laura asked. That's what I'm here for, Shoshin said from behind Rika. Okay, we're settling on the cradle. Ramp is lifting. Nikki advised, get ready. Rika clasped a hand on Laura's shoulder and nodded to the woman before activating her stealth systems and disappearing. Okay, Kelly said as she faded from view. Let's kick some Nietzschean ass. Kelly snorted. Uh, this is a stealth mission. Ideally, no asses will be kicked. I'll kick your ass, Kelly. Quiet, you two. Rika admonished as Laura opened the hatch and stepped out onto the ramp. The SMIs waited until the engineer reached the bottom and struck up a conversation with a dockhand before they carefully exited the shuttle and quietly walked down the ramp. Okay, Rika said. Remember, we're not in a hurry, no need to risk stealth for speed. We take it nice and slow. Like a walk in the park, Kelly replied. If that park were filled with neats who would happily kill us, Kelly added. Stars. I bet Shoshin is happy to have a break from you two, Rika said with a mock laugh. My queen, Kelly drawled, you wrung us so. I'll increase your pay if you stop saying that, Kelly snorted. No deal, Malige. Leslie followed behind Jeremy and Annie, her stealth activated, watching with amusement how careful Jeremy was never to touch Annie, though his fingers seemed to periodically stray toward her hand, stopping a few centimeters away as the pair walked down the passageway. He clearly had feelings for her, and she for him. But for some reason, neither were acting on them. Leslie was certain that the other night, Annie had worn the short dress that was prone to ride up in order to tempt Jeremy. It was a bit classless in Leslie's opinion, but given Annie's cover, she couldn't blame the woman for resorting to raw sexuality to get the man's attention. Either that or Annie really was that forgetful. No, not the sort of thing that a spy like her would do. Even as Leslie referred to Annie as a spy, she had to remind herself that the woman had no formal training as such. She really was just a drive technician who had joined with the resistance and was doing the best she could to slow down the Nietzschean war machine. The pair of technicians met with a few other members of their crew at the maglev terminal, all praising Jeremy for his solution to the thrust balancing on the pinnacle, sharing their excitement to finally see the ship do a live burn. She could tell that he was proud of his work, while also ashamed that he'd done it for the Nietzscheans. She understood the sentiment. Having done some jobs as a mercenary that she wasn't exactly happy about at the time, even if the ultimate outcome was good. Stay sharp, Jeremy, she said. Yeah, your wits are helping the Neats, but that's just a cover for harming the Neats, which means you're doing good. Uh, thanks, I guess, he replied. Are you sure this encrypted channel is secure? The Neats are really good at snooping on the link. You know the systems Annie uses to keep Nietzschean ears from listening to conversations in her quarters? Yeah. Well, if you trust those, you can trust this. It comes from some very advanced allies. She saw Jeremy look away from his friend Parr, 
his eyes searching the maglev car for Leslie's location. Who are the allies? Don't look for me, Jeremy. Just relax, okay? Sure, yeah, easy. Leslie didn't reply, worried that further conversation would have the opposite effect from what she desired. She was half tempted to tell Annie to hold his hand or something, but worried about unintended consequences there as well. Stars, heed your own advice, Leslie. Worrying about Jeremy was putting her on edge as much as him. For all intents and purposes, most of his work was done. He'd already written the software updates, and they'd passed muster in the simulations. Once the real-life thrust test was complete, the updated NSAI software would be distributed across the newly constructed ships, where more real-world tests would take place. Following those would come the general rollout, at which point very nearly every ship in the Nietzschean fleet, at least those in the Genevia system, would have the vulnerability. The only real risk they faced, aside from the pinnacle suffering some sort of failure in its live thrust tests, was that Rika and Nikki wouldn't get the comm system updates into the data store before the Neats distributed the update system-wide. But chances are that won't happen for a few days, plenty of time. Then she considered the other risk, that Constantine might leave the Genevia system once the Pinnacle's burns were successful. There were a few scattered rumors that he'd come from Prusia with some sort of new FTL system. No one in Genevia seemed to know about jump gates yet, However, so far as Leslie had been able to discern, there were no gates in the system for a return trip. But with the system awash in mining, manufacturing, and construction projects, hiding something even as large as a jump gate wouldn't be impossible. The maglev arrived at the docks, and the crew moved to the shuttle, Leslie taking care to avoid contact in the cramped space. Though once she had to brush against Annie to avoid contact with Parr. To her credit, the woman didn't even flinch at the invisible collision. Five minutes later, they were in space, covering the hundred kilometers between Capeton Orbital and the Pinnacle, which had cleared its moorings at the shipyard and was now in a high orbit around Capeton. Leslie had looked over the Pinnacle specks, but she'd not laid eyes on the ship as yet. She moved to the front of the cabin, tucking herself into a corner where she could peer into the cockpit and watch the approach. It was clear that fitting through jump gates was the rationale behind the ship's ability to tuck its additional hulls in close to the main body. However, that didn't explain why the craft didn't simply remain in that configuration. She understood the advantage of rotating the ship under fire, but rotating individual components seemed like an unnecessary complexity. Jeremy and Annie's team didn't know the rationale behind that either, though they had dozens of ideas. In the end, Leslie supposed that it didn't matter. The ship was never going to see combat. It was a bit anticlimactic, but destroying the enemy's fleet before it could even fire a shot seemed like the perfect sort of victory to her. Would be nice if it was always this easy. Constantine took his place in the center of the viewing room near the top of the Capeton Shipyard's command center. Assembled around him were the fleet commanders, who were also present to watch the Pinnacle's engines perform their first full thrust. He exchanged pleasantries with several of the admirals, eager to see the new design proven in Pinnacle-class ships filling the Empire's fleets. Constantine shared their sentiment, though it rankled him that the ship's design was from Orion, just another example of how Nietzsche was dancing to someone else's tune. He glanced across the room to where General Garza was speaking with Admiral Hammond, dismayed that the man had made an appearance for the test run. The Orion general had disappeared for much of the last four months, though Constantine was uncertain whether or not Garza had remained in the Genevia system. He'd had agents keeping an eye out for the man, but none had found any sign of the Orion general until just a few days prior, when he had arrived at the Capeton shipyards. Though Constantine's hatred for Garza ran deep, not knowing where he was had turned out to be far more annoying than having him close at hand. He harbored a deep-seated fear that Garza would learn about the work Danella was doing for him. She'd not yet completed her masterpiece, but it was close. Every part of the body she was making for him had to be a perfect replica, from the placement of every single hair follicle to the last synaptic connection. Constantine would not accept an inferior vessel. Damn it, here he comes. 
Garza wore his usual smarmy smile as he approached, an expression that spoke volumes about how he considered the emperor to be his lesser. For his part, the emperor consoled himself with thoughts of how he'd kill Garza once he had his new body that was free of the general's control. So, Emperor Constantine, I assume you're eager to see the pinnacle perform as it should. To feel eagerness would be to assume that I expect anything less than perfection, Constantine replied, knowing that they were putting on a show for the surrounding fleet commanders that hung on every word. Of course, if anything doesn't work as expected, I'll assume it's just another failing of the designs you provided. He could see Garza's jaw tighten, but a moment later, the general was all smiles again. Of course, it's entirely understandable that our engineers weren't able to account for the paucity of the region. It's a difficult thing to deal with, but I'm encouraged that your people were able to overcome it. It's a good thing you have such able allies, Constantine replied. Before long, we'll have fleets of pinnacle-class ships, and with the ability to conquer and maintain control of distant systems via jump gates, we'll soon have everything from the hegemony to the Orion Nebula under Nietzsche. The general's eyes narrowed for a moment, and Constantine wondered if the man would counter anything he'd said. The promise of jump gates was one that much of the alliance with Orion was built on. Dozens of ears all around them were eager to hear that promise reaffirmed. If Garza were to renege or equivocate, the Nietzschean military would lose much of their enthusiasm for Orion's aid. Constantine would accept either outcome. If Garza were discredited, that would suit him. But the emperor would prefer to have jump gates. He was certain that once his own engineers could examine them, the empire could replicate the technology and unshackle themselves from Orion. Garza's response took long enough that several of the fleet commanders began to eye one another. Finally, he gave Constantine a broad smile and nodded in agreement. That will be fantastic. I too am eager to see Nietzsche expand her borders. His words appeased the onlookers. And then Admiral Hammond approached, gesturing to the window. They're about to begin. Rika stopped next to a small fountain in the middle of the concourse she was following and waited for a group of Nietzschean soldiers to pass by. She could see on her HUD that Kelly and Kelly were still further back, but making steady progress. A drone flew by, and Rika ducked to avoid it hitting her in the head and almost beamed a woman running past with a barrel of her GNR. Stars, it's like they've brought the entire Nietzschean military aboard for this test run, Rika commented as the soldiers finally moved past and she began to move forward again. Starting to wish we'd opted to go with disguises, not stealth, though I rather prefer to be fully armed and armored this time. Yeah, the number of Nietzsche has been concerning me, Nikki replied. It doesn't seem normal at all. Do we know what normal is here? Rika asked. Yeah, I do. Something like half this many, though a lot of the fleet admiralty is aboard to watch. I suppose that explains it. They've all brought their flunkies along. Rika frowned at that. The fleet admirals? Really? That seems odd. I would have expected them to gather on one of their ships. Hmm. Maybe they... No. Okay, I don't think I have a plausible explanation for why they've chosen to observe from here, Nikki admitted. Rika filtered through the network traffic and accessed the lists of craft in Cape Town near space. Because the shipyards were so active, accessibility of space traffic data was paramount, so it was openly available on the public networks. However, many of the ship designations were coded. She began to flip through them, matching numbered items with data the resistance had gathered. Aha, there it is, found the reason. What did I miss? Oh, just Emperor Constantine's ship, the Bulgara? What? Nikki exclaimed. Where? I don't see it on any of the lists. Well, yeah, it's only identified with an orbital plot number. And then the resistance data spelled the name wrong, Belgara. But I hopped over to the station optics, and sure enough, Belgara. What, on your own? Funny, Nikki. Just because I let you do the breaching most of the time doesn't mean that I can't. Don't forget what I did at Sepe. The AI gave a nervous laugh. Stars, there's no way I'll ever forget that. Okay, 
let's focus on the here and now. The Admiralty is here because Constantine is here, which means that after we access the data store, we know. I know what you're thinking and know. Just to look, just to scope things out, Rika said. We'd be crazy to at least not assess his security. Nikki groaned loudly in Rika's mind. Fine, but first the data store. Even though the ships are a secondary objective, taking them out will make killing the emperor a lot simpler. Well, maybe not killing him, Rika laughed. But getting away with it, yes. The Undaunted's generators couldn't power the shields for more than a minute if all the ships had caped and opened fired on it. She found an alcove and slipped into it, sending a signal for Kelly and Kelly to join her. Once they were in close proximity, she established a comm channel and briefed them on the discovery. Well, shit, Kelly said with a sour tone. And here I thought all these neats were here to see me. I, Kelly began then paused. That's not even funny. Have you used up all your good wit? Maybe, too many neats and I can't shoot any of them. It makes me sour. Sourness aside, we're not going to kill Constantine today. We need to take out the fleet first. Both Kelly and Kelly protested, but when Rika reminded them of the firepower surrounding them, and the fact that the Undaunted was the only Marauder ship in half an AU, they acquiesced. I'd take one for the team, though, Kelly suggested, just to wipe him out. No, Rika admonished. He's not worth your life, Kelly. Not in a suicide run, at least. Fine, but if... Your word, Kelly. You follow orders or I send you back to the shuttle. Fine. Kelly ground the word out. Good. Now let's move. The call. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location. NMS Pinnacle. Capeton. Region. Genevia System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. Leslie climbed atop a row of cabinets mounted to the aft bulkhead in the Pinnacle's primary engineering control center and stretched out, watching the activity below. Jeremy was standing next to the Pinnacle's chief of engineering, reviewing the status of the drive systems in preparation for the ship's burn. She couldn't tell if the chief engineer, a woman named Muro, was happy that her problems were solved or upset that it was Jeremy who'd solved them. Maybe a bit of both, she supposed. She imagined that no matter how much Mural wanted to be the one to have come up with the solution to the drive system's thrust and balancing issues, with the collective fleet admiralty breathing down one's neck, any solution would start to look good after a while. Okay, people, Mural called out. This is it. The bridge has helm control. They're executing our first burn to take us into a higher orbit. Leslie knew that every newton of thrust had been planned out in advance. The helm control on the bridge was simply executing pre-programmed burns that engineering had established. No one wanted to take any risks, all too aware that Constantine himself was likely watching a feed of the events from somewhere nearby. For a moment, she wondered where the man was. It was easy to tell he was still in the system. The Nietzscheans were constantly referring to him on the feeds. Most of the time he'd been down on Belgium in an estate called Casa Mons, though on a few occasions, he'd toured various stations and shipyards. Using Veek's intelligence network, the marauders had learned much about the movements of many high-ranking Nietzschean officials in the system, but they'd not been able to access anything that hinted at the emperor's schedule, or what sort of protections he had at Casamond. Leslie was of the opinion that Rika should simply bring the Fury Lance into low orbit over the emperor's residence and rain nukes on it until the mountain was a crater. Rika had argued that they needed to strike in a way that it would be clear that the emperor had been killed by Genevians, preferably a method that left them with an identifiable body. Her reverie was interrupted by cheers from the room below, as the main holo displays reported that the pinnacle was moving under its own power. It was just a fractional burn, but it was the first one the ship had ever made without tugs attached to the hull to steady it. The pinnacle moved to a higher orbit and began to unfold its additional hulls, then fired its engines again, all of the balance indicators staying well within acceptable parameters. Another round of cheers came from the engineers. Following that burn, the engine shut down, 
and the ship drifted for a few minutes while the teams below reviewed data and ran diagnostics, ensuring that nothing untoward had been missed. Holy shit, Jeremy, Muriel said as she clamped a hand on his shoulder, raw glee evident in her voice. It was perfect, absolutely perfect. Stars, the pinnacle performed better than in the Sims. We're going to get commendations for this. We're not over the hump yet, Jeremy replied, trying not to cringe at the Nietzschean woman's touch. We've still several more burns to do. He gestured at the pre-plotted course. Once we make it out past the half AU marker, then I'll be ready to jump for joy. Stars, dear, Annie said from his left. You did it. You figured out what the fleet design engineers back at Prusia couldn't. You've made this bird soar. Jeremy gave Muriel a mollifying look. A lot of people were involved in this. It was a team effort. Muriel laughed as she looked up at the holo. You be sure to tell them that when they ask, Jer. The engineering chief glanced around at her teams. Okay, people, let's get ready to do burn config two. We've got an emperor to impress. Looks like our friend Jeremy's thrust balancing solution is working. Nikki reported to Rika as she finally reached the entrance to the network data store. We need to hurry, though. Once they prove it out, they could distribute the updates to other ships at any point. Yeah, Rika replied with a laugh. No pressure or anything. Well, I wouldn't be too upset about it. You do really well under pressure. Damn, there's a secret that's biting me in the ass. When do you think that was a secret? Nikki asked. Rika decided to ignore her AI's jibe and reached out to Kelly and Kelly. Ready, ladies? Not yet. Kelly said. Kelly and I are trying to decide on an emblem. Sorry, what? What do we need an emblem for? Not we, Kelly corrected. Us. Kelly and I, we're obviously going to need one as the Queen's guard. Oh, for fuck's sake, would you two stop that? Right now you're the Colonel's guard, and the Colonel wants you to get off your asses and get ready to secure that watch station. Sure, on it, my, Kelly began. Don't. Rika's voice was deadly calm. She could have sworn that she heard Kelly gulp. Uh, ma'am, my ma'am, it's a new saying. Shut up, Kelly. You're saying that a lot to me lately, Rika. It's starting to hurt my feelings. Rika groaned. Damn it, just get in position. I'm breaching the chamber door. Kelly and Kelly sent nonverbal acknowledgments, for which Rika was glad, and she set to the task. Do you want a hand? Nikki asked as Rika carefully infiltrated the door's locking mechanism, looking for responses that would tell her which hardware and software versions it was running. No, I mean, no, sorry, Nikki. Why does it get you so bent out of shape when Kelly jokes about you being a queen? Rika held back a sigh. Because I'm pretty sure that she's not joking. She thinks that I should be queen of whatever, and if I let her think I'm okay with it, she's going to start getting the other mechs on board. Well, for starters, I think she's going to do that whether you push back or not. In fact, if you push back on her, she might just get more mechs on board even faster. Nikki's argument made sense and matched Kelly's behavior well. Damn it, you're right, so what do I do? Well, here's a question. Why are you fighting it so hard? What? Rika was momentarily flabbergasted by the question and lost her concentration, nearly tripping an alarmed system inside the door. She pulled back from that route and tried another. Why fight it? The AI reiterated. Well, because I really don't want to be a queen, or a president, or a prime minister, a hegemon, dictator, tyrant, big boss, head honcho, or grand freaking poobah. I want to be Rika. Even being Colonel Rika is a bit much for me. I only went along with that so I could give my mechs autonomy and not have anyone telling us what to do. The door's open, Nikki said. I know. Rika rose and took a deep breath, wishing Nikki hadn't picked that time to dig into her feelings on leadership. You should probably go inside and close it before someone walks by and wonders why the data store's door is wide open with no one around. You're so helpful. I try. Kelly and Kelly? Rika called out. I'm going in. Understood, Kelly said with an uncharacteristic formality to her voice. We'll keep close watch, Colonel Rika. 
The words, Kelly, shut up, rose in Rika's mind once more. But she quashed them down and sent a simple acknowledgement before moving into the data store and closing the door. The room was cool, not that the chill in the air bothered her and stretched for dozens of meters in every direction. Every two meters a tower rose out of the deck, laden with mounts holding either rewritable storage systems or immutable crystal storage. Damn, a haystack of haystacks, and we've got to find our needle, Rika said. This could take hours. Better not, Nikki advised. Looks like the pinnacle is on its third thrust test. We have about half an hour to find the master record and update it. Rika nodded absently as she moved to a console that stood several meters into the chamber. She connected her hard link cable to it, diving into the network, sifting through the endless information within, navigating through the Nietzschean data architecture. So you didn't really answer my question, Nikki prompted. About why I don't want to be lord and emperor? Rika asked. I thought I told you, I don't even really want to be a colonel. I don't believe you. Sure, not having to listen to dicks like Major Tim may be why you did it at first. But you forget. I see everything you do, and I can usually tell what you're feeling when you do it. You definitely like leading your marauders, and there's no doubt that they like you leading them. Rika grunted in agreement as she traversed a data matrix filled with thousands of entries for NSAI comm systems, looking for the one they wanted to update. Sure, yeah, we've built up a sense of camaraderie. We're all a part of a symbiotic organism that works together to kick Nietzsche an ass. Okay, so when you take this system, you know that it's going to need to have a government, right? The Genevia system is where you'll have to operate from for a while, while you prepare to strike at Prusia, right? Yeah, Rika replied as she found a promising entry, only to realize it was for a com NSAI only used in shuttles. Your point being? Well, who should run Genevia while all that is going on? Someone who knows what they're doing, who is ready to make a difference. There have to be tons of people out there that can do that once we defeat the needs. Oh? Nikki asked. Think so? Who would they be? Ass kissers who've been working for the enemy this past decade? People like Leader Oda? I don't disagree that there are good folks out there, but they're not used to action like you are. If they were capable of taking a leadership position, they'd be doing it right now. I think you're going to be disappointed by anyone who steps forward, at least at first. Nikki's statement pulled Rika out of her search, and she opened her eyes looking around the room, a shuddering breath passing her lips. Stars, Nikki, that's depressing. I'm just laying truth down at your feet here. We could be just a few weeks from having to make this sort of decision. An idea occurred to Rika, and she sent Nikki a grin in her mind. You know, why don't you become the queen of Genevia? You're smart, have gobs of experience, you could whip this place into shape in no time. Um, no. All humor was gone from the AI's tone. Oh. Now that the shoe is on the other foot, it's not such a welcoming thought, is it? It's not unwelcome at all. The problem is perception. Chances are that the only AIs in the Genevian system right now came with your fleet. These people are not in any position to be led by an AI. They need someone they can see someone they can rally to. You name someone else other than yourself that you would accept as a leader, and I'll back down. Rika snorted. <laughs> Easy, Tangel. Cheater, I meant for Genevia. She knew what Nikki meant, but try as she might, Rika couldn't think of anyone, barring Tremon. Of course, he didn't want the job, and there was a strong possibility that the people would outright reject him. Here's something to chew on, Nikki said. Don't think about it like you're committing to some sort of lifelong position. Instead, your job is just to hold things together until someone better suited comes along. Rika considered that mindset and found herself nodding in agreement. It was the same sort of mentality she had with her mechs. She didn't think that she was the perfect commander for her marauders. She was just the best they had available at the time. Of course, her suitability for that position was bolstered by the fact that her mech seemed to idolize her. Okay, Nikki, I can work with that rationale. Good, the data we need to alter is in that tower over there, by the way. A column ten meters away was highlighted in Rika's vision, 
and she let out a sigh. How long ago did you find it? Five minutes. Five? We've only been in here for five minutes. I know, Nikki said, laughing softly in Rika's mind. You're smart, kid, real smart. But don't forget who's been at this shit for a few dozen centuries. Okay, Nikki, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get better at it. Nothing to be sorry about it. Let's get this little seed of destruction planted. Constantine purposefully allowed a smug smile to form on his lips as he glanced at Garza. The pinnacle was just 30 seconds from completing its full thrust burn, and the ship was performing flawlessly. Prior to the day's events, the Emperor had spent some time reviewing the specs from Orion, and he could see that the pinnacle was on the cusp of outperforming the optimal numbers from the original designers. It was just more proof that Orion was old, spineless, and weak. Once Garza's people no longer possessed a technological advantage that they only held due to centuries of hiding, they would fall to Nietzsche. It was inevitable. You're to be congratulated, Garza said when he caught Constantine's eye. I'm impressed. Putting our faith in Nietzsche was not a mistake. Though the words were meant to sound complimentary, Constantine could hear the insults in them. Everything was either a near slight or cleverly worded non-praise. It was almost as though Garza was goading the emperor to take some sort of action against him. For a moment, Constantine considered it. The room was lined with his guards, and though a few members of the admiralty had been swayed by Garza's charm and promises, the vast majority placed their fealty in the right place. He could snap his fingers, and the man would be dead. Not yet, he cautioned himself willing his ire to fade away. Not until the jump gates are operational and under Nietzschean control. Congratulations, my emperor, Admiral Hammond called out a minute later as the ship completed its trials. He brought his hands together, starting a round of applause. The pinnacle is the perfect warship. Fleets of these mighty vessels will crush our enemies. The might of Nietzsche will spread across the stars. Constantine inclined his head a centimeter, acknowledging the compliment before he turned to those assembled. You've done well. Continue to serve the Empire with such fervor, and we will soon stretch across the Orion Arm. In just a month, we'll begin our assault on Septia. When they see waves of Nietzschean ships in their skies, they'll rue the day they ever join the Scipian Alliance. A cheer came from those assembled, and while it was still sounding around him, Constantine strode from the viewing chamber, Admiral Hammond keeping pace a step behind. Be sure to commend the Pinnacle's captain, Admiral Hammond. My personal regards. Of course, my emperor. Constantine smiled, basking in the glow of success, until he realized that Garza was following behind. The man didn't speak, but even his presence put a damper on the emperor's joy. Stars, can the man not leave me alone for one minute? He resolved that once he returned to Casamans, he would summon Danella and begin the transfer to his new body. He no longer cared if a hair follicle was out of place. A few minuscule imperfections would be worth it if he could free himself of the general's dominion. Garza, Constantine asked, not bothering to look over his shoulder. Now that the fleet's construction is back on schedule, will the gates finally be completed? I grow vexed that I've invested all this effort in building a great fleet that will take half a year to reach its targets without those gates. Need I remind you that we're following your plan to make a simultaneous strike across the entire Septian Alliance? I've not forgotten that, Garza replied. They'll be completed within the week. It's no small thing to set up a hundred gates in secret, but my engineers are on schedule. Constantine wondered about that. From what he understood, the enemy built their gate components elsewhere and shipped them to their destination, where they only needed to be assembled. Spies who had recently returned from Thebes confirmed this. In short, the Transcend could build gates in hours, not months. The only thing that explained Garza's delay was that either Orion's gate manufacturing site had suffered some sort of delay, or the General's engineers were actually building them from scratch within the Genevia system. Both seemed hard to believe, but it was what the evidence suggested. He didn't press the general further as they walked through the station. 
losing himself in thoughts of the dominion that would be his with the jump gate. So deep was Constantine in his thoughts of conquest that when Hammond first called out for him to drop, he didn't even realize the cry had been directed at him. Then something struck the emperor in the back, and he slammed his face into the side of a decorative fountain. Stay down, my emperor, a voice said next to his ear, and he recognized it as belonging to one of his personal guards. The sounds of weapons fire echoed all around for nearly a minute, punctuated by shouts and screams, until all at once they stopped and the guard rose, extending a hand that Constantine ignored as he climbed back to his feet. He glanced at Admiral Hammond, who was standing several meters away, chest heaving and pistol in hand. He followed the Admiral's gaze and his mouth fell open as he saw a figure writhing in an agrav suspension field. A Genevian mech? He asked, shocked to see one of his old enemies killing machines up close and personal. How did it get here? A laugh came from his left, and Constantine's head whipped around to see General Garza chuckling as he approached the mech. I lured it. That's how it got here. Constantine, the general gestured at the woman, who had grown very still at his words. Say hello to one of Tangel's little pets, a mech named Rika. Fifteen minutes prior. Rika stepped back from the data storage column, nodding with satisfaction that the crystal appeared to be completely unaltered. Checks come up good, Nikki confirmed. Unless someone brings clean source code from Nietzsche, they'll never be able to tell that it's been modified. Handy stuff, the ISF's nanotech, Rika commented. The ability to rewrite immutable crystal storage sort of Breaks one's ability to believe that anything is really true? The AI asked. Yeah, Rika replied with a laugh. Something like that. She returned to the console near the entrance and confirmed that it was in the state she'd found it and then locked the terminal down. How are things looking out there? She asked Kelly and Kelly. Safe to exit? The coast is clear, of neat at least. Are we safe from you? Kelly asked. You were getting a bit testy there. Rika sent her friend a sour-looking expression and then laughed. Yeah, we're good. Nikki talked me off the ledge. But I expect you to fall prostrate whenever you see me from now on. Uh, kidding. Kelly, I'm not going to fight whatever sort of leadership role comes my way. But no more of the queen stuff, okay? Rika eased open the door and was resealing it when the SMI finally responded. Okay, fine. I'll put a pin in it for like two months. Then we'll revisit your coronation. Stars, Kelly, I guess if that's the best I can expect. The three mechs retraced their steps through the station, Rika deducing from the feeds that Constantine was still in the viewing room observing the pinnacle's progress, or more likely celebrating its success by now. Damn, Rika, Nikki said, a note of caution in her voice. He didn't stick around for the party. The emperor is on the move. Excellent, we'll have a chance to get eyes on. See what sort of security he travels with firsthand. Are you sure? I'm sure. Rika advised Kelly and Kelly of her intentions, passing a message on to Shoshin about where they planned to intercept the Nietzschean emperor at the same fountain Rika had stopped at earlier. The concourse widened there, and there were places for Kelly and Kelly to hide on either side further down the wide passage where they could cover her. Rika already knew where she'd hide, atop a beam that stretched over the concourse, out of the way of any flying drones or other pedestrians. You sure we can't just shoot him? Kelly asked. We could just, Kelly? Rika warned. Don't make me send you back to the ship. Fine, I'll just look and see. Can I swear at him softly? Keep it inside your head, Kelly cautioned. I don't fancy getting shot to bits because you got carried away. Four minutes later, the three SMIs were in position, waiting for the emperor to pass by. I still think this seems like an unnecessary risk, Nikki said. We could have just left cameras, tapped feeds. Too late now, Rika said, as a group of heavily armored soldiers swung into view down the concourse. They were followed by a man in flowing silken robes who appeared to be lost in thought. Behind him came several high-ranking military officials and then more guards. 
There are stealth guards, too, Nikki said, highlighting a dozen figures who were barely visible, even with Rika sensors. Guy travels in style, Rika said. I wonder what sort of uniform that guy's wearing. It looks... Without warning, the six soldiers in the lead lifted their rifles and fired their rail guns at the beam where Rika was crouched. Fuck, she called out while leaping backward, high-velocity pellets striking her armor in a dozen places. Before she even hit the ground, electron beams were lancing down the corridor from Kelly and Kelly's positions, striking the neats and driving them back. For a moment, Rika thought the enemy would retreat, but then a heavy kinetic slug hit her left arm, ripping the armor plating off, then another hit her thigh just below the end of the organic section, pulverizing the side of her leg. Shit, what are they firing? Nikki was screaming for Rika to keep falling back when suddenly she felt her body rise in the air while her GNR was yanked straight down until it touched the deck. She tried to wrench it free, but her entire body moved instead, writhing in the grip of an agrav field that felt like a giant's fist squeezing her to death. Shit, I can't get a nanocloud out, Nikki said. It just gets pushed back. Suddenly, Rika realized that no weapons fire was coming from Kelly and Kelly, and that the combat net had cut out. She looked behind herself and saw that a blast door was sliding down, trapping her with the emperor and his soldiers. Can you get Nano down the GNR's barrel? Maybe we can. Rika's question died on her lips as a soldier tossed three burn sticks, one after the other onto her GNR, the thermite compound eating through her weapons firing systems and melting the mount. Then one of the Nietzschean heavy gunners fired on her weapon mount, shattering it and sending Rika flying upward, where she slowly spun in the field's grip. As she rotated above the deck, forcing herself to calm and take stock of her situation, she heard the man in the strange uniform speak to the emperor, Say hello to one of Tangel's little pets, a mech named Rika. Fuck, how does he know? Rika asked. News of your attacks could have reached Genevia by now. I mean about Tangel. You know, that might be an Orion Guard uniform. Shit! Rika strained to grab her AC-9CR, and the Orion General took a step forward, shaking his head. I'd rather have you alive, Rika. But if you grab your rifle... These fine folks will all open fire. You've some impressive armor, but trust me, you won't last a minute. Rika, Nikki warned. Bide your time, not now. Yeah, okay. Rika replied as she let the field pull her arm back down, hoping that Kelly and Kelly got away safely. Emperor Constantine, the man said as he turned away from Rika. You should direct your people on the pinnacle to arrest two engineers named Jeremy and Annie. They were the ones to solve the issues with the ship's engines. However, they also planted a back door in the system that will allow them to destroy the ship, plus any other craft the NSAI upgrades are installed on. Who the fuck are you? Rika yelled, realizing that somewhere along the line she'd been played and had run headlong into a trap. Why, my dear Rika, I'm surprised your tangel didn't tell you about me. My name is General Garza, of the Orion Freedom Alliance. Rika tried to shrug, but the agrav field had tightened further, and she could barely manage the movement. You must not have been a big enough deal to mention, Garza. Yeah, he winked. I get that a lot. We should kill her, Constantine said as he approached cautiously. Those things are monsters. Oh, she'll die soon enough, the general said with a nod. But unless I'm wrong, this mech has ISF nanotech, and her ships have stasis shields. Our little Rika here is a prize unlike any other. Rika, we're in deep shit. Nikki almost sputtered the words. You need to call Tangel. Yeah, right, on it. Rika activated her Quancom system. Tangel, I need help, bad. There was no response. Escape. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location. Capeton Command. Capeton. Region. Genevia System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. Shit, shit, shit. 
Kelly swore as she rushed toward the blast door, reaching it a second after it closed. Kelly, they got Rika. She turned to see Kelly standing in the middle of the concourse, partially visible due to scoring on her armor. The mech's GNR barrel was resting on the deck, and her shoulders were stooped. Fuck! Kelly swore again, running back to her teammate. Kelly, are you hit? I, no. Well, yeah, but Rika. Shoshin, where are you? Kelly called out, hoping their emergency channel was still secure. Shuttle's out of the bay. Coming around to a point near you for pickup. Get to deck 82. Where's Rika? They got her, Kelly cried out. It was a trap, Kelly added. Kelly, we have to move this way. At first, Kelly didn't even stir. But then Kelly grabbed her arm and pulled hard, almost toppling the other mech over. We have to regroup, she said, dragging her across the concourse. Gotta figure out where they took her. Then get word to Chase and Heather. Launch a full assault, something, but move, damn it. Kelly finally seemed to shake free of whatever had her riveted in place and nodded, following Kelly as she ran to the door that led to a maintenance shaft. Come on, I can hear them closing on us. She was watching the engineering teams pass around drinks and flasks as they congratulated one another, when something suddenly seemed wrong to Leslie. It was a slight change in the room's atmosphere, a tiny dimming in the excitement. Then she spotted it. Two Nietzschean MPs had just entered through a door on the port side, while three had come through on the starboard end of the room. Jeremy, Annie, I want you to slowly move toward my position, nice and easy. Why? Jeremy asked, while Annie said, Where's your position? Shit. Leslie thought and passed a marker to the pair. Don't look toward me, just chat or talk to people, but come this way. The MPs were just wearing regular ship uniforms, which meant they were lightly armored. Helmets rested on their heads, but the face shields were pulled up as they moved through the crowd, closing on Jeremy and Annie. Sucks to be you guys, Leslie thought as she took aim at the two MPs on the port side. She released a slow breath and pulled the trigger, then shifted a centimeter and pulled it again. The pair of soldiers crumpled, each shot through the eye. Leslie slid off the cabinets and dropped to the deck, gliding through the crowd as carefully as she dared, but not worrying about bumping the odd person as she moved toward the two engineers in her charge. Okay, stay close, she said once they met up. We're heading to the port exit, There's a networking closet down the hall to the right. That's where we're going. Why? Jeremy asked. What's going on? Nietzsche and military police are here for you. I can only guess that somehow they found out about you. Or something. I'm not going to let them capture you to ask, okay? Jeremy nodded, and Annie took his hand, pulling him through the crowd. Her touch caused him to stumble, a look of near fear coming over the engineer and he struggled to keep up as they passed by a group of his teammates who stopped talking to stare at the pair. Annie glanced back at Jeremy and gave an encouraging smile. A little special reward for all your hard work, one of the men called out. Booyah! And Jeremy proceeded to turn beet red. Just keep moving, Leslie said. No need for subterfuge now. They skirted the crowd that had formed around the two downed MPs, making it to the door just as an alarm blared and the exit began to close. Come on, Leslie called out, get a move on. She reached the door and threw a shoulder into it, slowing it just long enough for the two engineers to get through before the portal slid shut. She turned to see the pair rushing toward the networking closet. Jeremy held the door open for Annie and then stood looking around for Leslie. Go in, I'm here, she assured him. He ducked inside, and she followed, pulling the door closed behind her. What the hell is going on? Jeremy asked. Were those guards dead? Sure hope so, Leslie said as she materialized before them. Strip fast. What? Jeremy asked as Annie pulled down the fastener on her ship suit. Naked, Leslie insisted. Fast, go. He complied albeit sluggishly. 
By the time he was still only half done, Annie was buck naked and giving Leslie a curious look. What next, Les? Leslie reached into a pouch on her lower back and pulled out a small canister. Press this against your sternum. Annie complied and gave a small gasp as the cylinder began to melt against her skin, flowing across her body, coating it in a matte gray material. What the hell is this stuff? She asked, and Jeremy glanced at her, blushing at her half-naked body. Stars, Jeremy, Leslie muttered. You need to chill out. Here's yours. She glanced back at Annie, who was looking a little concerned as the coating moved up her neck. It's flow armor, like what my skin is made out of. Wait, your skin is made out of this stuff? Jeremy asked as he held his canister to his chest. A better version, but yeah. It has about as much protection as light armor. Better against beam weapons than kinetics. You'll have the same stealth capabilities I do as well. Though you don't have nanocloud tech, so your audible stealth won't be as good as mine. How? Annie began to say but suddenly closed her mouth and eyes as the armor flowed up over her face. It's okay, Leslie explained. It's not going to go inside you, though it's going to coat your eyeballs, which always feels strange. Okay, Jeremy said as he watched Annie disappear. This stuff's amazing. Can we keep it? Let's just worry about staying alive for now. A minute later, a pair of Nietzschean soldiers yanked the door open, swept the barrels of their rifles side to side as they checked over the empty space within, and then closed the door. Okay, Leslie said to the two engineers, whose pulses had risen dramatically. They'll be more, but I have probes out in the passage. When it's clear, we'll slip out. Won't the door opening be on the feet? Annie asked. If it was, they'd have caught us in here, Leslie said with a wink. I tapped all their sensors and objects in this corridor before the test run, just to be on the safe side. However, once we're further along, we'll have to be careful. Where are we going? Jeremy asked. Do you know what's happened? No. She shook her head. Somehow, the Neats got wind of you two, though. Did you tell anyone else about what you were up to? No. Jeremy replied emphatically. Annie is the only person I've ever talked about this with. Same here, Annie said. Well, other than my resistance contact, Wendy, and she would have only told Veek. Okay, we'll have to look into that later, Leslie said. Coast is clear, let's get out of here. What about our stuff? Jeremy asked, glancing at the two ship suits tucked behind one of the equipment racks. I don't think you'll be working for Capeton Shipyards anymore, Leslie replied. And remember, don't link to anything but the combat net I've set up. You can't swap items on your link. So the moment you connect, they're going to know where you are. You can do that? Just swap items? Annie asked. Damn, must be nice to have the good stuff. I've been doing shit like this for longer than you've been alive. Leslie opened the door, and the two engineers filed out, moving down the hall to the marker Leslie had set. So where are we going? Jeremy asked again. There's a bay 15 decks down on the port side, Leslie replied. A team is there waiting for us. We just have to go nice and slow. Heather's eyes grew wide as she turned toward Chase. They got Rika. What? He instantly forgot what he was doing and strode toward the captain. She passed him the calm message that had just been relayed through the Undaunted. It was from Shoshan. Kelly and Kelly are en route to Egress. They got cut off from Rika, saw her captured by Constantine. It was a trap. Shit, Chase muttered, feeling a tightness form in his chest. If that was a trap, Heather nodded vigorously. Then we have to assume that it was leaked from the resistance. Who knew that Rika was going to be on Capeton Command? Chase placed a hand on the console, trying to order his thoughts when all he wanted to do was tell Heather to fly the Fury Lance to Capeton and fire on everything inside until they turned Rika over. Veek, Lieutenant Gary, probably everyone on Gary's team, Chase said. It was pretty clear that this was a critical part of the plan. He looked up at Heather, meeting her eyes. Shit, I, what do we do? 
We have to assume that the Neats know everything, Potter said, her tone filled with worry, but still somehow focused. Our ships, the back door into the drive systems, the NSAI Rico is adding everything. Then our plan to take out most of the Nietzschean fleet has failed, Heather said, a long sigh slipping past her lips. Those fuckers, we were so close. We need to call Admiral Carson, Chase said. Get a fleet of ISF ships on Rika's position. We'll get her out and still take out the Emperor. Then we'll slug it out with the rest of the Neats the old-fashioned way. May I propose an alternative? Piper asked, his sober tone carrying an uncommon note of urgency. Fire away, Heather said as she strode to the main hollow, pulling up the fastest route for the lands to reach Capeton. We should advise Carson to be ready, but not to come just yet. Remember, Rika has a direct line to Tangel, and from what Silva has told us, Tangel can use jump gates without a starship. She could already be on her way to rescue the colonel. Chase gulped a deep breath, mentally chastising himself for forgetting that. Okay, right, but I'm still not going to sit back and trust that Tangel can drop everything to save Rika. We're still going to Capeton. I've just sent out orders for all our ships to switch to backup items that we didn't get from the resistance, Heather said. So far from what I can tell, no one's been fired on, but with light lag, Chase nodded. Rika's plan had placed marauder ships all over the Genevia system. The idea being that when they began to attack, the Neats would all make their best speed to the marauder ships, and that would trigger the engine failures. However, the dispersal also meant that the smaller marauder ships, particularly the destroyers, would be vulnerable if enough of the enemy converged on them. There's activity on the pinnacle, Potter said and Chase noted that the massive ship was only a quarter AU from the Fury Lands. What sort of activity? He asked. The good kind, Piper said. They're hunting for Jeremy and Annie. They seem almost frantic. Heather looked at Chase, their eyes meeting as the ship's captain smiled. Then they know about the vulnerability, just not exactly what it is. Damn, Chase whispered. If we can trigger the update then we can still take out the fleet. I don't see how we could pull that off. There's no way they've even loaded it up for deployment at this point, Potter said. It could still happen, Piper countered. I could force it. How? Heather asked. We need to get to Capeton Command. So long as Rika's update is still in the data store, I can force it in Jeremy's update to propagate. I've spent enough time in Nietzschean networks. I know I can do it. Okay, send the message, Chase said to Heather. Tell them to get to the data store and secure it. If I were the neats, I'd be offlining that thing yesterday. Rika watched with impotent rage as the neats erected a mobile frame around her, complete with powerful agrav generators that continued to hold her suspended in midair when they switched off the ones hidden in the concourse. During the process, the Orion general prowled around her cage, an almost feral grin on his face. The Nietzschean emperor stood further back, watching with a dispassionate expression on his face. She'll be quite the prize, Garza said as the cage lifted off the deck. I'm looking forward to bringing her back. Nowhere, the emperor cut Garza off. You'll not bring her anywhere. Rika is a prisoner of the Nietzschean empire. Captured by me, Garza countered, turning to glare at Constantine. I saw my guards shooting at her in my station, the emperor replied. Yes, you gave them orders without my authorization, but it's a slight I'm willing to overlook. I'll even share what we learned from our mech here, but you're not going to whisk her off to Orion, only to dole out what you've acquired in dribs and drabs. You know, Rika called out. If you're not sure what to do with me, you can just let me go. I wouldn't want to cause a lover's spat to flare up here. Garza tossed a sour look her way, then turned back to the emperor, the pair now staring silently at one another. And now they're on the link instead, Nikki said. You should have let them continue to fight. I guess so. I kind of wanted to see if I could get them to start really going at it. 
I get the feeling that they both have leverage on the other, but neither's willing to test it out just yet. I agree. Let's not get them to go nuclear on one another while we're a few meters away, though. Have you finished the diagnostics on the Quancom? Rika asked. I swear, when Tangel wants to interrupt my sleep, it works great, but when I need her, poof, nothing. I'm just finishing up now. Our side hasn't gone out of whack. From what I can tell, we're just not getting anything from Tangel. Sure sucks that those final updates from Cardin burned out our entanglement with them. Rika nodded absently, still more worried that something had happened to Tangel, wondering what could possibly have knocked her out of communication. The whole idea behind quantum entanglement was that it worked anywhere in the universe. Tangel shouldn't be able to go anywhere it wouldn't connect. You're fretting, I can tell, Nikki said. Well, yeah. Oh, we're starting to move. I wonder where they're taking us. And I'm stressed about Tangel. What if she's been killed? Nikki snorted. Don't talk nonsense. Tangel's about as likely to be killed as, well, something really unlikely. She probably just had her internal blade get shot out. From what I hear, she gets shot a lot. Besides, Kelly and Kelly got away. The guards are talking about the hunt for them still being on. If they got away, then the message is probably already out. And once it gets to the lands, they'll call Cardin with their Quancom blades. Tangel will still get word. You're right, Rika said as she watched the bulkhead slide by. I need to focus on getting out of here and killing Constantine, plus this other douchebag. What happened to no suicide runs? Well, we're kinda already in a precarious situation. I don't think killing either of these two fools would make it much worse. Nikki laughed. No, I suppose not. Rika didn't speak for a moment, considering her options, then said, Thanks, by the way. For what? Not saying I told you so? The AI sent a languid wink into Rika's mind. You're welcome. Though I might have thought it to myself. Well, gee, now I take the thank you back. You can't. It's mine now. Leslie crept up behind the Nietzschean soldier and grabbed his head, giving it a sharp twist to the left, snapping his neck, while also driving an EM spike into the base of his skull to ensure no alert was sent out. Shit, Jeremy whispered. That's brutal. I'm trying to conserve Nano, Leslie replied. I used a lot getting through those sealed bulkheads. They've locked the ship down like they think we killed Constantine. Wouldn't that be nice? Annie said with a soft laugh. Well, it is on the docket. Leslie pulled the soldier's body behind a crate and peered out into the corridor. Okay, I think we're clear. Wow, Jeremy said. You really are bent on killing the Nietzschean emperor. Kinda why we came here. Well, we were coming here anyway. But we moved the Genevia system up on the schedule to take a swing at him. Any sentimental whistle. You marauders really think you'll be able to do this? This? Leslie asked as they crept down a corridor, now just a short distance from their destination. Yeah, free Genevia. Well, we're focused more on defeating Nietzsche. Jeremy laughed, and Leslie could hear a faint sound come from him. Jer, keep it in your head. Sorry, I don't normally slip up like that. He apologized. It's okay, this time. So, what's the difference? Annie asked. Leslie paused at an intersection, waiting for two soldiers and a servitor pushing a lunch cart to pass by. Difference between what? Freeing Genevia and defeating Nietzsche. Well, the soldiers and servitor had moved past the intersection, and Leslie moved on. Freeing Genevia implies that it's still captive. Some parts of Genevia are just Nietzsche now. Some will never want to rejoin. Freeing Genevia is really a rebuilding, and that can't happen until Nietzsche is defeated. Maybe. I don't know, kind of talking out of my ass here. Interesting take. Jeremy's tone was pensive. I suppose I get that. I hope you do both with the Genevia system itself, though. Well, that's the plan here, Leslie said, so long as something didn't go terribly wrong. She pulled up short, 
not paying attention to the engineer's response. Her drones had just made it to the bay where their ride off the pinnacle awaited. It was surrounded by a squad of neat. Her probe established a line of sight comm link with the shuttle and relayed it back to her. Corporal Yig, you still in there? The RR-4 sent back a strained laugh. Yeah, like bees bottled up in a hive. We didn't want to start a shitstorm until you got here, Captain. Makes sense. Just this squad of neat? Looks like it. The base defense turrets haven't been installed yet, which is why they're all doing impersonations of security drones. Leslie breathed a sigh of relief. She wasn't too worried about automated turrets. She could avoid them with ease. Her charges were a different story. She considered her options and was about to ask her engineers for ideas when the bay doors began to close. Shit, Captain, Yig said, going from bad to worse. Should we just come out shooting? I think if we start a firefight, the shuttle won't fare too well, Yig. It's our only way out of here, and it has the idents to sneak past the neat. There are always other shuttles. Leslie rolled her eyes. Just hold tight, Corporal. Yes, Captain. She signaled her two charges to keep following and moved down the passage to the bay's entrance. Once there, she ensured that there were no neats nearby and slipped inside, crouching behind a stack of crates that were labeled as turret gimbals. Ironic, she noted. Okay, she said to the engineers. We need to distract most of those soldiers away from the shuttle so we can get aboard. We also need to keep them distracted enough that the bay doors opening back up won't have them firing on the shuttle in two seconds. You know, Annie drew the word out, those crates on the far side of the bay are the turrets themselves. From what I heard down in engineering, the Neats have been shipping them with reserve charge cylinders installed. A bit dangerous, but useful. Can you get them rolling? Leslie asked. Sure, going to take me a minute, though. I'll see if I can make them start firing. But they might just explode and light on fire. Leslie laughed. I think either of those will do. I'll get the bay doors. I'll do those, Jeremy volunteered. They're not on the ship net yet, and the control panel is on the far side of the shuttle from Annie's crates. Jer, Leslie was tempted to cuff the man. I told you not to go on the ship net. How? I didn't. There's a sign hanging by the door. She turned and looked at the entrance they'd just come through. Sure enough, a sign hanging next to it had instructions directing personnel to use the far panel if they wanted to get the bay doors open. Uh, okay, sorry about that. No problem. You just keep an eye on us, he replied. I don't fancy getting shot in the back by a neat. Leslie was about to ask him why that was a prevalent concern. But then she realized he was more worried about Annie than himself. Okay, you two. Our rally point is next to that rear cradle strut. If that's blocked by neats, then we'll meet over by the closest bulkhead. I'll provide cover for you. The two engineers signaled their affirmation and moved off. Leslie carefully climbed atop the stack of gimbals and unslung her rifle while passing an update to Yig. They grow up so fast, the corporal sent back in a mock mournful tone. Just be ready to get the door open and cover them, she replied. We're good, Yig said. Goob's ready to open fire with the shuttle's turrets, and Cole and Fiona are stacked up. What are you doing? Leslie asked as she saw Annie's marker reach the crates of turrets, several of which had been conveniently opened. I'm supervising, Captain. Leslie could imagine the grin Yig wore. That's my job, isn't it? She didn't give a reply as she watched an access panel open on one of the uncrated turrets as Annie got to work. Checking Jeremy's location, she saw that he was already on the far side of the dock at the panel. Satisfied that the engineers had reached their targets, Leslie began to wonder why the soldiers surrounding the shuttle weren't yet doing anything other than staring at it. A moment later, a scuffle came from behind her and she turned to see a group of neats pushing a rather large plasma cutter on a grav pad into the bay. Well, shit. Okay in there, the squad sergeant standing at the bow of the shuttle called out. Time's up. Say hello to our little can opener. How long are your little diversions going to take out there? Yeg asked. Because if you're worried about damage to the shuttle, 
that thing's really going to mess it up. Annie, you've got about 45 seconds to make something go boom. Wow, soldiering is just like being an engineer, pulling off miracles on unrealistic timelines. Sure is, Leslie replied. But the dire consequences for failure are a lot more immediate. Okay, 20 seconds, then I'm running and hoping. Just don't get blown up, Jeremy added. Wouldn't dream of it. Leslie carefully slid off her perch and followed the group of Nietzscheans pushing the plasma cutter. She eyed the thing, wondering if she could do something to impede it, when she saw that the cover of the emergency cutoff switch was flipped up. Well, well. Sliding in between the Nietzscheans, she reached out and toggled it off. The agrav pad shut down and the whole thing hit the deck with a resounding thud, one of the Neats howling in pain. My foot, what the fuck? Shit, the E-cut got flipped. Flip it back, you moron. Two of the soldiers came over to investigate, and Leslie backed away, rifle held ready. If Annie's explosion didn't go off in time, shooting the plasma cutter in its magpod might just... An electron beam flashed in the far corner, burning a hole in the overhead before more beams slashed out, firing in every direction. Oh, shit, Annie exclaimed. I didn't set it to spin around. Leslie was about to admonish the woman to run, but Annie was already sprinting across the bay, her body faintly visible as the flow armor struggled to keep up with her rapid motion in the now ionized bay air. Then an explosion rocked the deck, sending the wildly firing turret soaring through the air to land on the plasma cutter, where it burned a hole in one of the niche before exploding. At the same time, the bay doors began to open. Shit, you two aren't bad, Leslie said, as she rushed to the docking strut, making it there a moment before the pair of engineers. She checked the bay, surprised to see that all of the soldiers, barring the two who were standing next to the shuttle sealed door, had run toward the plasma cutter and exploding crates. Leslie was about to signal Yig to open up when the shuttle's door did just that. Fiona and Cole leaned out, both firing electron beams at the remaining two soldiers. Your chariot awaits, the corporal called out as Leslie and her charges ran for the entrance. Gotta love prompt service, Leslie replied with a laugh. A second later, they were safely inside, and the craft was lifting off. Jeremy disabled his stealth systems, a cheek-splitting grin on his face as he reached out for Annie, finding her arm and clasping it firmly. Stars, now that was fun. A trip. Stellar date 05.07.8950, adjusted years. Location, Capeton Command, Capeton. Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika worked to keep herself calm as she was transferred to a large shuttle, and then to a ship she assumed was the Belgara. Certainly the most ornate shuttle bay I've ever been in, she thought as her cage was pulled from the shuttle and set down on the deck. An entire platoon of Nietzschean soldiers surrounded it, though neither Garza or Constantine came to check on her. She felt a little put out that they were leaving her alone in the bay, but decided that it was preferable to having to look at either of them or have them look at her like she was some sort of hunting prize. Where do you think they're taking us? She asked Nikki. Well, hopefully not to Prusia, the AI replied. I don't think either of us are ready for a jaunt into the heart of the Nietzschean Empire yet. Agreed. But it's either there or Casamans on Belgium. I suspect that Constantine wants to keep us close either way. Nikki didn't respond. Andrika watched as an engineer entered the bay and inspected the cage before making some adjustments and chastising the soldiers for messing up one of the fields. Damn, too bad they didn't mess it up just a bit more, Rika commented. Uh, yeah, Nikki said, clearly distracted. Rika? Someone else in here you could be talking to? She asked with a soft laugh. Right, I want to tell you about a conversation I had with Bob before he left the I-2. Rika whistled aloud. The sound was barely audible from within her helmet, but two of the guards turned to face her nonetheless. Sorry, guys, was just trying to entertain myself with a jaunty tune. Got any good vids or anything? Stupid Neve, one of the soldiers said, shaking his head before turning away. 
Funny how our names for one another are so similar, Rika said to Nikki. Oh, sorry, so what did Bob tell you? Well, he sort of hinted that you and I have the same potential as Tannis. What, to merge? Rika asked, feeling a sliver of panic rise in her. Sorry, no, that's why I said Tannis, not Tannis and Angela. Bad explanation. In a nutshell, you're capable of ascension as am I, but separately, unless we choose otherwise, I suppose. Rika barked a laugh, not caring that the Nietzsche could hear her. Wow, Nikki, that's quite the thing to drop on a girl. Just a, hey, if you want, you can become a transdimensional being. Well, you pushed me to spit it out, Nikki countered. I what? You volunteered it. I meant by being captured. Nikki's tone carried a note of sarcasm, and Rika wondered if the AI was angry. She decided not to dig into that, wanting to know more about the bomb Nikki had dropped on her. Seriously, though, Bob told you that we could ascend? That's nuts. Interesting, though. I wonder what it's like. Nikki let out a burst of nervous laughter, which turned into a sigh. Rika, you're amazing. I've been sitting on this knowledge for months, stewing about it, being generally terrified by it, and in a few minutes you've accepted it and are wondering what it would be like. Well, Rika paused, wondering why that was. Maybe it's because I'm young, and my life has just been a constant stream of change, while you're super old and stuck in your ways. Nikki sent an image of her avatar sticking out her tongue. Gee, you have such a way with words. It's a gift, Nikki. So what is ascension, really? Do you have any concrete idea? Do we turn into ghosts? Nikki explained what she knew of the process, of the AIs who had ascended during the sentience wars, and the effort that was made to destroy them. From there, the conversation shifted to how ascending manifested, the pair going over what they knew of Tangel's journey and what they'd seen her do in Jersey City on Pira. Stars, I wish I could do that right now, Rika said. Just burn a hole in this damn ship and get out of here. I wonder how Tangel does it. Does she see Adams? How's that even possible? I think Tangel is rather physically evolved compared to us, Nikki replied. Probably also helps that she's old, which you are as well, Rika interjected. Right, well, reaching out and doing things is different for me than it is for you. You spend all of your time in tactile contact with things. I rarely consider what it's like to directly manipulate objects. What are you getting at? Rika asked. Well, I wonder if you can see into graviton emitters and maybe reach out and turn them off. The EM field, too, while you're at it. Rika almost giggled at the absurdity of Nikki's statement. Right, yeah, I'll just peer through space-time into the insides of a graviton emitter and switch it off. Nikki joined Rika in her laughter. Yeah, you're right. I don't even know if Tangel can do things like that, or if she can, how long it took her to manage it. Rika closed her eyes and shut off the 360 vision from her helmet. I'm going to try to see if I can manage anything. Who knows, maybe it's easy. Despite her words, Rika hadn't fully convinced herself that the whole situation wasn't utterly ridiculous. Tangel was an incredible woman who had been through countless trials and tribulations. For Rika to be able to achieve even a sliver of ascension at 30 years of age seemed impossible. All the same, she had no desire to be sliced up by Constantine scientists, so trying anything was preferable to that, no matter how crazy it sounded. She slowed her breathing, letting herself feel everything around her. Her synthetic skin, the armor latched tightly to it, her mechanical limbs, the pistons, rods, carbon fiber bones within her body. She allowed herself to simply feel every part of herself. As she did, a strange feeling came over her, a feeling she didn't recall ever experiencing before. It's almost as though my mind is filling my entire body, pushing at the edges. The sensation was surreal, but as soon as it came over her, Rika doubted that it had to do with ascension. It was just a trick her mind was playing on her, 
as she calmed down in the wake of the fight on Capeton Command and her capture. Still, she felt like if she tried, she could push her perception of self beyond the physical bounds of her body. Stars, I feel like someone who's into magical nonsense. What I really need is an arm with an E-beam tucked into it. Then I could just shoot the shit out of these grab generators and get out. None of this ascension nonsense. Hey, get her loaded back into the shuttle, a voice called out. And Rika's concentration was broken, visuals from her helmet flooding back into her mind. What? One of the soldiers asked. Why'd we take her out of the shuttle in the first place? Because you were ordered to, Lieutenant. Now put her back in. Rika saw that the new arrival was a major. And as the soldiers began to remove the stays holding her cage to the deck, he approached and stood arms akimbo, staring at her with an unblinking gaze. You've got guts, Mick, I'll give you that. That might be the closest anyone has gotten to the emperor in some time. He's not happy about it. But from what I hear, he's blaming General Garza. I should have taken a shot, Rika muttered. You'd be dead if you had, the major said, though I suppose you might wish you were before long. Rika didn't reply, and the man turned and walked out of the bay after another minute of staring. Ten minutes later, her cage was back in the shuttle, and twenty minutes after that, she heard a muted thrum as the craft took off. Well, I guess this is good news, Nikki said. What, that we're off to meet our fate and I can't seem to magically ascend? The AI laughed. I think you need to update your definition of good news. I was referring to the fact that we must be heading down to Belgium. Oh, yeah, I figured that was the case. Better than going to Prusia to get dissected, I suppose. No one's getting dissected. You know your marauders are going to move planets to come after you. Rika pursed her lips, a part of her hoping they would, but another part wishing that she'd not been such an idiot about wanting to take a look at the emperor. If any of her mechs died because of her foolish curiosity, she would never forgive herself. Plan of attack. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Fury Lance. Capeton Command, Capeton. Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Yes, that's exactly what I'm transporting, Heather said to the Nietzschean commander operating Capeton Command's STC. I have clearance for close approach to CC. I don't know why you're fighting me on this. We're on lockdown, Captain Mary. I can't let you transfer your cargo. Heather pressed the heel of her right hand against her temple, feeling like she was talking to a bulkhead. Sir, I understand that I can't transfer, but I need to move on to my close approach vector so I can transfer when your lockdown is cleared up. I can't allow that either. We have to clear our near space. You'll need to move into Capeton High Orbit. Sir, please. Capeton Outer Orbital Control is denying all holding orbits, only allowing people to transfer in or out. I'm already low on fuel. If I have to move out to L2, I'm going to have to refuel before I come back in. If that happens, my CO's gonna chew a hole in my ass so large you could fly my ship through it. A few seconds of silence stretched out before the STC commander finally replied, Okay, fine. I know Admiral Bentley can be a pain in the ass. No further than the close approach marker. Got it? I'm passing you a vector in a holding position. Stay in it until our lockdown is cleared, or I'm going to file that you're violating STC orders. Stars, thank you, thank you, Heather exclaimed. Captain Mary out. The STC responded to the sign-off, and Heather straightened, blowing out a long breath and catching Chief Ona's eye. You should have gone into vids and sims, Ona said. You're one hell of a bullshitter. Years of military experience put to good use, Heather replied, thinking of all the pranks she'd pulled under her superior's noses in the past. You got the vector? Locked and loaded, Ona gestured at her holo display. Shall I bring us in? Heather nodded. Make it so, chief. Ona initiated the burns, and the captain turned to the main holo tank where Chase stood, arms crossed and a scowl on his brow as he looked at the mess of ships moving around Capeton. Silva and Barn were next to him, similar expressions on their faces, though they were also casting worried looks in his direction. The Belgara is breaking orbit from Capeton, 
he said as Heather approached. Looks like they're going to Belgium. Good, that's good, she said, and Silva nodded in agreement. Beats the hell out of an out system, Victor, Barn added. Sure, Chase nodded. I'm gonna keep telling myself that, too. If I knew Tangel was coming for Rika, I'd be fine. But Alliance Command at Cardin just got back to us. No one knows where she is. Heather felt her blood pressure rise. Shit, the field marshal is missing? That can't be good. I got the impression that everyone over there is worried, but not so much that they're scrapping ops. Chase glanced at Heather with a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Admiral Carson's fleet is still queued up, ready to roll. She nodded soberly and put a hand on his shoulder. Chase, you have to go after her then. I'll manage things up here. Heather, I... Captain Heather, everyone. Colonel Borden's voice came from behind them, and the pair turned to see the ISF Marine striding onto the bridge. I just got word about Tangel. We need to go after Rika ourselves. I was just saying that to Chase, Heather replied. Chase nodded. Okay, I just didn't want it to seem like I was playing favorites. It's not favorites, Leslie said as she followed Borden onto the bridge, all but running toward the group at the holo tank. There's not a single marauder that would accuse you of it either. Hell no, Chief Garth called out for emphasis. You need to get the colonel. Agreed. Silva said as she surveyed the group. However, the Fury Lance needs to stay here so Piper can do his thing. Chase, if you can catch a shuttle to the Undaunted, Ferris can take your team down. We'll need to bring over more dropships, though. He- We don't need more dropships. Colonel Borden laughed as he folded his arms across his chest. We have a Star Crusher. What? Chase asked. That's on the Lance, and we don't have time to transfer it. It's not. Heather shook her head. Bondo's building two new ones on the Lance, so to make room, they move the original over to Ferris's ship. Well, I'll be, Chase muttered. Sounds like we have a plan. No, you have the beginnings of a plan, Barn grunted. M Company's first platoon, barring Shoshin's team, is aboard the Lance. Take them on the dropships and Borden's Marines can ride in the Star Crusher. Bring the ship in close and fast and smash through their orbital defenses. Pile driver. Silva said with a grin. I like it. Wish like hell I could go down with you. Next time. Borden placed a hand on her shoulder, and Heather couldn't help but notice that he squeezed it gently before letting go. You sure? Chase asked, looking from Silva to Barn. Your hammer fallen basilisk. You should be there too. Chase, Barn grunted, gesturing at the holo tank. Since the CO is gone, Silva and I have to manage the assault on Captain Command to get Kelly's team off safely, plus a thousand other things. Right. Silva elbowed Barn. I'm heading over to make sure we get our boys and girls home. I'm not leaving Kelly behind again. A minute later, only Barn, Garth, and Ona remained with Heather on the bridge. Damn, just like that, Barn muttered. Heather snorted. I think what you mean is, ah. Peace and quiet. Kelly, Kelly cried out. There's a whole fucking squad coming down on your six. I know, on my last four nades. Hope it's enough to slow them down. The SMI called back, barely visible to Kelly in the smoke that filled the passage that ran in front of the secure data store. Anything from Shoshin? No, they've killed the link down here, and the EMPs from all the electron beams had fried my relays. No sooner had Kelly replied than she saw a pair of neats move into the end of the passage she was covering. They were each holding heavy CFT shields as they leapfrogged down the corridor. She leaned out of the alcove she was crouched in and took stock of their movement, looking for a time when something vital was exposed. Damn, they're careful bastards. Unlike Kelly, she was already out of grenades and with the smoke filling the corridor, she'd only make it a few meters before they picked up on her movement. Her gaze rose to the pipes that ran along the passage. Unfortunately, none carried anything volatile that she could rupture and spray down on the needs. But what if I get up there? Kelly decided it was worth a shot. She might be able to get close enough to fire over the neat shields, or maybe drop down behind them and take them out the old-fashioned way. A series of dull wumps came from the far end of the corridor, and Kelly reported in. Okay, that sent them scurrying. 
One more nade. Once you use it, we fall back to the entrance, Kelly said. That's a last-ditch move, Kelly retorted. You fall back, you hear? If you can't keep them at bay, it'll be their nades rolling around the corner, or something worse. Kelly didn't reply, but Kelly knew she'd follow orders when the time came. Pushing the fear of imminent death from her mind with a callous laugh, Kelly activated her stealth and leaped up to the pipes. She clamped her feet and right hand on them, carefully working her way toward the two heavily armored neats who were still leapfrogging their way down the passage. She was almost far enough to get a good angle with her GNR when one of the soldiers looked up and cocked his head. Ah, oh, fuck. She took aim and fired, but the neat ducked down before she could hit him. His partner slid his weapon through his firing slot and was taking aim at Kelly as she scurried back, when suddenly a bloody fountain erupted from behind the neat CFT shield, followed by another spray of gore from behind the second one. A ragged sigh of relief came from Kelly as Shoshin came around the corner, a trail of smoke coming from the RPG launcher on his shoulder. Kelly, what are you doing up there? Shut up, Shoshin, and fuck thanks. Anytime, the AM-4 said, before turning to gesture to someone behind the corner. A moment later, Chief Lara appeared, and Kelly coughed in surprise. She'd completely forgotten about the woman. I couldn't leave her on the shuttle, Shoshin explained. Too many neats around. It is a neat station, Kelly reminded him as she dropped from the pipes. Any word? Lara, get down to the data store. You'll be safe in there, Shoshin said before replying to Kelly. The Lance is moving in so Piper can do his thing. Silva's prepping an exfil team for us. We're in good hands. Lara can tap the network from within the data store, and then we'll be back in communication. Well, gee. Kelly called out from her end of the passageway. Isn't it all just sunshine and roses back there? Show, can you stop John with Kelly and come fire your boomstick at my party crashers? Boomstick? Shoshin chuckled as he moved past Kelly, grabbing one of the fallen CFT shields on his way and knocking the gore off. I like that. Inspection Stellar date 05.07.8950, adjusted years. Location, Mount Genevia, Belgium. Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rico was certain that the shuttle had landed in an underground bay of some sort. There wasn't anything definitive to give her that impression. It was just the feeling she had of a crushing weight over her. Or that's just a reaction to my situation in general. The Nietzschean soldiers moved her cage off the shuttle and down a long series of tunnels until they finally placed it in a room that looked like a workshop of sorts. Once they set her down, the Neats left, not even giving her a second look. Rika had nothing else to do and spent her time surveying the room. Judging by the med pods, grow tubes, and fabrication machines that filled the space, whoever worked there was heavily into mods, a pair of ridiculously long legs were laying on a nearby table, and Rika stared at them for a moment, wondering how a person would fit through most doorways while wearing them. I wouldn't expect the Neats to have a mod workshop like this, Nikki commented. What with their human purity shtick? Me either. Maybe this place is pre-war? Looks like it's gotten a lot of recent use to me. Someone is working on something down here. Just then a voice came from the doorway. Well, isn't this a lovely surprise? Rika turned her attention to see a slender woman standing on the threshold. She was clothed in a white skin sheath, which wouldn't have been noteworthy if it weren't for the fact that she had six arms, all of which were held in front of her, clapping softly. The woman also had oversized facial features, which were currently contorted into a caricature of delight. It sure was a surprise for me, Rika said, though not particularly lovely. I can imagine, the woman said, nodding sagely as she stilled her hands. Emperor Constantine has directed me to start on you as quickly as possible. Apparently, General Garza is quite interested in having his people look at you as well. I'm Rika, by the way, you are? Why, my dear Rika, I'm your maker. 
Oh dear, she snapped too many mods. Nikki commented. Funny, I recall a lot of the people who were involved in bolting me together, and I really think I'd remember you. Do you have a name? Danella, the woman in white drew out the word. And I wasn't involved in your particular mechanization, but I was one of the progenitors of the program. Those were desperate times, you see, and few have my skill when it comes to blending organic and machine. I took what those ham-handed fools started and refined it, creating the pinnacle of the program, my beautiful SMIs. Sounds like you're a real patriot, Rika replied, not bothering to keep the sour note from her voice. Oh, I didn't do it for patriotic reasons. I did it to paint on the canvas of the human body. She let out a tittering laugh as she strode forward, cocking her head as she regarded Rika's body. However, someone else has taken to painting on you. Are you some GAF skunk works project, or have you gone aftermarket? Danella leaned forward, right to the edge of the grab field. I'm fourth gen, Rika said. Why don't you disable the grab field, and I'll show you what I can do. Oh, I don't think so. Danella said wistfully. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love nothing more than to plumb your depths. But I suspect that even without your weapons, you're a touch dangerous. Plumb your depths? Does she want to dismantle you or have sex with you? Nikki asked. Probably both simultaneously. That's a bit disturbing. Have you been listening to her? Rika asked the AI. She's crazy. Everything she says is disturbing. Interesting that she's the one who made the SMIs, though. I can kind of see her aesthetic in you. Rika had to admit that Nikki was right. Something about the way Danella moved reminded her of the easy grace of an SMI. Either that, or she modded herself to move like a mech after creating them. So, tell me, Rika. Danella purred as she walked to a cabinet and opened the doors, peering inside. Who was it that upgraded you? Someone in Septia? No one special, Rika replied. Just a chop shop. The spindly woman's head whipped around and she sneered at Rika hissing. Liar. Garza told the emperor and his imperial majesty told me. You were remade by the intrepid colonists. I can only imagine the delights you contain and the dangers. If I had skin, it would be crawling right now, Nikki commented. Don't worry, mine's crawling enough for the both of us. What do you think she's going to do? If she really wants to start cutting into you, she's going to need to EMP both our brains half to death before she starts. Hopefully she'll want to take samples before things get that far. Samples? How encouraging. Rika watched as Danella turned back to her cabinet and then drew out a small case, which she carried to one of the tables. The woman daintily set it down and opened the lid, tittering for a moment, before drawing out a small orb with four curved arms. Despite what you might think of me, Danella said as she turned to face Rika. I don't often work on unwilling subjects. Most people pay handsomely to be turned into art by my hands. At that, she held up all six hands and waved them in the air. You must be a riot at parties. Rika said in a droll tone. Danella took a step closer to Rika's cage. You'll appreciate me soon enough. Just be happy it's me and not Garza's Orion boneheaded fools working on you. At least I understand that you're a thing of beauty first. Her voice lowered to a whisper. And a brutal killing machine second. She's just playing mind games with you, Rika. Nikki cautioned. It's okay. I came to grips with what I am long ago. She's not going to get into my head, well, not metaphorically at least. Not physically either, Nikki replied, her voice filled with a resigned bravado. What are you thinking? Rika asked. You have three fully charged SC batteries. If I overload them all at once, this grav cage won't be able to contain the blast. Anything within 30 meters will be incinerated. In these tunnels, probably a lot further. That's a big kaboom. Rika wondered if things would get that far. She still fully expected marauders to storm through the door at any moment. 
but she also knew that it was possible that they wouldn't make it in time. Whether it was escape or death, her fate was in her own hands. I'm not ready to give up, Nikki. Even if I can't ascend my way out of this, I'm going down fighting. I understand. Danella stared at Rika for a minute, clearly waiting for some sort of reaction after calling the mech a killing machine. Then the woman shrugged and placed the sphere at the edge of the grav field. Rika could see a pocket form in her cage, a bubble in the grav field. It stretched down toward the damaged section of her thigh. When the pocket in the field reached her leg, something shot out of the sphere and hit her, smashing part of her armor and leg beneath. It was a small impact, but Rika could see tiny shards of material quickly travel back toward the sphere. Once they reached the device, Danella pulled it away from the grav field. There now. That didn't hurt much, did it? She asked while walking away from Rika to a machine onto the right. Now just to see what you're made of. Did she get any? Rika asked Nikki. Yes, I think. The EM field at the edge of the cage is keeping me from contact with it. But a lot of nano was already on your leg, repairing your wound. I loaded it with instructions as soon as I realized what she was up to. Now to see if there's enough. My favorite part... Impotent waiting. Danella set her samples in several different pieces of equipment, humming softly as she worked. Suddenly her head snapped up and she glanced over her shoulder at Rika. Ah, my emperor calls. Don't worry though, I've taken precautions against any nano you sent along, and I'll still have my eyes on you. She smiled sweetly. Oh, and there's a whole platoon just outside the door. You're safe and sound. Oh, it feels so good to be cared for, Rika said in a dour voice. You're so saucy, Danella laughed as she strode across the room. I can't wait until I get your helmet off. I want to see your eyes so badly. You know what they say. That if looks could kill, Rika asked. Oh, you, Danella paused at the doorway, turning to look Rika over one last time. No, they're the window to the soul, and I plan to suck yours dry. Then she was gone. Crazy bitch. Nikki's mental tone was filled with loathing. Why are there so many disgusting people out there? No, don't answer, it was rhetorical. It was? Because I have no idea, Rika replied. Do you think she was able to fry the nano? Maybe, Nikki said, her tone heavy with doubt. There's nanotech, and then there's nanotech, and then there's the ISF's nano, stuff so small that it takes one hell of an EMP to build up any charge across it. Rika hoped that Nikki was right. The thought of suffering under Danella's tender ministrations was enough to make her vomit. So how long do we have to wait for the nano to? What is it going to do, the usual? Yeah, replicate and come over to the cage, and then hopefully disable the agrav emitter. It's going to take a bit, even if a lot of it survived. Great, Rika forced herself to relax. Know any good jokes? Rock and Roll Stellar Date 05.07.8950 Adjusted Years Location, Undaunted, Approaching Belgium Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire Chase strapped down in the assault shuttle's main cabin. Outside, the undaunted's engines thrummed, the vibration reaching all the way to his feet as the engines burned at full power, blasting the cruiser toward Belgium. The terraformed planet in orbit of Luxem was only ten light seconds from Capeton, at the closest point of the two planets' uncommon co-orbital pattern, and from the course Ferris had plotted, the cruiser wasn't going to start breaking till the ship was almost kissing atmosphere. The undaunted wouldn't hit the right angle to roast the planet, but there would be one hell of a northern aurora for folks on the night side. Checking the ship's sensors as they continued to pick up speed, Chase saw four enemy destroyers and a cruiser shift onto a vector to match the undaunted. You ready to kick ass? Chase asked Ferris. Sir, I was born ready to kick ass. Sir, you okay, Ferris? The lieutenant gave a nervous laugh. I guess. Ever since Rika chewed me out, I get formal when I'm worried. Ferris paused a moment before continuing. 
You're going to kick all the asses there are till the colonel is safe, right? All the asses, don't you worry. Besides, Rika's tough as neutronium. This isn't the first time the Neeps thought they had her, only to have her turn the tables on him. Good point, Theras replied. Just hope she doesn't find a black hole somewhere and dump Belgium into it. Place looks nice. I'll see if I can remind her in time. Chase said, suddenly feeling a lot better about their chances. All of Ferris's concentration was on the undaunted's helm control. Only tangentially aware of his bridge crew, as they unleashed unrelenting fire on the enemy destroyers chasing his bird. Don't fail me now, girl, he thought, trying to remain calm as the ship screamed toward Belgium, still accelerating though they were only one light second from the planet. Rotating in five, he cried out, and then executed the pre-programmed burn, spinning the kilometer-long cruiser and firing all the engines at once, a narrow cone of thrust blasting through an opening in the stasis shields. Below, a small defense platform passed too close, trying to get a shot up the undaunted skirt. The maneuver was ill-advised, and Ferris altered his vector just enough for the cruiser's engine wash to burn away half the platform's weapons and most of the hull. Suckers, Ferris called out as the ship continued to bleed V at a ferocious rate. The planet below growing larger at a faster pace than he'd like. Sir, his weapons officer said. We good, looks. Shut up, Marv, Ferris growled, and don't call me, sir. Oh, okay, just wanted to know if we're gonna die. Ferris ignored the comment, finessing the burn until the ship was on a vector that would have it passing 400 kilometers off Belgium's North Pole. You ready down there? He asked. Your drop is in 40 seconds. As will ever be, Chase called up, a phrase echoed by Colonel Borden. Okay, good luck. Chase and Borden sent confirmations, and Ferris opened the bay doors, silently wishing the four drop ships and the Star Crusher a safe drop. He kept one eye on the enemy ship still tagging the Undaunted, the enemy's beams splashing harmlessly against the ship's stasis shields. His other eye was on the drop vector, watching as it approached optimal. We're away, Chase called out. Countermeasures and missiles away, Marv added. Ferris nodded silently, watching as every tube on the undaunted fired. Half launched chaff and countermeasures, while the rest fired a barrage of missiles at the planet's orbital defenses. He didn't expect to take many out, but it would be enough to provide a screen for Chase and Borden's craft. At least it better be. The dropship shuddered violently as its engines burned on max thrust, desperately attempting to slow the ship as it streaked toward Belgium. Within, the mechs and squad one might as well have been drones, their only movement a few jerks and sways as the ship slewed through the planets near space. Chase was tempted to watch Scan, but he knew it didn't matter. Hallie would get them down or she wouldn't. At this point, it was out of Chase's hands. The seconds dragged toward a minute, and he knew they were almost there when the ship jerked like a giant's hand and slapped it, the vessel groaning in protest. Hit Atmo, Hallie called back. Noticed, Chase grunted, wondering if the stress mark in the bulkhead across from his seat had been there before they dropped. Dirt in five, the pilot called out. The mechs called out a resounding, Rika! And then the dropship slammed into the ground. Chase shook his head, feeling a moment of disorientation. Someone shouted to cover the flank, and he knew the back hatch was open, but he couldn't see it with the impact foam all around them. Clear that shit, Crunch bellowed, and a moment later, daylight hit Chase's visor. Mechs were pouring out the back of the dropship by the numbers, grabbing foam and tearing it free to make way for their comrades. You good? Chase asked Hallie. You bet, Captain. Bird's dead, though. Looks like I'm coming with you. Good thing you're armored. Stay close and frosty. Aye, Captain Chase. Thirty seconds later, the mechs were out of the dropship, and Chase had moved to a small rise to survey their position. Three other trails of smoke were visible to their right, and the other dropships reported in that all hands were alive, though a few were dented. Damn, we smushed all our birds, Leslie called out from her position two ships over. Doesn't matter, Chase replied. We take this hill and evac won't be necessary. She didn't reply. They both knew that their only two options were success or death. Moments later, a shadow passed overhead, 
and then Borden's star crusher slammed into the ground a kilometer ahead of the mechs. Beyond the 70-meter-tall monstrosity lay their target, Mount Genevia, with Casa Monza at its peak, and Rika. Missiles shot out of a bunker at the base of the mountain, streaking toward the star crusher, but Borden's monster fired point defense cannons, shredding the incoming air breathers before the six legged walker fired its rail cannons at the missile's launch site. Plumes of fire and dirt soared into the air as the star crusher pummeled the enemy's position. I think they're dead, Chase called out to Borden on their command net. Can never be too sure with these buggers, the colonel replied. You ready to move? Chase looked down from the hillock he stood on, noting that two teams of SMI and RR mechs were already racing into the forest surrounding the mountain. Race you to the top, Chase grunted as he leaped down from the rise, signaling the rest of Squad One to join him. Like it's even a competition, Leslie said. I'll have tea ready when you get there. Rika heard General Garza before she saw him. He was speaking to one of the soldiers outside. The guard was insisting that she had orders from the emperor that Rika was not to be moved. Garza, on the other hand, was attempting to convince the woman that it would be better if she and her squad found somewhere else to be. Shit, that poor woman's about to learn a hard lesson, Rika commented to Nikki. Any sign of our nano? No, alas, it's nanoscopic, so it's hard to spot. Thanks for the science lesson. Well, this is about to get interesting. Seconds later, weapons fire erupted in the passage. It wasn't more than a few dozen quick staccato bursts, and then silence fell. I guess you outclass the neats a bit, Rika said to the empty room. Notice that, did you? General Garza asked as he walked in. Makes sense, what with you being Orion Guard and all, Rika replied. So I take it that this is the part where you whisk me off to the far reaches of space? You're a smart girl, Rika. Garza stopped in front of her, his gaze traveling up and down her body as he assessed his prize. Honestly, I may not get that much out of you, but I'm certainly not going to let Constantine get first dibs, especially not with his pet monster maker. He waved a hand, and a team of engineers entered and looked the cage over. It's still secure, sir, one of them said after a moment. She's good to transport. Garza nodded in satisfaction. Good, get her to Ilium. I'll be following behind in a couple of days. I want to see if Constantine is capable of dealing with this mercenary incursion on his own. He turned to Rika, a feral smile on his lips. That's right, Colonel Rika. I know all about your little band of ships. Veek was very forthcoming with everything he learned about you. Veek? Rika let out a string of curses ending with, I'll kill that fucker. Oh, well, Veek didn't turn on you willingly. I've been following your progress for some time, Rika. I knew you'd come to Genevia. My people set up some honey pots and identified a few resistance members. In turn, they gave us the whole network. By the time Vic got back from Faniel, we already knew almost everything. He just helped fill in a few details. That it was just a matter of waiting for you to walk right into my trap. Don't let him get to you, Rika, Nikki said. Guy's slime. Slime does slimy things. Yeah, I know. Just sucks. I hate not knowing who I can trust. Nikki sent a feeling of agreement. I hear that. You done blah blahing? Rika asked Garza, wishing she wasn't wearing her helmet so he could see the sneer on her lips and the unbridled rage in her eyes. The general snorted. I guess. He stopped, his eyes darting to the right. That fucker. Without another look Rika's way, Garza turned and strode from the room, throwing an order over his shoulder for the engineers to hurry up with the mech. The four engineers quickly activated the agraf pad beneath Rika's cage and pushed it out into the corridor where the bodies of dead neats were being pulled aside by a dozen soldiers in gear Rika hadn't seen before. The vaunted Orion Guard, she said as she watched them work. Shut up, one of the engineers replied. As they pushed her down the corridor, Rika watched as the soldiers disappeared one by one until they were all invisible. These must be the same ones that were in the corridor on the station, she commented. I can just barely make out their movements here and there. Yeah, their gear is good, 
but not quite that good. I think the graph field makes it easier to see them, with the way it bends light. The engineers continued to push Rika down long passages until they finally got to a large loading bay. The walls and roof were hewn from stone, and at the far end the doors were open, daylight streaming in, bathing a Corvette-class ship in its warm glow. Stars, I've missed being on a planet, just can't get that light anywhere else, Rika said aloud. Am I right? Shut up, another one of the engineers repeated. Yet another glanced back at Rika. I can't wait to get her in stasis, thing gives me the creeps. Hey, I resent that, Rika said, trying to quash the fear she felt at hearing the word stasis. There was little doubt in her mind that if they put her in stasis, it was likely to be the last thing she ever experienced. Nikki, you ready to blow the bats? We're not going into stasis. The engineers were already pushing her up a ramp into a small bay in the back of the ship as she spoke, and Nikki didn't respond right away, the delay sending a wave of panic through her. Nikki? Rika almost yelled the AI's name in her mind. Rika, do you see that black dot on the side of the corner of the cage? Nikki asked, highlighting a small black speck on Rika's vision. Yeah, is that some dust? She asked, wondering if the AI had heard her reference the SC bats. I sure hope not. I think it's the nano. I can't get a signal, but I swear that dot's getting bigger. Graviton waves keep distorting. Yes, it's bigger now. Get. Without warning, the agrav field shut down, and Rika fell, landing heavily on her side. She rolled away from the cage and leaped up, wobbling a little on her damaged leg as she lunged to the side and slammed into one of the stealth soldiers. He swung his rifle toward her, but she slapped it away with her ruined gun arm and then lifted a foot, clamping her three claws on his neck, crushing the life from the Orion soldier while wrenching his rifle free. Projectile rounds ricocheted off her armor, and Rika took stock of egress options, spotting a passage four meters to her right. She tossed the soldier's body at the closest stealthed enemy before leaping toward the corridor and diving through. In her mind, she played through the scene she'd left. Four engineers, six stealth soldiers. Biolock is cleared. You're good. Rika nodded, wildly firing rounds out into the small cargo hold before backing further down the passage. Think there's an armory on this bird? This rifle only has 60 more rounds and then I'm onto the E-beam. Stars, what do I look like, a map? Nikki retorted. Okay, yeah, maybe down the right at the next intersection. Backpedaling, Rika switched to the E-beam and fired several blasts before she reached the intersection, only to get hit by a pulse rifle's hammer blow on her right side. The blast slammed her into the bulkhead, and she saw a heavily armored soldier with a scattershot pulse cannon. Without a second thought, Rika kicked off the wall and lunged toward the soldier, firing twice with her electron beam before slamming her shoulder into his head and flipping up over his body. Your gun arm's electron beam emitter is repaired. Nikki cried out triumphantly. Doesn't do much without a barrel, Rika said, as the soldier turned and took a swing at her, trying to get enough space between them to bring his pulse cannon to bear. Doesn't matter. Just touch it to him and fire. Rika ducked under a lumbering swing and jammed her gun arm into the soldier's groin, firing the weapon. Bolts of electricity arced out between them, and a muffled scream came from the soldier before his armor locked up and he froze. Rika dropped the rifle and brought her fist down on the soldier's hand, breaking his thumb. She wrenched on the scatter shot, but it wouldn't budge. Trying a new angle, she spun and placed her back against the soldier's chest in an effort to get more leverage, which was when she just barely made out two stealthed enemies rounding the corner. Mashing her fist against the armor-locked soldier's hand, she managed to fire a trio of blasts from his weapon, bowling the enemies over before she finally managed to pull the scatter shot free. No luck on this, I don't think, Nikki said, and Rika tried it, firing another shot at one of the Orion soldiers who was trying to rise. Right you are, Nikki, Rika said, turning to run further into the ship, hobbling slightly on her injured leg. Where are you going? Shouldn't we get off this thing? Nikki asked. Think we're in a bunker under Casa Mont? Rika asked as she fired a blast, slamming another stealthed attacker against a bulkhead. She rushed toward the woman, favoring her with an elbow to the face, smashing her visor before moving on. I do, yeah, are you planning to escape? No, Rika said, spotting a ladder shaft. If Constantine is anywhere, 
He's at the top of this mountain. I'm going to fly up there and slam this ship into his face. A little extreme, don't you think? Probably. But I bet it will get Garza and Danella too. If not, it'll at least be faster than climbing up this mountain. She leaped up the ladder shaft to the top deck and turned to the right, spotting the entrance to the Corvette's small bridge. A few seconds later, she was inside, pulling the door shut and slamming the manual lock into place. A woman was sitting in the pilot seat, and she twisted to look at Rika. Who the fu- was all the pilot managed to get out before Rika aimed the scatter shot at her. We're leaving, now. We can't. Think real hard about that, Rika said. Are you sure? Don't bother with her, Nikki said. Just get a hand on her console and I'll get us out of here. Rika nodded, moving forward, when motion outside caught her attention. Something large passed in front of the bay's entrance, shrouding the nose of the Corvette in shadow. What the? Rika muttered. Then the forward half of the docking bay collapsed. A drop and a climb. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Mount Genevia, Belgium. Region, Genevia system. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Shit, Rika muttered as she pulled herself through the Corvette's ruined cockpit. Well, there goes that way out. Twenty meters from where she stood, the underground docking bay ended. What had once been an exit leading to a clean getaway was now a pile of rock and twisted steel. So much for your shortcut, Nikki said. On the bright side, that was probably friendly fire. Think so? I guess, who else would be shooting at the mountain? Rika wondered as she reached back into the cockpit and lifted out her scattershot, noting that the pilot still seemed to be alive, despite the fact that a piece of steel was sticking out of her pelvis. Leave her, Nikki said. If you still want to get the emperor, we have to move. Rika didn't need to hear it twice. She ran along the top of the Corvette, mentally tallying the number of soldiers and engineers that may still be alive. What do you think? She asked Nikki. Two engineers dead and four soldiers left? Maybe. There might have been more of both on the ship. Okay, well, let's go find out. She reached the rear starboard side of the ship, across from where the cargo hold lay, and dropped down to the ground. She crept around the cradle struts to see three soldiers carrying two of their comrades clear of the ship. Sorry, guys, Rika said as she rushed toward them, rapid firing her scatter shot and bowling them over. One of the Orion soldiers lifted a rifle, but she slammed a foot down on his wrist, clenching until she felt it snap. A scream came from his throat, and she kicked him in the head, spinning to fire the scatter shot at another enemy who was struggling to rise. A few meters away, one of the wounded soldiers rolled over, groaning as she reached for a nearby rifle. Rika was still bringing her own weapon to bear when a section of roof broke free and fell on the woman, crushing her to a pulp. Shit, Rika exclaimed as stones began to pour down all around her, she dropped the scatter shot and scooped up one of the rifles as she ran as fast as her injured leg would take her. Rocks rained down all around her, a house-sized slab coming down a meter to her left at one point. Then she was through the doors at the end of the bay, racing down the tunnel as dust and thunder followed after. Half a kilometer later, Nikki called out, Okay, Rika, I think we're in the clear. Rika looked back and breathed a sigh of relief as she saw a hundred meters of intact tunnel before it was blocked by rubble. Damn, and here I was getting all happy to be on a planet again. Yeah, and one with a full G as well. You've got a long slog to the top of this mountain. Damn it, Rika muttered. Where's the closest lift? Nikki highlighted a location 20 meters into the rubble that filled the passage. Right about there. Well, that sucks. Stairs? Next to the lifts. There's a maintenance shaft we can get to, though. Feel like a climb? Yay, my favorite pastime. Battle for Genevia. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Fury Lance. Capeton Command. Capeton. Region, Genevia System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. Heather paced back and forth in front of the holo tank, periodically glancing at Barn, 
who was staring intently at the display, muttering to himself as reports from Captain Command reached the lands. First strike confirmations, Chief Garth called out. The Nostroma and Azora have hit their targets in the outer system. Just those two? Heather asked, knowing it would take more attacks before the Nietzschean fleet would begin to disperse. Right then, there were over a thousand enemy ships converging on Capeton. If some of those vessels didn't get pulled away to other targets, she was going to need to signal Admiral Carson to make the jump prematurely. Not that it's the end of the galaxy, she muttered, just going to make this battle take a hell of a lot longer. What's that? Barn asked. Nothing, just bitching about how long this is taking. It's going to take as long as it takes, Piper said. Chief Lara has the relay established. I'm in the data store now. And? Heather demanded, glancing at Ona, who was selecting priority targets on the inbound ships. The battle around the lanch was in a brief lull. The ship's beams having already taken out a group of nine destroyers that had moved in to intercept, a Silvis team dropped on Captain Command. And I'm having to set Jeremy's update to deploy along with Nikki's alteration. Piper added, it's going to take a few minutes. Will the Nietzschean ships even take it? Barn asked. I mean, Cece's under attack, and it's sending out fresh updates. Many will, Piper replied. The update is rolling with all of the correct codes. It looks completely legitimate. Heather wasn't so sure. She had to believe that many Nietzschean captains would think twice about accepting data from a compromised captain command. Several long minutes passed, Nietzschean ships tagging the Fury Lance with ranging shots, while Heather directed Ona to wait until the enemies were closer. Okay, the first ships are receiving the update, Piper announced, displaying uncharacteristic excitement. Heather saw a group of destroyers escorting a pair of cruisers become highlighted on the main holotank. The ships were boosting toward Belgium in pursuit of the Undaunted, which was still breaking after dropping Chase's team. When will they blow? Barn asked impatiently. I've set the monitoring NSAI not to blow the ships for another ten minutes, Piper replied. If the first ones that get the update go almost immediately, the Neats are quickly going to get wise to what we're doing. But in ten minutes, the light lag between the more distant ships means they'll detonate before they see anyone else go up, provided they're boosting, of course. It makes sense. Heather said, nodding in agreement, even though she wished the wait wasn't necessary. She forced herself to relax, knowing that most of her anxiety came from not knowing if Rico was safe. Nothing I can do about that. The mechs on the ground will do their job, and we'll do ours up here, she thought as she came to a standstill in front of the holo tank. She took some measure of comfort in the fact that, although hundreds of ships were moving on dozens of vectors around Capeton, some toward Capeton Command and others toward Belgium. The majority of the Nietzschean warships in the Genevia system hadn't yet moved from their prior vectors. Still tens of thousands of ships out there. Just gotta wait for them to get primed. Orders just went out for a formation to go after Vargo. They're saying weird things about him. Some sort of cat insanity, Garth announced with a frown. And there goes another, after the capital. On the holo tank. Heather watched as the markers for the ships in question changed from red to green, an indication that they'd taken the update. Oh, hell yeah, Barnes said, a grin forming on his lips. Push those engines, you fucking bastards. One by one, more indicators on the holo tank flipped from red to green, until over half the ships within a light minute of Capeton had taken the update. Shit, Heather muttered. Not the best ratio. Better than nothing, Barnes said. Heather nodded silently as they watched the clock tick down from the 10-minute limit on the NSAIs. Heather held her breath as it finally reached zero. Come on, she whispered, watching the ships that were boosting toward Captain Command. Blow, you fuckers, blow. It's not instant, Piper advised. The reactors will take a bit too. The AI stopped speaking as four ships were flagged as destroyed. Heather flipped the main holo display to an optical view and saw that three of the ships were twisted wrecks, while the fourth appeared to have suffered a smaller explosion in one of its engines. It was offline and the ship was drifting. Holy shit, it worked, Barn cried out. I was really starting to think this was just a stupid boondoggle. 
You're such a peach, Barn, Heather muttered. Do you really think Piper would have pushed for this plan if he didn't think that Jeremy's sabotage would work? Well, I had some doubts, Piper admitted, but not about Jeremy's sabotage. Mostly about whether or not any of the Nietzschean ships would apply the update. What? Heather exclaimed. You said you were certain. I was being encouraging. More ships began to experience engine failures. Some suffered crippling explosions, while others only had minor failures that disabled their engines, but didn't further damage the ships. As the wave of dying Nietzschean ships rippled out from around Capeton, Heather decided that there was no reason to wait any longer. She activated the Quancom blade and sent a single word, come. Without waiting for a response, Heather turned toward Ona. Okay, bring us in close to Capeton Command. Time to pick up our people and smash some starships. Rika Conqueror. Stellar date 05.07.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Casamans, Mount Genevia, Belgium. Region, Genevia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika crept down the passage as quietly as she could. Her left knee creaked softly with each step, and the electron emitter on the remains of her GNR gave off a few sporadic sparks before shutting down. Her armor was battered and scorched, but she was still better off than the dozens of neat she'd carved her way through to get to the top of Casamond. Are you sure they've not sounded an alert about me? She asked Nikki for what had to be the tenth time. I'm still fighting with the NSAI up here, but down below, I have all the feeds locked down. They're pretty focused on the platoon of mechs and the star crusher that's climbing up the mountain. Rika stifled a laugh. I can imagine. I would be too in their place. I just hope that the emperor doesn't make a run for it. Last thing we need is to chase them all over the planet. As if to punctuate her statement, the mountain shuddered and a light fixture came down behind her. That was a landing pad not far from here, Nikki informed her. I think Borden blew it away. Any luck contacting them yet? Rika asked. I had a connection for a second, but then I lost it. These NSAIs are tenacious, and there's so much interference right now with the battle outside, the neats aren't going down easily. Rika nodded as she finally came to the end of the corridor. The map they'd pulled of the level indicated that beyond lay the western viewing room. They'd checked all the others on this level and found them to be vacant. If the emperor wasn't within, Rika would have to admit that he'd made it out somehow. Either that or Casamans contained secret passages, which I suppose isn't really that far-fetched. She sidled up to the door at the end of the hall and released the last of her nano cloud, letting it filter into the room. Once she got a clear visual, Rika bit her lip in anticipation as she spotted the emperor sitting in a chair near the window, looking out over the battle below. And then she saw the dozen guards standing on the perimeter of the room. Stars, look at him just sitting there. He really does think he's untouchable, doesn't he? She asked, amazed at the man's aplomb. Yeah, doesn't even seem to care that he's losing, badly. Rika considered the best way to take out the twelve guards in the room. Her stealth capabilities were completely non-existent, and she only had two Nietzschean rifles, one held in her left hand while the other was slung across her back. The most lethal mode they possessed was a mid-velocity rail shot, though the weapon in her hand had a magazine of high-explosive rounds as well. Wait a second, Rika said to Nikki. What do I care about the guards? I'll just kick the door open and take the shot, then run. Run? That's your plan? No matter what I do, I fight those twelve guards. At least if I kill Constantine first, I don't have to worry about him getting away. Oh, what the hell? Nikki sighed. Go for it. Rika almost laughed. Okay, with your rousing enthusiasm backing me up, I'm going to do just that. She set her rifle against her shoulder and took aim, while reaching up with her right foot and placing it gently on the door handle. A long, slow breath escaped her lips, and then Rika pulled the door wide and fired. Nine rounds leaped out from her rifle. The first blew a hole in the side of the chair, exposing the emperor's side. The next hit his torso, blowing away the man's stomach. Each successive round walked up Constantine's body, 
until the last round hit his head, spraying blood and brains across the window. I did it. A feeling of raw elation swept over Rika, but quickly disappeared when the strangest thing happened. Nothing. None of the guards moved. Instead, the sound of slow clapping reached her ears. Rika's eyes nearly bugged out of her head to see Garza step out from behind one of the Nietzschean guards. She swung her rifle toward the Orion general, but halfway there, it hit something and stopped. A disembodied voice next to her said, drop it. A second later, six of Garza's guards materialized around her. Shit, I guess our scanned fidelity took a hit, Nikki muttered. Never even saw these buggers. Garza gestured for his soldiers to bring Rika into the room, inclining his head in respect as she approached. I have to admit, Rika, you're no slouch. You probably hold an all-time record for killing the most Nietzscheans. Though you didn't get their emperor, he's evaded you, it seems. She scowled at Garza as his troops pushed her forward. What are you talking about? She gestured toward the ruined body in the equally ruined chair. He looks pretty damn unevady there. He was already dead when you shot him, Garza said. I killed him less than a minute before you arrived. Well, I killed what was left. His brain was already dead. So he was dead twice, and now he's dead thrice, Rika asked. I can live with that. The general snorted. Yeah, I suppose so. But we both know that wasn't him. He'd already moved on. Okay, that was not the conclusion I was drawing, Rika said privately. I followed it, still working on the NSAI here, trying to get the turrets to drop. Why? Rika asked the Orion general. Did the emperor clone himself? Sorta, Garza said with a nod. Though he believes there can be only one, so he killed his initial self. Rika shook her head in disbelief. What's the point in that? A smile broke out across Garza's face. Not his usual smug grin, but a look of legitimate, pure amusement. I tricked him, the general said. I needed to bring him to heal. So I told him that I'd infested his body with nano that his level of technology wouldn't be able to detect. Then I told him that if he didn't follow my orders, I'd kill him within the year. But it was a lie? Rika asked. The nano cloud you probed with is settling on two of the guards, Nikki said. Two of the others have touched you, so I got them directly. I just need another minute. And the last two? The AI laughed. What, do I have to do everything for you? You've got your light wand, don't you? That I do, Rika replied. Gonna put it to good use, too. As she spoke with Nikki, Garza replied, Yes, a very, very effective lie. Since I told him that he'd never be able to detect my nano, the inability of his own medical teams to find it only bolstered his belief that I really had infested his body. He was a prisoner of his own mind. All I had to do was make a single suggestion. Wow, Rika laughed. I still think you're a raging asshole, Garza, but I have to admit, I'm impressed. I'm going to give you a chance to die cleanly, as a reward for messing with Constantine so much. The general snorted. You're so magnanimous. Take a look outside, Rika said. My mechs are storming this mountain. By now, the intrepid Space Force will be here, shredding the Nietzschean fleets. You've lost. Garza glanced over his shoulder, looking out the window. In that moment, Rika's hand fell to her thigh and came back up, light one blazing in her grip. Without a moment's hesitation, she drove it into the chest of the Orion soldier on her left, before dropping to the deck as the one behind fired his rifle. The shot streaking over Rika's head as she lunged backward and drove the electron blade into his groin. Rolling over top the soldier, she sliced the blade into his neck and rose to her feet, eyeing the four soldiers frozen in place by her nano. A look of actual fear came over Garza's face as he realized there was nothing standing between him and a seriously pissed off mech. He took a step back, raising a hand. Look, I... Then the Orion General's head exploded. What a bastard. Rika spun to see Emperor Constantine standing at the entrance to the room. The rifle she had dropped now cradled in his arms. Behind him, she could see Danella clapping softly with her six hands, a gleeful expression on her face. 
What's with all the clapping? Nikki asked. It's getting weird. The Nietzschean emperor trained his weapon on Rika. Your turn, mech. Fuck, she muttered aloud, then asked Nikki. Turrets? Not in time. Yeah, I'd say you're pretty fucked. The emperor craned his head toward Danella, though he didn't take his eyes off Rika. Sorry, Danella, you're not going to get her alive. Danella scowled and opened her mouth to speak. But instead of words, a spray of blood came out, followed by a light wand blade. As the woman's blood sprayed across Constantine's face, the emperor dove inside the room, firing on Rika before coming back up and running toward his frozen guards. Rika didn't take cover as rounds flew toward her. Instead, she lifted her ruined gun arm, letting the limb absorb the high explosive rounds as she took aim with her light wand and flicked her wrist. Constantine's weapon fell silent and then slid from his hands as the emperor fell to his knees, reaching up for the light wand protruding from the middle of his neck. Rika approached as the once proud man gargled blood, falling back against the leg of one of the frozen guards while reaching toward her in a pleading gesture. No sound escaped his mouth, but his lips were moving and she could make out the words, please, clemency, I beg you. She crouched in front of the man, the Nietzschean emperor, the man who had destroyed Geneva and in turn much of her life. No, Emperor Constantine, there will be no clemency for you. On behalf of the Genevian people, I pronounce you guilty of, well, just about everything. Your punishment is death. Rika stretched out her hand and wrapped her three fingers around the light one's grip, staring into the dying man's eyes. He's just a man, she said to Nikki. There's nothing special about him at all. And he finally realizes that, the AI replied. With a flick of her wrist, Rika pulled the blade up, cutting the emperor's head in half. She rose and drew a shaky breath, disabling the light wand and sliding it back into her thigh. Finally. Rika looked to the doorway, smiling as she saw Leslie. Thanks for the assist, Les. Good distraction, killing Danella there. Who? She looked back into the hall. The weird white woman? That wasn't a distraction. She just creeped me out, all clappy clappy. I know, Nikki exclaimed. Rika laughed and strode toward her friend, wrapping Leslie in a one-armed embrace. Stars, am I glad to see you. You and me both, Leslie said, squeezing Rika in return. A moment later, a terrible rending sound came from the window, and both women turned to see one of the Star Crusher's legs smashing through the thick plaz. Once a hole large enough for a mech was torn open, the leg pulled back, and a figure pulled itself up onto the ledge outside. Chase! Rika cried out, hobbling across the room to meet him as he climbed through the window. Rika! He raced toward her, almost bowling her over when they collided next to Garza's body. They held one another until Leslie began to whistle a tune from behind Rika. So, who won, Chase? Stars, Leslie, he grumbled. Yes, your way was faster. Told you I'd save her first. Pay up. Rika shook her head, looking between the pair. Wait, you bet on who'd save me first? What if I didn't need saving? Chase shrugged. Then I guess you'd get the payout. Rika cocked an eyebrow at Leslie. I had Constantine dead to rights, hand over my winnings. Leslie shook her head and laughed. Whatever you say, Colonel Rika. Epilogue. Stellar date 05.09.8950. Adjusted years. Location, Fury Lance, Belgium. Region, Genevia system. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Stars. Rika said as she walked onto the Fury Lance's bridge. What a day. Two days had passed since the deaths of General Garza and Emperor Constantine, though there were still pockets of Nietzschean resistance in the Genevian system. Most of the enemy ships had been destroyed or were fleeing under the command of Admiral Hammond. Sort of been days, Leslie amended as she followed Rika onto the bridge. I can't tell, Rika replied with a tired laugh. I haven't slept since before going to Capeton Command. It's just all been one long blur. 
Chase, Barn, Heather, Trimmon, and Silva all stood at the front of the bridge, grinning at Rika as she approached. No clapping, she said, holding up a forestalling hand as Heather raised both of hers, about to trigger a round of applause. Why not? The captain asked. I'll tell you later, Rika said as she stopped at the holo tank. So is this it? We've taken all the major installations? Barn nodded. That we have, or at least, they've surrendered and followed our stipulations. There's some rioting here and there, but most of the police are Genevians, so they're getting things under control. Rika turned toward the forward holo display, which currently showed a view of Belgium. She stared at it for a moment, barely able to believe that they'd done it. The Nietzscheans were routed, their emperor was dead. Not only that, but the Orion general was dead, and the marauders held the heart of the old Genevian alliance. We did it. She turned toward the marauders assembled on the bridge. This isn't just a hope, a dream, or a foolish quest. For my entire life, Nietzsche has been waging war on Genevia, pushing us back, destroying our homes, our families. For decades, our people have feared the name Nietzsche. Well, now they'll fear ours. Marauders? Tremen asked with a raised eyebrow. No. Rika gave a shake of her head, knowing what the man was getting at. Genevia. She looked at each of the people standing before her in turn, squaring her shoulders, all too aware that her people's homeworld was spread out on the holo display behind her. We're not marauders anymore. We're the Genevian armed forces, and this is our home. She met Chase's eyes to see his brimming with admiration and a bit of moisture. Beside him, Heather lifted her hands and brought them together. I don't care what you say, Rika, I'm clapping. The others joined in the applause while Rika laughed, shaking her head as she smiled at her people. Such a queen, Nikki said, laughing along. Shut up, Nikki.